the clock to one year ago and we knew what the Xbox Series X looked like, but we didn't know exactly when it'd be released, nor did we know how much it would cost. And it's easy to forget now, but other than a sneaky tease in the backdrop of a Phil Spencer interview, Microsoft refused to even acknowledge the existence of the Series S until September. It's been a heck of a year for Microsoft, with a strong next-gen console launch fueling record profits for its gaming division. And while the wait for the big exclusive games continues at an agonizingly slow pace, Microsoft made an industry-shattering acquisition by bringing Bethesda into its fold. So while we look ahead to what Xbox's many internal studios are working on, and the future of Xbox hardware and services, let's look back at the wild year Microsoft has had. Twenty twenty was a pretty strange year for everyone, including for Microsoft, as it took fans on an emotional roller coaster starting in May. Its first proper next gen game showcase, a third party event, landed unfortunately with a thud. Very few games looked particularly next-gen at the time, perhaps best or worst, exemplified by a promised gameplay reveal of Assassin's Creed Valhalla that didn't actually reveal any gameplay. Surely, though, the first party showcase scheduled for July, basically Xbox's E3 press conference in a year without a proper E3, would be better, right? Yes, mostly. Xbox solidified its first party lineup by finally showing its cards for the first time since acquiring studio after studio after studio over the prior two years. We learned that Turn 10 is rebooting Forza Motorsport, Playground Games is rebooting Fable, Obsidian is going big with the first person open world RPG Avowed, and Rare is crafting a unique new fantasy world in Everwild. And then came the long anticipated gameplay reveal of Halo Infinite. You know, the big day one flagship launch title. It would be a spiritual reboot for Halo, and be the first time a new mainline Halo game launched alongside an Xbox console since Halo Combat Evolved. It would also be the start of the next decade of Halo. But fair or not, Infinite's reveal can largely be summed up in one word. Craig. Put another way, it didn't go well. Infinite hardly resembled the technical showcase fans expect from a console's biggest game, and things quickly unraveled from there, leading Microsoft to make the bold and painful but ultimately correct decision to delay Infinite indefinitely, which later turned out to be a full year to fall of 2021. Once again, Microsoft had taken two steps forward, only to immediately stumble back by the same two steps. The company found its confident forward stride later in 2020, though, changing the landscape of the entire gaming world in one fell swoop by pulling off arguably the single biggest industry-shaking event since Activision and Blizzard merged in 2007. Microsoft announced plans to buy Bethesda. No, not just Todd Howard's Bethesda Game Studios, but all of ZeniMax's studios, including id Software, Machine Games, Tango Gameworks, and more for $7.5 billion. And Microsoft now has total control over the Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Starfield, Doom, Wolfenstein, Quake, and many, many more. The unprecedented momentum of such a merger took Microsoft to November 10th, when it successfully launched the Xbox Series X for $500 and the Xbox Series S for $300. Though the latter leaked ahead of its planned announcement, causing Xbox to coolly roll with it and post the meme heard round the world. While the Halo-sized hole in the launch lineup was clearly felt thanks to a lack of any other truly next-gen games, the console itself was great! A fully featured device that not only supported a huge chunk of the Xbox back catalog all the way back to the original Xbox, but embraced it. The Series S offers a pretty impressive bang for your buck, too. Microsoft added FPS boost in early 2021, and then started doubling frame rates like it was going out of style. And it already had external storage support, variable refresh rate, and other quality of life features that Sony still has to add to the PlayStation 5. Sadly though, supply can't keep up with demand for either new Xbox, nor the incredibly successful PS5 for that matter, thanks in large part to a global chip shortage that's affecting everything from consoles to cars. 
Microsoft CFO Tim Stewart said in November that Xbox console supply will likely continue to lag for at least a bit longer. But console supply is about the only thing not going Microsoft's way in 2021. To say that Xbox Game Pass has been on fire, NBA Jam style, would be selling it short. The Netflix for video game service topped 23 million subscribers by the end of the first quarter, thanks in part to the snowball rolling down a hill momentum that Microsoft has been building. In the span of a month, Game Pass landed Outriders as a day one game, got the formerly Switch exclusive retro RPG Octopath Traveler for its Xbox debut, and perhaps most awesome of all, MLB The Show 21 a Sony-developed game that spent its first 15 years as a PlayStation exclusive could be played on day one on Xbox at no additional cost to Game Pass subscribers. That the Xbox release of MLB The Show also ended a generation-long void of simulation baseball gaming on Xbox was the cherry on top. Microsoft even, as promised, found a way around Apple's anti-xCloud policy and launched a limited game streaming beta for iOS devices, meaning that soon virtually all Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will be able to play a selection of their favorite games from anywhere. As we look ahead to the rest of the Xbox's year, the bad news is that there is still a painfully obvious lack of exclusive games. The good news is that the long drought is finally almost over, and once it ends later this year, it's likely to end for good. Exclusive games should begin trickling out soon, such as 12 Minutes, which we've played and absolutely love so far, Scorn, The Ascent, the Series X release of the masterpiece Microsoft Flight Simulator, Remedy's Crossfire X campaign, and finally, Halo Infinite. If we're being honest, could the Series X have launched this November with an absolutely killer lineup instead of last November and the dry spell that we've weathered ever since? Probably, but at the very least, the end of the Xbox's year one should look a lot better than the beginning, at least from a game's perspective. Meanwhile, year two is still vague for now, but we know what's out there and at least somewhat likely for a 2022 release. The next-gen Forza Motorsport reboot, Hellblade 2, Everwild, State of Decay 3, and Starfield are just the first party games we know about that could land next year. Plenty more are probably a bit further out on the horizon, like Fable, Perfect Dark, Avowed, The Elder Scrolls 6, and more. Every console generation seems to be different from the last in some way or another, and the Xbox Series X generation has already proven unique. It launched in the middle of a pandemic, quite smoothly under such crazy circumstances, which is a testament to Microsoft, and we've already had plenty of surprises and delights. That should continue as the Xbox Series X's first E3 looms before giving way to an exciting second half of 2021 and beyond. For more on all things Xbox, stay tuned to IGN and our weekly Xbox show, Podcast Unlocked.
I dead already? I, I must be, I mean. This is a punishment, right? Yep, this is death. No! No! No, 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 no! This isn't happening. I'm going to have to make an emergency landing. Hold on, Chief. I'll be safe. <laughs> safe? I haven't been safe since I found you. I found you, remember? You were out there on your own, and you'd still be out there if it wasn't for me. I thought I was going home. There won't be a home if we don't stop the banished. You keep saying that. We're outgunned, outnumbered. I know I saw condors over there. I'm going to dig through them and find one with the working slip space drive. And when you're done with this war, we'll get away from here. Far away. Wait here. Oh. Please. Let me see what I can find. Cannons first. When I get back, we can look. Together. <sighs> okay, big guy.
weeks ago, your people are broken, scattered, hunted, defeated by me. I wish I could tell you it was difficult, but it wasn't. <laughs> we are one step ahead, always. The ring is already under our control. Soon, the auditorium as well. The Harbinger and the Banished share the same goal. We fight together to honor the will of Atriarchs. But without challenge, I grew weary, long. Military specialization. Confirm facial identification. Profile reconstruction complete. Well, what about Shepard? Earthborn, but no record of her family. Doesn't have one. She was raised on the streets. Learn to look out for herself. All stations secure for transit. So scout out ahead. He'll feed you status reports throughout the mission. Otherwise, I want radio silence. We've got his back, Captain. The mission's yours now, Shepard. Good luck! Gunnery Chief Ashley Williams of the 212. You the one in charge here, ma'am? Are you wounded, Williams? A few scrapes and burns. Nothing serious. 
The others weren't so lucky. Oh, man. It's a good place for an ambush. Keep your guard up. Oh, God. They're still alive. What did the Geth do to them? Humans. Thank the Maker. Hurry. Close the door before they come back. Marines held them off long enough for us to hide. They gave their lives to save us. Saren. The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains. Of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written. I remember when everything changed. The floods. The storms. The fires. People dying in the streets. The corporations gave us solutions. A better world. We welcome them into our lives. But the laws of nature aren't meant to be broken. We need to know what they're hiding. find the answers you were looking for, Agent Dark? Not yet. This is just the beginning.
2021 is perhaps the most important year in Bethesda Softworks' 35-year history. This is the first year in the publisher's existence that has not been independent. It's now owned by Microsoft. It's a move that has meant a year of more questions than answers for fans of Bethesda games, especially in regards to platform exclusivity. Just in case you missed the news, this year Microsoft purchased Bethesda's holding company, ZeniMax Media, for an eye-watering $7.5 billion. That's the sort of money that can buy dreams, and considering many are desperately dreaming of the Elder Scrolls 6, Microsoft has certainly made a savvy investment. Alongside Elder Scrolls and Fallout developer Bethesda Game Studios, Microsoft's deal also includes ZeniMax Online Studios, Machine Games, Arcane, Tango Gameworks, AlphaDog, and Roundhouse Studios. That's eight studios to add to Xbox. Xbox's already extensive lineup. It's vital to note that Bethesda has not been folded into the Xbox Game Studios and instead operates as its own company within Microsoft. Xbox boss Phil Spencer has said that Bethesda is largely set to continue working as it always has, but with Xbox and PC positioned as the best place for its games. Quite how that will pan out remains to be seen, but already we've seen a sizable chunk of the publisher's portfolio added to the Xbox Game Pass library, along with the promise of Bethesda Xbox exclusives to come. Despite all this, the last 12 months have had somewhat of a PlayStation focus for Bethesda. In the build-up to the PS5 launch, it was announced that Bethesda's next two major projects, Arkane's Deathloop and Tango Gameworks' Ghostwire Tokyo, will be limited-time console exclusives for Sony's white and black monolith. The Microsoft deal has done nothing to change this, and so the near future of Bethesda is very much with Team Blue. Don't fear the unknown. Attack it. The focus would have already begun shifting to Team Green if the COVID-19 pandemic hadn't thrown a ridiculous amount of obstacles at Arcane. Lockdown conditions forced the developer to push back on Deathloop's launch twice, and each one of those delays has delayed the potential of Deathloop arriving on Xbox consoles. Thankfully, Arcane's current target of September 14th for the PlayStation 5 and PC release seems realistic. Tango Gameworks, meanwhile, has been exceptionally quiet since the Ghostwire Tokyo gameplay reveal at Sony's PS5 Focus State of Play back in June. Currently, its release date holds steady at October 2021. With any luck, things will stay that way. As for things we've been able to play over the last year, much of Bethesda's focus has been on live service games. After a year of struggling to make amends for its disastrous launch, Bethesda Game Studios added NPCs to Fallout 76 in 2020's Wastelander update. This proved a radical change for the game, finally making it feel closer to a multiplayer Fallout RPG rather than an abandoned apocalypse. In the following months, Bethesda has issued four chunky updates to Fallout 76. Six. Among them is Steel Dawn, which finally ushered in the return of fan favourite faction, the Brotherhood of Steel. The Elder Scrolls Online has also given us a year of great content. 2020's expansion pack Greymoor added the beloved region of Skyrim to the MMO. 2021's new Blackwood expansion then dropped in Oblivion's Cyrodiil and the Black Marsh, and with that, The Elder Scrolls Online has now visited all the settings of the mainline RPG series. That means Bethesda should probably get a move on with The Elder Scrolls 6 so that The Elder Scrolls Online has another region that it can copy. Outside of the company's flagship universes though, Bethesda's had a quiet year. The most notable launch has been Doom Eternal's two-part The Ancient Gods DLC. While this campaign added some new ideas to id Software's celebrated shooter, it's not the same as a new big release. And so, for the majority of the year, eyes have been on Bethesda's future. Rip and tear until it is done. 
The first step there has already been hinted at by Wolfenstein developer Machine Games. The Swedish studio announced in January that it's developing an Indiana Jones game, but stopped short at revealing anything more than a teaser trailer. This has, naturally, generated a huge amount of questions. Could this be Bethesda's first Xbox exclusive? Will it be Microsoft's answer to Uncharted? And all importantly, how many Nazis will we get to hit with a whip? That brings us to E3 2021, where Microsoft and Bethesda Showcase could provide some of those answers. It could also be where we finally see Starfield, Bethesda Game Studios' spacefaring game that was announced back in E3 2018. Almost nothing is known about Starfield, making it a perfect candidate for a big gameplay focus reveal. Provided it is actually ready to be shown, of course. Much less likely to be part of the show is The Elder Scrolls VI. Its announcement back in 2018 felt more like a reassurance that a Skyrim sequel will definitely happen. Bethesda boss Todd Howard has also been keen to temper any ideas that we'll see the game soon. Those are all the games that we know about, but with eight developers as part of Bethesda Softworks, there stands a chance that we'll see something unexpected. Its software could be in a position to announce something new. However, a new Doom or Quake project, if in development, is more likely to be announced at QuakeCon in August. If there is a surprise game to be announced by Bethesda at E3 2021, then put your bets on Arcane. The developer's Leon studio may be working on Deathloop, but the team in Austin has been quiet since the release of Prey back in 2017. Regardless of the announcements though, it will be the details that speak loudest on what kind of Xbox-focused future Bethesda has. Will all the new games be day one on Game Pass, like Xbox's other first-party studios? Or does Bethesda's unique position as an Xbox-owned publisher mean more platform and release flexibility? Whatever the answers may be, Bethesda fans from all console corners will be watching E3 2021 and hoping for the right announcements. And for everything else Bethesda and more Summer of Gaming, make sure to stick with IGN. Hello everybody, June is here and it's a busy, busy month for video games because E3 is right around the corner, but also a whole buttload of new games are on the way. So let's make this really quick because I got a whole bunch of other stuff I have to do this month. Here are June 2021's biggest game releases. On June 1st, the Warhammer 40k universe gets a little bigger and a little louder with Necromunda Hired Gun, which ditches all that turn-based nonsense for big, loud first-person shooting on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. Then there's Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection, which is on PS4 and Xbox One and PC, following its Switch release from earlier this year. The cooperative espionage puzzle adventure Operation Tango hits PC, both PlayStations, and all three and a half Xboxes. And then, of course, the Elder Scrolls Online expansion, The Gates of Oblivion, comes to PC and Stadia and will be hitting consoles later on in the month. On June 2nd, Sludge Life hits Nintendo Switch. This is a Devolver-published indie which is officially described as a first-person, open-world, vandalism-centric stroll through a polluted island full of cranky idiots. Sounds nice. That's already on PC. On June 3rd, get ready to put the pedal to the uh, other pedals with Tour de France 2021 on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. And if that sounds like too much cardio and bicycles and spandex, you can swap that bike in the Unitard for a desk chair and some nice spreadsheets in Pro Cycling Manager 2021. It's a lot of work keeping these bicycle men in... <laughs> I I'm sorry, I don't know what a pro cycling manager does. Somebody's got to manage these bicycle guys. They're, somebody's got to manage these bicycle guys going up and down hills all day. They're just pedaling every which way, drinking all sorts of sports juices and whatnot. I don't, I don't know what that game's about. Anyway, on June 4th, Sniper Ghost Warrior Contracts 2 lets you shoot people in the head on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. And then DC Superhero Girls Teen Power on Switch probably doesn't let you shoot anybody anywhere, but seems like a nice time nonetheless. Also that day, the puzzle-focused Ori-like Evergate comes to PS5 following its release for basically everything else last year. And The Last Kids on Earth and the Staff of Doom comes to PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch, adapting a popular young adult graphic novel series turned Netflix show that I'm just now hearing about because I'm old and out of touch. Finally, there's the deep space survival horror game The Persistence, which will persistently scare your space pants off of you on PS5 and Series X. On June 5th, another new Goose game is out, except this one actually has a title, and it's called Mighty Goose. The game is kind of like Metal Slug, except it's about those horrible birds that crap all over soccer fields. That's on basically everything that comes with the controller, except for Google Stadia. 
On June 8th, chug some mead, launch your friends out of catapults, throw roast chickens at people, and otherwise get medieval in Chivalry 2 on PS4, 5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. And if you'd rather do more serious stuff involving swords, there's always the Elder Scrolls Online, now for PS5 and Series X, with consoles also getting that Gates of Oblivion update I mentioned earlier. If that's not enough sword stuff for one day, the 8th is also the PC release of Edge of Eternity, a JRPG inspired by Final Fantasy, which is technically an FRPG because it's made by French people. If you'd prefer a JRPG actually made in Japan that isn't inspired by Final Fantasy because it is a Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade comes to PS5 on June 10th to hold you over until they finish remaking the rest of that damn game. I want to ride chocobos and go snowboarding already. That day also sees the release of Ninja Gaiden Master Collection on PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. Or maybe that day doesn't see the release because ninjas are sneaky and they operate under the cover of night. But either way, that game is coming out then. If you missed out on Hyperdimension Neptunia way back on PS3 and then missed out when they remade it on PS Vita and then remade it again on PS4, well, great news because they finally remade it for PlayStation 5 and now it's called Neptunia Reverse and it's out that day as well. On June 11th, PS5 gets Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, which must be enunciated lest you sound like you said ripped a fart by accident. That will hopefully give us a better idea of what the PS5 is capable of, but at the very least, it has a gun that turns people into shrubs, which is hilarious. PS5 and PS4 and PC also get Guilty Gear Strive that day as well, so you can make gorgeously animated people wearing way too many belts whip each other's asses faster than the human eye can even comprehend. Meanwhile, Nintendo Switch gets Game Builder Garage, which teaches the basics of game design and lets players share their creations on the internet, and you know that's gonna get real weird in no time at all. Also on Switch, as well as PS4, is Darius Burst EX Plus, another chronicle, which is great if you don't think any of these other games have enough laser bullets or flashing lights or giant space slugs or titles that sound like the memoir of a prescription drug. On the 22nd, you can squad up and party down with three friends to wail on some D&D monsters in Dark Alliance on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. If that sounds too rowdy and you need some damn peace and quietus, there's also Ender Lilies, Quietus of the Nights on PC and Switch. It's the quietest game on this list. On the 24th, Alex Kidd pays a visit to Miracle World DX on PS4, 5, Xbox One, Switch, and PC, and PS1 RPG classic Legend of Mana gets a big HD remaster on Switch, PS4, and PC. Also on PC is Rogue Book, a deck-building roguelike from the creator of Magic the Gathering. Golf is a nice, quiet, laid-back sport, unless Waluigi shows up and starts making a scene, and that's exactly what's going to happen in Mario Golf Super Rush, hitting the Switch on the 25th. You can beat up some super cool looking monsters using psychokinesis in the anime looking brain punk RPG Scarlet Nexus, which is on all the PlayStations and the Xboxes and the PCs that can run it. And last but not least, roses are red, violets are blue. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 is out for Switch, and I will not stop quoting that stupid meme when talking about that game. I think it's very funny, and I just won't let it go. Let it go. On the 29th, Nintendo Switch players can destroy all humans, finally, or defy their destinies in Disgaea 6, Defiance of Destiny. Hey, this guy right here defying his destiny, get a load of that. Anyway, there's also Curve Space, which takes classic arcade action, but makes it, you know, like, all curvy and in space. That's on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, Switch, and PC. And finally, PC Switch, PS4, and Xbox One owners can revisit the classic 16-bit LucasArts games Zombies Ate My Neighbors and Ghoul Patrol and see if they are as brutally hard as you remember them being way back in fourth grade. And I think they are, even with the additional save states for the re-release. Oh, also at some point in June, Fantasy Star Online 2 New Genesis is supposedly fully launching. It is currently in beta, but only in the West on Xbox and PC, but I guess it's on PS4 and Switch in Japan, and I don't know if that's going to change at some point. They should probably send out an email or something. Anyway, as always, we probably forgot something or got something wrong or something got announced or delayed or canceled since we shot this video, but this month we have a good excuse for being behind, and that is we're getting ready for E3, where they're going to announce all kinds of new games, and I'll have to start thinking of clever, funny ways to announce their release dates in a video five months from now, and also think of excuses for why we forgot to put stuff into the July video, which we'll make a month from now. As always, thank you all for watching. I very much appreciate it. Actually, no, I'm a little bit mad because enough of you watched these videos that it was a success and now they make me do one that's for all of the stuff that's coming to the different video streaming platforms. So if you want to find out what's on Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus or Amazon Prime Video or Shudder or Quibbly or Gumbo or whatever they're called, if you'd like to watch stuff as well as play stuff, 
Go check that out. It's on the IGN channel. Did you know that Paramount Plus is getting a thousand movies next month? I'm not joking. A thousand. They didn't, I'm not even going to list them all. I'm, I'm going to go take a nap. Thank you. Good night. Mass Effect, released in 2007, set the bar for what players expected from RPGs during the 360 era. It was entirely voice acted, used a branching conversation system that allowed for different outcomes in each situation, and promised to have narrative ties that would last the entire trilogy. Pitched over dinner by Casey Hudson as a sci-fi RPG, he believed that it would become a mainstream phenomenon and a must-have game for the Xbox 360. Fast forward 14 years later and we're on the precipice of seeing Mass Effect Legendary Edition release on modern day consoles and PC to much fanfare, meaning I'd say the entire Bioware team delivered on that goal. We've been given early access to some footage that showcases dramatic updates to the original Mass Effect and a peek at how Mass Effect 2 and 3 will also be improved. But let's start with a closer look at the original, the one that needed the most care to take a look at how it's been updated. Beginning with a combat sequence, we get our first look at the updated HUD, and yes, your weapons will still use a cooldown system and not thermal clips like in Mass Effect 2 and 3. In addition, the weapons use a different reticle, and there are no longer class-specific weapon restrictions that make certain guns unusable for certain classes. But let's talk about the textures for a second. Using AI upscaling, the new look of this garage scene on Novaria is night and day when compared to the 360. The specifics may appear subtle, but one I can point out in this scene is a much more natural, soft effect of the lighting. They're using ambient occlusion in the scene, which you can see more clearly on the boxes that emit shadows. Stepping away from combat for a moment, we also got a tour of the main hub in Novaria. This footage opens with an amazing look at the new female Shepard model as she exits the elevator. The character models looked a lot better in Mass Effect 3, and with the new character model feature, you can start Mass Effect 1 as that iconic female Shepard. The lighting and camera placement has changed here too, putting you a little bit closer to the characters as they move through the levels or down elevators. The Novaria port has been heavily reworked in Legendary Edition, and you see some small elements as you exit the elevator. Couches have cushions, and the textures on the walls and concrete floors have been reworked. In the main hallway, they've added light fixtures across the entire room and even removed large pieces of geometry that previously would break up your path. Here's what Bioware's Mac Walters had to say about why the wall was removed. The wall and why the wall came down in Novaria, right? You'll see them probably uh, more so throughout Mass Effect 1. They were really just meant for streaming, occlusion, essentially uh, sight lines, right? Uh, in large open spaces, which we had quite a few of in Mass Effect 1, whatever the game has to render is going to start to hit your performance. So when you have a wall there, when you come off the elevator, it just means that you don't have to show the whole level and load the whole level and have everything on screen as soon as you get off the elevator. And so the art team wanted to try taking it out and it worked great and I think it looks, looks awesome. When you reach the garage with the Mako inside, you'll also notice an additional lighting in the room and objects that have been completely remodeled. Even on the Mako, there's texture and dirt on the tires and it looks a lot more rugged and used. Looking at the provided Mako footage is really interesting to me because this is one of the key areas of the original that needed work. The original Mako was floaty, bouncy, and while I can't comment on how the Mako controls now, as I haven't played it yet, we did get to see two driving sections. The first is directly after you leave the Novaria port, and again, the new textures on the ice-covered mountain are immediately visible, but if you watch the Mako drive, you might notice some changes, like a boost feature. Here's Bioware producer Renata Cronin on how the Mako changed. It is so much better now. We've made it better in that it handles better, um, it targets better. You know, we changed up the, the reticle uh, when you're shooting with the Mako now so that it actually uh, hits where you're aiming, <laughs> which is uh, very awesome. 
because it didn't used to do that before. You know, we've added boosters to it as well. We're still in the process of sort of tweaking it a little bit. So this clip right here is not necessarily you know, representative of the end product, but it's got all the major improvements that we wanted. Now we're just playing around with, you know, how weighty does it feel? Cause it's still a little bit floaty as you can see, but now it feels more, you know, like you're driving a tank and not, you know, a, the car that floats for some reason. <laughs> Later, we also got a peek at a Thresher Maw fight on Antibar that shows another gameplay addition. Yes, the Thresher Maw still moves around, but now with a trail so you have a clearer picture of where they're headed with each movement. That should result in fewer instant deaths. There's also a new sensory tentacle phase to the encounter where you need to avoid the Maw and the tentacles as you battle. At the finale, you can notice the plumes of smoke have a lot more body to them also. I'm a little more hopeful about the Mako after seeing this footage. All of this is on top of massively decreased loading times provided by hardware advances like faster hard drives. This is a side-by-side -side shot of the original and legendary edition. As you can see, you can choose to instantly be at your destination while in the original, you would be waiting for a significant period of time. And two smaller but important systems we got to look at were the inventory system and character creator. So the inventory system has been reworked and it seems you can more easily sort, dismantle, and compare your gear for you and your squad mates. This also applies to the store, which looks to give you different view options depending on what you're looking to buy and sell. The character creator, which allows you to create a character before you begin playing any of the games in the trilogy, is also drastically updated. The original benefits the most from this. And I've gone back to see how close I can get the 2007 character models to the new models, but the options just aren't comparable. There are more hairstyles, more makeup options, more skin tone options, and you're really allowed to go all out. Looking at Mass Effect 2, we didn't see nearly as much, but there's a lot more detail in what we did see than I expected. The outfits have been reworked, meaning no more orange suits. And all of the outfits available in Mass Effect 3 are now available in Mass Effect 2. And while I don't have any fish at this point in my Mass Effect 2 save, what you should really be looking at is in the new game, as there are improved reflections on the tank itself. So what, we, what we're doing there is, uh, instead of doing a screen space reflection, we're doing um, uh, what's called a render to texture. So you're basically just re-rendering the world in a texture in that space. And so you have to be very careful where you can use them, because you can imagine a scenario where if you use it in the wrong space, you're basically paying twice for your rendering, right? The rest of the Normandy benefits tremendously from the facelift. In Lair of the Shadow Broker, the lighting has changed as you can see in the distance, but most changes in this expansion are subtle. The 4K assets are very apparent, and they may have added a depth of field effect, which I noticed on the ship. In addition, there are a few moments where the new lighting reflects off of surfaces, like at the end of this footage when the array is retracted. Here's Bioware producer Brennan Holmes with a few thoughts. Mostly it's just graphical improvements here, right? So like on the gameplay side, it's mostly just been bug fixes for Mass 2. We're pretty happy with kind of where Mass 2 is at, but you can see sort of improved visual effects here. Lighting's a lot better. I think I could probably talk a little bit about the DLC stuff as well in here. So it's now embedded in various stores or you can get it through upgrades in the Normandy. Like DLC is always the, the fun time when it's, you know, you got all your tools and everything and everyone just kind of goes crazy. And I remember them pitching this concept around like, yeah, let's, let's have a fight on the outside of the ship and it'll be like, you know, in the lightning storm with all this stuff going on. And that was just a really cool concept. And last but certainly not least is Mass Effect 3, which does benefit from all the texture updates, character model updates, and anti-aliasing improvements. But because it was so polished at launch, I asked Bioware what players can expect for the third entry in the series. Here's what Mac Walters had to say about this already stellar entry. I think it's in the sort of global improvements where you're gonna feel it in ME3. The interesting thing there is we knew that Mass Effect 1 would need the most work, but we also wanted to leave everything on the table of if there were things that we really wanted to improve there. And the more we sort of dug into 3, we felt like, look, we are more at risk of taking something that was pretty pretty damn good 
and making it worse or just making a lateral move where it's different, but is it is it actually better? And a lot of times we just said, yeah, no, it, it's fine. You know, gameplay, everything is good the way it is. There are, there were bugs and we didn't, we couldn't fix all of them, but but we fixed a lot of them sort of thing. And, and we would find them all throughout all three games sort of thing. So I think that's another thing. And you probably won't would go, oh yeah, this, this feels less buggy. But if you were to play them side by side, you'd be like, oh, okay, yes, I, I see what you did there. Putting them all together with all of the DLC, including things like, you know, armor packs and uh, alternate appearances and stuff like that. And when you get all of that content together and there is less of that sort of uh, what I would call friction in Mass Effect 1 that kind of is like, oh boy, I, I like it, but what's really making me work for it? it. It does feel like a whole experience. It together feels very um, obviously modernized, but it just feels more than the, the more than some of its parts. I was already sold on playing through the series once more, and the Legendary Edition gives me the perfect opportunity. The first Mass Effect might just be my favorite game ever made because of the promise of biotic-powered gameplay, stellar storytelling unlike anything I had seen at the time, and space exploration to unique planets. I look forward to jumping back in this May. A special thank you to Bioware for providing the commentary today and for making this amazing trilogy. It is honestly a game that will always be special to me, and I'm so happy to see the amount of care going into this remaster. I'll be doing a full performance review on the final code, so keep an eye out to see how it runs on each platform. In the meantime, if you're looking for performance reviews, keep an eye on IGN Games as myself and my colleague Michael release new episodes each week, so be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. And a personal note from me to you, thank you for watching. I just love making this series. For more on all things gaming, we've got you covered at IGN. The guerrilla fantasy of building a revolution from scratch has been a staple of the Far Cry games, and although Far Cry 6 looks to carry on in that tradition, there's plenty of newness here too. During my hands-off preview and interview with lead designer David Gravel, I was impressed with the fresh systems the team has baked into the latest game. For a series with Far Cry's pedigree and built-in player base, they took bigger swings than they strictly needed to. From tweaking the game's outpost system to introducing the possibility of Hitman-like stealth to a wild array of cobbled together weapons that will definitely get more into. Above all else, the game aims to put more options at your disposal than ever before. In Far Cry 6, you'll team up with a band of revolutionaries calling themselves Libertad, working to overthrow the fascist regime of El Presidente Anton Castillo, and free a Caribbean island state and Cuba-like called Yara. It's through Libertad that players learn the art of resolver, a guerrilla concept of using every resource at your disposal. The developers weren't afraid to run with that idea, to the point of sometimes taking things a little over the top. And I mean that in a good way. By scrapping together various items, you'll unlock weapons like El Pequeño, a massive minigun powered by a motorcycle engine, or a gun rigged out of an old portable CD player that blasts the Macarena while you down baddies. And let's talk Supremos, customizable super weapons you deploy from a backpack. At the preview session, they mostly showed the one that fires a barrage of rockets in all directions when you're desperate, but the game will naturally feature a number of different Supremos, including some that support a stealthy playstyle. And stealth has a new meaning in Far Cry 6 as well. There's a holstering system this time around, and in-game checkpoints the player can talk, bribe, or shoot their way through. It's now a legitimate option to blend in and lay low. Until you don't. Once the S hits the F, you'll be able to make your getaway in a slew of new ways. You could take a gorilla path, one of Libertad's hidden corridors through the dense jungle, hop into one of your customizable rides complete with jets coming out of the exhaust, or mount your horse and disappear into the hills. Speaking of horses, Far Cry 6 seems to have taken a page out of Red Dead 2's book, adding camp activities to the bases you unlock and develop, giving players more of a reason to hang out at HQ. Animal companions are also back, with at least two spotted in preview footage. There's Guapo, an alligator with a taste for man flesh. Good croc. And Chorizo, an adorable little doggy used to distract enemies during stealth runs. We were also promised that FND bases, what this game calls outposts, have been varied in an attempt to refresh the time-honored Ubisoft tradition of killing some dudes and changing the color of that part of the map. 
That said, we didn't get to see a base takeover in action, so how much these tweaks really alter remains to be seen. But it's clear that the Far Cry 6 team have taken some risks with the formula, while maintaining the core gameplay elements they've refined over the years. Yara's unique mashup of Far Cry standard jungle environments and an aging communista city-state is already a bold move, and like the Arans themselves, the dev team seem to have taken that momentum and tried their best to utilize every part of the animal. We'll see if the borderline zany combat clashes with what seems to be the fairly serious tone of the storyline. But ultimately, I'm excited to see such a well-worn franchise trying out a few new maneuvers. And I definitely left the preview session more excited for Far Cry 6. David Gravel also led the Far Cry Primal team, so he's no stranger to unique entries in the series. It looks like he's bringing the same sort of originality to this game, beefed up with the systems introduced in 5 and plenty of new ones to boot. Hopefully, it all comes together and makes for a wild, dictator-deposing ride. For more on the world of Yara, the complete written version of this preview, and everything Far Cry 6, hit up IGN. Good boy. Twelve years ago, a small development team owned by Valve known as Valve South dropped a little game called Left 4 Dead, a zombie-themed co-op first-person shooter that pit four players against a zombie horde and forced them to look out for the group as opposed to just looking out for the individual if they hoped to survive. This helped give birth to a whole new subgenre of co-op survival first-person shooters. And while Valve continued the legacy with Left 4 Dead 2, the original developers of Left 4 Dead, now reformed as Turtle Rock Studios, had not returned to the genre that they helped pioneer. That changes with Back for Blood, an appropriately titled four-player zombie-themed co-op survival shooter that goes into closed alpha testing starting today. And if my early impressions are anything to go off of, it's good to have Turtle Rock back where they belong. So much of Back 4 Blood is directly inspired by Left 4 Dead that I think it's actually important to lead off with the areas in which it tries to be different. And nowhere is that more apparent than in its deck building system. In Back 4 Blood, you actually build a deck of cards that you take in with you to each level. These cards are broken into four categories. Reflex, Discipline, Brawn, and Fortune. Reflex cards typically focus on granting bonuses to speed or stamina. Discipline cards are all about efficiency, so they offer buffs that give better accuracy, better healing, more ammo, and so on. Brawn cards buff your health, damage, and resistances. And finally, fortune cards focus on cards that give you a percent chance of something happening, along with other general utility-focused boons, like the ability to have unlimited ammo on your secondary weapon, or being able to shoot while sprinting. You select 15 of these cards to build your deck, and at the beginning of every level, you'll draw three and pick one card four times. And those four cards that you choose will be your starting set of active buffs and boons that you'll take with you into the first part of the level. Every time you hit a safe room and move on to the next act, you'll be able to add another active card into the mix. On the flip side of that though are the corruption cards, played by the game's AI director. Each level begins with a selection of corruption cards that inform the players of what enemies and obstacles they can expect to face. Just like how you're able to add new active cards at the beginning of every new act, there are also new corruption cards that are added that will throw a new curveball at you. Whether it be fog that makes it hard to see faraway threats, more zombie hordes, a giant ogre that you have to fight right at the start of the act, and so on. The limited nature of the alpha prevented me from really seeing the depth of the deck system, since there's only really one level and a relatively small selection of corruption cards that can change up how the level is played, but the idea seems really promising, especially the interplay between being able to see what corruption cards are coming up, and then being able to plan out with your team what active cards you want to bring in into the next act as a way to prepare. It adds another layer of teamwork and coordination since you have to ensure that you're not doubling up on cards and have all your bases covered. Another big change to the formula is the addition of a mini shop at the beginning of each new act. 
Instead of being gifted with new weapons and items at a safe house, instead you're given the opportunity to choose what you want to outfit yourself with before moving on. You do this with a resource called copper, which you can find out in the levels themselves in scarce amounts. This is actually a pretty big change since you no longer find any sort of health or item pickups in safe rooms. It's up to you to purchase them all for yourself, and if you don't have the 500 copper to afford a first aid kit, you're gonna have to make the tough decision of whether you want to save that copper for the next act, or use what you have to load up on ammo, grenades, or whatever else you can afford. Everything else is pretty much as you'd expect of a co-op zombie survival shooter developed by the team that essentially brought the genre into existence. You'll need to stick together with your team since there are special zombies that can incapacitate and eventually kill you if you're not assisted by a teammate. Wretches behave almost identically to boomers and will explode in a burst of bile that can attract the horde, hawkers spit loogies at you that can slow you down and potentially lock you in place, and snitches will creep around until they're startled, at which point they'll alert the horde if not killed fast enough. And then there are the giant zombies like the ogre, which seem nearly indestructible and force my team to turn tail and run if we wanted to live to fight another day. Likewise, the one level that we got to play was also very reminiscent of Left 4 Dead in terms of its structure and objectives. In one part, we had to hold strong against a bunch of zombies while a loud gravel filler dropped enough rocks to give us a ramp to scurry up to climb over a wall, and in another, we had to blast away a propane tank and then book it across a collapsed bridge in order to escape the pursuing zombie horde attracted by the noise. And then there's also some interesting set pieces that felt completely new. Being forced to contend with a giant ogre while also trying to find a way through a cluttered tunnel was all sorts of stressful in the best kind of way. And having to split up the team to plant two bombs on a cruise liner while two others hung back and provided cover with mounted turrets was a nice climatic way to cap off the level. It's also worth mentioning that despite going through the campaign three times, no two runs ever felt the same. Obviously, the card system does a lot of that heavy lifting by changing things up every act, but on a base level, there's a ton of randomization at play in terms of enemy and item placements. Certain rooms that were completely empty on one run would be chock full of zombies on another. Doors that were once completely safe to open might now have an alarm that triggers the horde if you carelessly open them. There's just a ton of stuff happening under the hood to ensure that these levels are as replayable as they can be. Overall, my first experience with Back 4 Blood felt like just the right balance between old and familiar and new and fresh. Turtle Rock obviously knows this genre inside and out, and the ways in which they're emphasizing player choice through deck customization and vendors at the end of every act feels like a smart shift in direction that still stays true to its roots. Thanks for watching, and for more Back for Blood, keep it here on IGN. From Disney heroes like Iron Man and Mickey Mouse, to spiky-haired soldiers with buster swords and uncomfortably long-limbed creepy hat creatures, few publishers have as varied a portfolio to show off as Square Enix. Square had quite the wild 12 months, with long-awaited and long-delayed games finally seeing the light. Let's take a look back, and content warning, I hope you aren't already sick of the words Final Fantasy because you may be after we've finished here. First though, I'm going to cheat. Let's talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake, which technically did come out over 12 months ago now, but it just doesn't feel right to talk about Square's year without it. Not only was the long-awaited RPG a critical success, but it went a long way towards ensuring Square was a profitable company in 2020. In fact, it did so well that the company is releasing it again this month as Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrade, complete with PS5 improvements and new story content centered around everyone's favorite material Interior thief, Yuffie. But what about the next full part of that remake? With no word on when to expect it, maybe a reveal is an outside bet for what we could see at this e 3 showcase. There's plenty more Final Fantasy VII to tide us over until then though, with both the first Soldier and Ever Crisis recently revealed. The former, a mobile battle royale game, and the latter another, yes really, remake of Final Fantasy VII, this time reverting back to its traditional turn-based combat. Is that enough Final Fantasy for you? Well, Square certainly doesn't think so. Isn't that what you want? 
past 12 months has seen the continued resurgence of Final Fantasy XIV Online. With more players joining the MMO than ever, an upgraded version released, plus the announcement of the Endwalker expansion coming later in 2021 that will take players to the moon. Insert, that wizard came from the moon joke here. Yes, we are almost halfway through this thing, but there's still more Final Fantasy to talk about. I did warn you. Revealed at September's PlayStation 5 event, Final Fantasy XVI looks to be bringing the series back to its more medieval fantasy roots. With little known apart from some backstory about the game's fictional setting of Valisthea, there's plenty more we'd love to find out, and this year's E3 looks like the perfect place to do that. And now for something completely different. Last summer saw the long-awaited arrival of Marvel's Avengers, which really did turn out to be a game of two halves. Crystal Dynamics' interpretations of beloved superheroes and the single-player campaign introduced Introduced us to them was a fun action packed 6 to 8 hours. Sadly, its post game gear chasing online component didn't really live up to billing. It's been a rocky few months since launch for Avengers, with a dwindling player base and lack of content, two major issues for any live service game. There is a potential saviour on the horizon, though, in the form of Black Panther. The War for Wakanda expansion is set to drop later this year, which needs to give players enough reason to flood back in order to steady the ship. Square does at least have four here. It more than made up for a troubled start to Final Fantasy XIV's life, let's hope the same attitude is applied here. It's not all been doom and gloom. People can fly's looter shooter Outriders hit the spot for many thanks to its power trip combat and addictive gear loop. People can fly's previously teased big expansions that will add to Outriders story, so that's something to keep an eye out for this E3. Near replicant version 1.22474487139... showed off more unique delights from the mind of Yo. Kotaro with this upgraded version of the Near Automata prequel. Bravely Default 2 gave us a beautiful RPG to play on the Nintendo Switch, and Rhythm Action spin-off Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory hit all the nostalgic notes it needed to. And then there was Balan Wonderworld. Maybe less said about that one the better. So what can we expect from Square Enix soon? We know that Life is Strange True Colours is due to come out in September, and while we've got a decent look at it recently, a reveal of this entry's spin on the series gameplay seems like something we'll see soon. Neo, The World Ends With You, the long-awaited sequel to the 2007 action RPG The World Ends With You, is arriving as soon as July, plus Babylon's Fall the painterly looking epic full of trademark platinum games action that we've heard pretty much nothing about since this time last year. Surely it must be time to see more. Then there are the games currently scheduled for 2022. Project Athia was recently retitled as Forspoken, another game we know very little about apart from a post-apocalyptic setting and an abundance of dragons. Then there's Project Triangle Strategy, the spiritual successor to Octopath Traveler that hasn't even been given a proper title yet, but has received a full playable proof of concept demo. These are both games we'd love to know more about, but wouldn't be surprised if we don't hear anything for a while yet. So that's everything we know is going on in the world of Square Enix, but what about the reveals we can only guess at right now? It's always fun to speculate, right? So let's have a go at it. It's been a couple of years now since we've heard what Lara Croft is up to. Has the time come for Tomb Raider to make a comeback at this E3? Yoko Taro has confirmed he's begun work on a new game that he quote, has no idea how to explain or sell. Might be a bit of a long shot to see it right now, but you never do know with him. There's also Deus Ex and Thief, franchises with passionate fans bases who would surely love to see more. The truth is, there's no way of knowing until Square shares all with the world this summer, although surely they don't have yet another Final Fantasy game to announce just yet. Surely. One thing is for certain though, very few publishers are able to match the variety that Square Enix offers on a yearly basis, and you can more or less guarantee that that will continue. PS5 and Xbox Series X have only been available for six months, but already the newest generation of consoles has been a busy one. From big exclusives to console updates and problems to much more, PlayStation and Xbox's newest consoles are off to a fascinating start. How have they stacked up so far and has much changed since launch day? Well, IGN's Jonathan Dornbush and Ryan McCaffrey are here to answer just that, starting things off with a look at next-gen exclusives that have launched in the last few months.
So I'd say it's been pretty quiet across the board for next-gen games since both of these consoles launched last November, but uh, at least on Sony's side, I think like with launch day, they've been doing a little better than Xbox on the exclusive games front. We've gotten Destruction All-Stars, which launched in February, and while it definitely had a bit of a light launch, they've been adding to it and improving it and definitely supporting it since that launch day. And then of course, in April, we got Returnal from Housemark, and though there have been a lot of talk about whether or not it should have some save states in it, it definitely showed that Housemark can make a pretty impressive uh, third-person action game that really takes advantage of what the PS5 is doing and things like the DualSense and 3D audio. It's a, it's a really nice mix of showing off what a next-gen game can be. Sadly, still, big system selling games remain the Achilles heel for Microsoft. We're six months in and there is exactly one Yes, one game that is completely exclusive to the next-gen Xbox, uh, meaning not available on PlayStation, not available on Xbox One. That game's the medium. And, you know, hey, it's a good game, but it's not exactly, uh, you know, pumping as much next-gen iron in the gym as, say, Returnal is or Demon's Souls. But still, first-party reinforcements are coming for Microsoft, and the good news is, once they finally do arrive, it's probably never gonna stop again. I mean, they bought Bethesda after all, that's a, that's a lot of reinforcements. You know, they are gonna kick it off. They got this year, so Microsoft Flight Simulator, which looks like it's gonna be a next-gen only release on console. And then of course, Halo Infinite in the fall. On the Bethesda side, we're still not quite sure what's gonna happen with Starfield. Is it gonna be exclusive? Is there some sort of deal there with Sony like there was with Deathloop and, and Ghostwire Tokyo? But if indeed Starfield is exclusive, that is going to be the ace of Microsoft's sleeve. You've got a new Todd Howard game that could be exclusive to Xbox. <laughs> But Jonathan, one area where Microsoft obviously wins by a one-punch TKO, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out style, is game subscription services. Xbox Game Pass is so good, my friend, that it has actually stolen one of your exclusives. MLB The Show is on Game Pass on Xbox, and it used to be, of course, a complete and total Sony exclusive. So that's awesome. Uh, other cool stuff recently, you've got the previously Switch exclusive Octopath Traveler, Destiny 2, more, 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 it just keeps coming. All that stuff has helped keep us entertained while we're still waiting on the big exclusives on the Microsoft side. And even better, xCloud is now rolling out to iOS devices, to Apple stuff, so that pretty soon, Anybody with a smartphone, which is basically everyone, that has a Game Pass Ultimate subscription is gonna be able to play their games not only on their console, but from anywhere through their phone at no extra cost for Game Pass Ultimate subscribers. That's just a totally impossible to ignore force in the entire games industry when you take all of that as a whole. Now, if only games with gold didn't suck now, but you know, I can't really complain. It is uh, it is definitely a strange time to say a PlayStation developed game costs more on PlayStation than on Xbox if you have subscription services on both. It is a, a very strange place to be. And it, it's, of course, you're completely right. You, you can't compare what PlayStation is offering to Game Pass. Just nothing stacks up. But at least in a vacuum thinking of what PlayStation players have been dealing with, things have been largely the same getting into the PS5 generation. But at the very least, I'd say PlayStation Plus's games lineup each month has been a lot better. Definitely when they pared down the lineup of games on PS Plus from six down to two, they didn't really find a way to up the value there or, you know, keep the value the same. And for a while, PS Plus kind of felt like a waste with those games. But thankfully, since the launch of the PS5, we've gotten almost a brand new PlayStation 5 game every month on PS Plus as part of that lineup. Stuff like Destruction All-Stars, Bug Snacks, Oddworld Soulstorm, and Maquette. Obviously, again, it does not compare to the game after game that is coming to Game Pass, but at least taken for what PS Plus was, it's nice to see them adding a little bit of value. Of course, probably the closest thing to Game Pass that PlayStation actually does offer is PlayStation Now, but they really haven't brought that service into the generation of the PS5. You can play it on PS5, but they don't allow PlayStation 5 games yet to be a part of the service. And this really came to a head when they added Borderlands 3 and Marvel's Avengers to PlayStation Now, but only the PS4 versions. It, it's strange, especially to be in a place where there is a subscription service that does have a library of games and does span genres that PlayStation could really be bolstering, but it just doesn't match up to what Game Pass offers. And it, it's becoming painfully more clear as the months go on.
Now, on the peripheral side, talking about things being a little bit the same as what we've gotten before, the PlayStation 5 launched with a, a decent amount of peripheral support, like a pretty good charging station that was kind of in the look and feel of the PS5's new, very ostentatious design. We got the Pulse 3D headset that takes a really great advantage of the built-in 3D audio of the PS5 and is really affordable, especially compared to some other high-end headphones and, uh, you know, a few things like that, including the media remote, the, the one peripheral we've all been trying to actually get our hands on. And while we only had the single option for the DualSense controller at launch, luckily PlayStation has revealed that we are getting two new colors to add to the DualSense lineup. Those include Cosmic Red, which is a red and black colorway, as well as a Midnight Black colorway, which is entirely black and aligned a little bit more with past PlayStation controllers at launch. So those are two options that we know of right now, and Sony definitely loves to introduce new colors as generations go on, so I wouldn't be surprised if this is just the start. We haven't quite been able to get any sense of what's to come other than some PlayStation VR uh, new controllers that'll be on the horizon, but that is way down the line. At the very least, third-party headsets are compatible with the PlayStation 5, so if you're not a fan of the Pulse headset but do want to take advantage of 3D audio, there are some other options for you. Unfortunately, I think the biggest thing when it comes to PS5 and peripherals is an advantage the PlayStation is supposed to have over Xbox but just hasn't happened yet, and that is a more... Uh, accessible opportunity to get expandable storage. PlayStation has said the PS5 will be compatible with third-party drives that as long as they match the speeds of the internal SSD, players will be able to expand that internal storage. But we don't have information about what drives those will be, from what companies, when that will be incorporated into the PlayStation 5. We're, we're just kind of left waiting, and that's really a big problem when there are only 667 gigs of available data on the PS5 at launch. That's maybe two Call of Duties these days. It really doesn't stack up to being much in the long run. And so that's already a problem we're getting to six months in of a lot of people having to play Tetris with their, their game files basically on their hard drive. So hopefully that gets resolved soon, and I do think that will be an advantage the PS5 will have over Xbox, but as of right now, it really isn't. Yeah, for now, Microsoft's got their one terabyte storage card. I've got one in there. In fact, I'm already onto it because these big games of this new generation take up a lot of space. So it's good to have, even if it's expensive. Now, uh, since launch though, Microsoft has added the new Xbox wireless headset, which is a uh, roughly an analog to the, the Pulse 3D headset for Sony. I really like it a lot. It's, I think, for $100, which is what it cost. I think you get a lot for your money. It sounds good. I like the minimalist design. And what I really like is that it can be paired with your smartphone at the same time or any Bluetooth device. And so you can actually be chatting on Discord with your friends while also playing an Xbox game and getting the audio from your Xbox at the same time, which is pretty cool. Microsoft removed the optical port <laughs> from the Xbox Series X, just like Sony did with the PS5. So we kind of needed this. It was a little bit of a bummer. It wasn't there at launch, but now there is this good option. So that's really good. Plus, uh, I want to give a special shout out to Microsoft for pumping out a whole bunch of cool new colors since launch for their controllers. I've got the, the Pulse Red one right here. It's nice to have something besides just the default black, so I appreciate them for that. But Jonathan, controller colors aren't the only things being updated, the consoles are too. Now on the Xbox side, the Series X actually hasn't really had any major updates because it hasn't needed them. Pretty much all the functionality that was needed was right there on day one, which is great, but Microsoft still added some good stuff. Most notably, Quick Resume has been improved, and there's a new optional suspend mode that can help speed up your game downloads, which as we talked about, these games are huge, so being able to speed those up is always appreciated. And then probably the coolest one of all is FPS Boost, the backwards compatibility team continuing to crush it at Microsoft. There are now almost 100, as we record this, almost 100 backward compatible games that run are boosted up to either 60 frames per second if they were originally 30 and some games even go up to 120 frames per second like Titanfall 2 which is one of the best games of the last 5-10 years which rocks. We've also seen Microsoft drop the Xbox Live subscription requirement for over 50 free-to-play games which I do admit that's more of a course correction than a welcome new addition but still great. 
yeah, it, it's always good to see advancement like that. That was definitely something that happened with uh, PlayStation finally allowing crossplay. Last generation, I very much understand. Yeah, we're, the PlayStation is in a very different place because whereas Xbox sort of unified its UI across generations and made everything very familiar for jumping into the Series X, PlayStation opted to do a brand new user interface. And while it's certainly cool to have a new nice and shiny UI to, to look at at launch, that means some new problems come up that maybe PlayStation had fixed on the PS4 even years ago. Uh, so we're in a bit of a strange place, but we did thankfully get our first really big PS5 major software update in April, I believe it was. And with that came a few important and needed updates such as uh, allowing support for 120 hertz displays uh, and finally the ability to store PS5 games on USB extend expanded storage excuse me you can't still play it off of that but at least you can actually put PS5 games somewhere other than the internal SSD and there were a few other added social and interface features that really helped improve things that people have been having issues with since launch. Uh, but that said, even with that update, there are still a lot of things fans are asking for. I think, you know, especially after Returnal, we're seeing a lot of ask for some sort of quick resume analogous feature to come to PlayStation. There have been things like wanting var variable refresh rate to come, the expandable storage issues I mentioned before, and of course, even just small things that have popped up since launch, like people are pretty unhappy with the way trophies are presented on PlayStation 5 because it's, it's clunkier than they were on PS4 and it didn't need to be. So there's definitely some work that's going to have to go in to the PS5's UI in the months to come. And so it's been really great to see PlayStation addressing things already with an update like that one in April and some smaller performance updates, both for the system and the DualSense since the PlayStation 5 launched in November. But that said, this whole span since that launch hasn't exactly been the smoothest for the PS5. Now, thankfully, there hasn't been anything that is as ubiquitous or widespread as the Red Ring of Death from the Xbox 360 era. But pretty much since launch day, there was sort of a whack-a-mole situation going on where a new PS5 issue seemed to crop up up every few days, and so it's been hard to say what are the most proliferated issues that players have been having, how much of the player base actually saw these, but definitely one of the ones that we've seen stick around is DualSense controller drift. The, the, we've definitely seen some stick drift there that PlayStation is now facing a class action lawsuit because of, very similarly to Nintendo with the Nintendo Switch Joy-Con drift. That said, there, there have been a few other issues, such as rest mode bugs and occasionally downloading the PS4 version of the game when you wanted the PS5 version, but thankfully again, nothing has been catastrophic across the board, but it, it's been a sort of strange, oh, what's that new issue I'm hearing about today? <laughs> On the Xbox side here, Series X owners complaining uh, here and there of controller drift again and random disconnects. But other than that, really, the console's been pretty much working as designed. It is quiet, it is cool, it is powerful. There haven't been any major OS issues, crashes, any other real problems of note that I've seen out in the community. Basically, I would say it's been pretty smooth sailing on the Xbox side. In fact, probably the best launch Microsoft could have possibly hoped for on the hardware side outside of the very obvious and very frustrating and sadly very ongoing supply issues. And there you have it. The first six months of the newest console generation are behind us. Of course, there is plenty more ahead and we'll be covering all the latest news, releases, and more on IGN as well as on our weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch. Be sure to tune in, follow along with us as the journey of the PS5 and Xbox Series X continues and keep it locked to IGN. Even imagine it. That 
which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Shattered by someone or something. Tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns. The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains, of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written. Rewind the clock to one year ago and we knew what the Xbox Series X looked like, but we didn't know exactly when it'd be released, nor did we know how much it would cost. And it's easy to forget now, but other than a sneaky tease in the backdrop of a Phil Spencer interview, Microsoft refused to even acknowledge the existence of the Series S until September. It's been a heck of a year for Microsoft, with a strong next-gen console launch fueling record profits for its gaming division. And while the wait for the big exclusive games continues at an agonizingly slow pace, Microsoft made an industry-shattering acquisition by bringing Bethesda into its fold. So while we look ahead to what Xbox's many internal studios are working on, and the future of Xbox hardware and services, let's look back at the wild year Microsoft has had. Twenty twenty was a pretty strange year for everyone, including for Microsoft, as it took fans on an emotional roller coaster starting in May. Its first proper next gen game showcase, a third party event, landed unfortunately with a thud. 
Very few games looked particularly next-gen at the time, perhaps best or worst, exemplified by a promised gameplay reveal of Assassin's Creed Valhalla that didn't actually reveal any gameplay. Surely, though, the first party showcase scheduled for July, basically Xbox's E3 press conference in a year without a proper E3, would be better, right? Yes, mostly. Xbox solidified its first-party lineup by finally showing its cards for the first time since acquiring studio after studio after studio over the prior two years. We learned that Turn 10 is rebooting Forza Motorsport, Playground Games is rebooting Fable, Obsidian is going big with the first-person open-world RPG Avowed, and Rare is crafting a unique new fantasy world in Everwild. And then came the long-anticipated gameplay reveal of Halo Infinite. You know, the big day one flagship launch title. It would be a spiritual reboot for Halo, and be the first time a new mainline Halo game launched alongside an Xbox console since Halo Combat Evolved. It would also be the start of the next decade of Halo. But fair or not, Infinite's reveal can largely be summed up in one word. Craig. Put another way, it didn't go well. Infinite hardly resembled the technical showcase fans expect from a console's biggest game, and things quickly unraveled from there, leading Microsoft to make the bold and painful but ultimately correct decision to delay Infinite indefinitely, which later turned out to be a full year to fall of 2021. Once again, Microsoft had taken two steps forward, only to immediately stumble back by the same two steps. The company found its confident forward stride later in 2020, though, changing the landscape of the entire gaming world in one fell swoop by pulling off arguably the single biggest industry-shaking event since Activision and Blizzard merged in 2007. Microsoft announced plans to buy Bethesda. No, not just Todd Howard's Bethesda Game Studios, but all of ZeniMax's studios, including id Software, Machine Games, Tango Gameworks, and more for $7.5 billion. And Microsoft now has total control over the Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Starfield, Doom, Wolfenstein, Quake, and many, many more. The unprecedented momentum of such a merger took Microsoft to November 10th, when it successfully launched the Xbox Series X for $500 and the Xbox Series S for $300. Though the latter leaked ahead of its planned announcement, causing Xbox to coolly roll with it and post the meme heard round the world. While the Halo-sized hole in the launch lineup was clearly felt thanks to a lack of any other truly next-gen games, the console itself was great! A fully featured device that not only supported a huge chunk of the Xbox back catalog all the way back to the original Xbox, but embraced it. The Series S offers a pretty impressive bang for your buck, too. Microsoft added FPS boost in early 2021, and then started doubling frame rates like it was going out of style. And it already had external storage support, variable refresh rate, and other quality of life features that Sony still has to add to the PlayStation 5. Sadly though, supply can't keep up with demand for either new Xbox, nor the incredibly successful PS5 for that matter, thanks in large part to a global chip shortage that's affecting everything from consoles to cars. Microsoft CFO Tim Stewart said in November that Xbox console supply will likely continue to lag for at least a bit longer. But console supply is about the only thing not going Microsoft's way in 2021. To say that Xbox Game Pass has been on fire, NBA Jam style, would be selling it short. The Netflix for video game service topped 23 million subscribers by the end of the first quarter, thanks in part to the snowball rolling down a hill momentum that Microsoft has been building. In the span of a month, Game Pass landed Outriders as a day one game, got the formerly Switch exclusive retro RPG Octopath Traveler for its Xbox debut, and perhaps most awesome of all, MLB The Show 21, a Sony-developed game that spent its first 15 years as a PlayStation exclusive, could be played on day one on Xbox at no additional cost to Game Pass subscribers. That the Xbox release of MLB The Show also ended a generation-long void of simulation baseball gaming on Xbox was the cherry on top. Microsoft even, as promised, 
found a way around Apple's anti-xCloud policy and launched a limited game streaming beta for iOS devices, meaning that soon virtually all Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will be able to play a selection of their favorite games from anywhere. As we look ahead to the rest of the Xbox's year, the bad news is that there is still a painfully obvious lack of exclusive games. The good news is that the long drought is finally almost over, and once it ends later this year, it's likely to end for good. Exclusive games should begin trickling out soon, such as 12 Minutes, which we've played and absolutely love so far, Scorn, The Ascent, the Series X release of the masterpiece Microsoft Flight Simulator, Remedy's Crossfire X campaign, and finally, Halo Infinite. If we're being honest, could the Series X have launched this November with an absolutely killer lineup instead of last November and the dry spell that we've weathered ever since? Probably, but at the very least, the end of the Xbox's year one should look a lot better than the beginning, at least from a game's perspective. Meanwhile, year two is still vague for now, but we know what's out there and at least somewhat likely for a 2022 release. The next-gen Forza Motorsport reboot, Hellblade 2, Everwild, State of Decay 3, and Starfield are just the first party games we know about that could land next year. Plenty more are probably a bit further out on the horizon, like Fable, Perfect Dark, Avowed, The Elder Scrolls 6, and more. Every console generation seems to be different from the last in some way or another, and the Xbox Series X generation has already proven unique. It launched in the middle of a pandemic, quite smoothly under such crazy circumstances, which is a testament to Microsoft, and we've already had plenty of surprises and delights. That should continue as the Xbox Series X's first E3 looms before giving way to an exciting second half of 2021 and beyond. For more on all things Xbox, stay tuned to IGN and our weekly Xbox show, Podcast Unlocked.
Am I dead already? I, I must be, I mean. This is a punishment, right? Yep, this is death. No! No! No, 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 no! This isn't happening. I'm going to have to make an emergency landing. Hold on, shit! I'll be safe. <laughs> safe? I haven't been safe since I found you. I found you, remember? You were out there on your own, and you'd still be out there if it wasn't for me. I thought I was going home. There won't be a home if we don't stop the banished. You keep saying that. We're outgunned, outnumbered. I know I saw condors over there. I'm going to dig through them and find one with the working slip space drive. And when you're done with this war, we'll get away from here. Far away. Wait here. Oh. Please. Let me see what I can find. Cannons first. When I get back, we can look. Together. <sighs> okay, big guy.
months ago, your people are broken, scattered, hunted, defeated by me. I wish I could tell you it was difficult, but it wasn't. <laughs> we are one step ahead, always. The ring is already under our control. Soon, the auditorium as well. The Harbinger and the Banished share the same goal. We fight together to honor the will of Atriarchs. But without challenge, I grew weary, long. Military specialization. Confirm facial identification. Profile reconstruction complete. Well, what about Shepard? Earthborn, but no record of her family. Doesn't have one. She was raised on the streets. Learn to look out for herself. All stations secure for transit. So scout out ahead. He'll feed you status reports throughout the mission. Otherwise, I want radio silence. We've got his back, Captain. The mission's yours now, Shepard. Good luck! Gunnery Chief Ashley Williams of the 212. You the one in charge here, ma'am? Are you wounded, Williams? A few scrapes and burns. Nothing serious. 
The others weren't so lucky. Oh, man. It's a good place for an ambush. Keep your guard up. Oh, God. They're still alive. What did the Geth do to them? Humans. Thank the Maker. Hurry. Close the door before they come back. Marines held them off long enough for us to hide. They gave their lives to save us. Saren. The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains. Of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written. I remember when everything changed. The floods. The storms. The fires. People dying in the streets. The corporations gave us solutions. A better world. We welcome them into our lives. But the laws of nature aren't meant to be broken. We need to know what they're hiding. find the answers you were looking for, Agent Dark? Not yet. This is just the beginning.
even imagine it. That which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Shattered by someone or something. Don't tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns. Rewind the clock to one year ago and we knew what the Xbox Series X looked like, but we didn't know exactly when it'd be released, nor did we know how much it would cost. And it's easy to forget now, but other than a sneaky tease in the backdrop of a Phil Spencer interview, Microsoft refused to even acknowledge the existence of the Series S until September. It's been a heck of a year for Microsoft, with a strong next-gen console launch fueling record profits for its gaming division. And while the wait for the big exclusive games continues at an agonizingly slow pace, Microsoft made an industry-shattering acquisition by bringing Bethesda into its fold. So while we look ahead to what Xbox's many internal studios are working on and the future of Xbox hardware and services, let's look back at the wild year Microsoft has had. Twenty twenty was a pretty strange year for everyone, including for Microsoft, as it took fans on an emotional roller coaster starting in May. Its first proper next gen game showcase, a third party event, landed unfortunately with a thud. Very few games looked particularly next-gen at the time, perhaps best or worst, exemplified by a promised gameplay reveal of Assassin's Creed Valhalla that didn't actually reveal any gameplay. Surely, though, the first party showcase scheduled for July, basically Xbox's E3 press conference in a year without a proper E3, would be better, right? Yes, mostly. Xbox solidified its first party lineup by finally showing its cards for the first time since acquiring studio after studio after studio over the prior two years. We learned that Turn 10 is rebooting Forza Motorsport, Playground Games is rebooting Fable, Obsidian is going big with the first person open world RPG Avowed, and Rare is crafting a unique new fantasy world in Everwild. And then came the long anticipated gameplay reveal of Halo Infinite. You know, the big day one flagship launch title. It would be a spiritual reboot for Halo, and be the first time a new mainline Halo game launched alongside an Xbox console since Halo Combat Evolved. It would also be the start of the next decade of Halo. But fair or not, Infinite's reveal can largely be summed up in one word. Craig. Put another way, it didn't go well. Infinite hardly resembled the technical showcase fans expect from a console's biggest game, and things quickly unraveled from there, leading Microsoft to make the bold and painful but ultimately correct decision to delay Infinite indefinitely, which later turned out to be a full year to fall of 2021. Once again, Microsoft had taken two steps forward, only to immediately stumble back by the same two steps. The company found its confident forward stride later in 2020, though, changing the landscape of the entire gaming world in one fell swoop by pulling off arguably the single biggest industry-shaking event since Activision and Blizzard merged in 2007. Microsoft announced plans to buy Bethesda. No, not just Todd Howard's Bethesda Game Studios, but all of ZeniMax's studios, including id Software, Machine Games, Tango Gameworks, and more for $7.5 billion. 
and Microsoft now has total control over the Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Starfield, Doom, Wolfenstein, Quake, and many, many more. The unprecedented momentum of such a merger took Microsoft to November 10th, when it successfully launched the Xbox Series X for $500 and the Xbox Series S for $300. Though the latter leaked ahead of its planned announcement, causing Xbox to coolly roll with it and post the meme heard round the world. While the Halo-sized hole in the launch lineup was clearly felt thanks to a lack of any other truly next-gen games, the console itself was great! A fully featured device that not only supported a huge chunk of the Xbox back catalog all the way back to the original Xbox, but embraced it. The Series S offers a pretty impressive bang for your buck, too. Microsoft added FPS boost in early 2021, and then started doubling frame rates like it was going out of style. And it already had external storage support, variable refresh rate, and other quality of life features that Sony still has to add to the PlayStation 5. Sadly though, supply can't keep up with demand for either new Xbox, nor the incredibly successful PS5 for that matter, thanks in large part to a global chip shortage that's affecting everything from consoles to cars. Microsoft CFO Tim Stewart said in November that Xbox console supply will likely continue to lag for at least a bit longer. But console supply is about the only thing not going Microsoft's way in 2021. To say that Xbox Game Pass has been on fire, NBA Jam style, would be selling it short. The Netflix for video game service topped 23 million subscribers by the end of the first quarter, thanks in part to the snowball rolling down a hill momentum that Microsoft has been building. In the span of a month, Game Pass landed Outriders as a day one game, got the formerly Switch exclusive retro RPG Octopath Traveler for its Xbox debut, and perhaps most awesome of all, MLB The Show 21 a Sony-developed game that spent its first 15 years as a PlayStation exclusive could be played on day one on Xbox at no additional cost to Game Pass subscribers. That the Xbox release of MLB The Show also ended a generation-long void of simulation baseball gaming on Xbox was the cherry on top. Microsoft even, as promised, found a way around Apple's anti-xCloud policy and launched a limited game streaming beta for iOS devices, meaning that soon virtually all Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will be able to play a selection of their favorite games from anywhere. As we look ahead to the rest of the Xbox's year, the bad news is that there is still a painfully obvious lack of exclusive games. The good news is that the long drought is finally almost over, and once it ends later this year, it's likely to end for good. Exclusive games should begin trickling out soon, such as 12 Minutes, which we've played and absolutely love so far, Scorn, The Ascent, the Series X release of the masterpiece Microsoft Flight Simulator, Remedy's Crossfire X campaign, and finally, Halo Infinite. If we're being honest, could the Series X have launched this November with an absolutely killer lineup instead of last November and the dry spell that we've weathered ever since? Probably, but at the very least, the end of the Xbox's year one should look a lot better than the beginning, at least from a game's perspective. Meanwhile, year two is still vague for now, but we know what's out there and at least somewhat likely for a 2022 release. The next-gen Forza Motorsport reboot, Hellblade 2, Everwild, State of Decay 3, and Starfield are just the first party games we know about that could land next year. Plenty more are probably a bit further out on the horizon, like Fable, Perfect Dark, Avowed, The Elder Scrolls 6, and more. Every console generation seems to be different from the last in some way or another, and the Xbox Series X generation has already proven unique. It launched in the middle of a pandemic, quite smoothly under such crazy circumstances, which is a testament to Microsoft, and we've already had plenty of surprises and delights. That should continue as the Xbox Series X's first E3 looms before giving way to an exciting second half of 2021 and beyond. For more on all things Xbox, stay tuned to IGN and our weekly Xbox show, Podcast Unlocked.
you could even imagine it. That which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Shattered by someone or something. Don't tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns. Am I dead already? I, I must be, I mean, this is a punishment, right? Yep, this is death. No! No! No, 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 no! This isn't happening. I'm going to have to make an emergency landing. Hold on, she... I'll be safe. <laughs> safe? I haven't been safe since I found you. I found you, remember? You were out there on your own, and you'd still be out there if it wasn't for me. I thought I was going home. There won't be a home if we don't stop the banished. You keep saying that. We're outgunned, outnumbered. I know I saw condors over there. I'm going to dig through them and find one with the working sleep space drive. And when you're done with this war, we'll get away from here. Far away. Wait here. Oh. Please. Let me see what I can find. Cannons first. When I get back, we can look. Together. <sighs> okay, big guy.
weeks ago, your people are broken, scattered, haunted, defeated by me. I wish I could tell you it was difficult, but it wasn't. <laughs> we are one step ahead, always. The ring is already under our control. Soon, the auditorium as well. The Harbinger and the Banished share the same goal. We fight together to honor the will of Atriarchs. But without challenge, I grew weary, lost. Military specialization. Confirm facial identification. Profile reconstruction complete. Well, what about Shepard? Earthborn, but no record of her family. Doesn't have one. She was raised on the streets. Learn to look out for herself. All stations secure for transit. Will scout out ahead. He'll feed you status reports throughout the mission. Otherwise, I want radio silence. We've got his back, Captain. The mission's yours now, Shepard. Good luck! Gunnery Chief Ashley Williams of the 212. You the one in charge here, ma'am? Are you wounded, Williams? A few scrapes and burns. Nothing serious. 
The others weren't so lucky. Oh, man. It's a good place for an ambush. Keep your guard up. Oh, God. They're still alive. What did the Geth do to them? Humans. Thank the Maker. Hurry. Close the door before they come back. The Marines held them off long enough for us to hide. They gave their lives to save us. Saren. The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains, of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written. I remember when everything changed. The floods. The storms. The fires. People dying in the streets. The corporations gave us solutions. A better world. We welcome them into our lives. But the laws of nature aren't meant to be broken. We need to know what they're hiding. find the answers you were looking for, Agent Dark? Not yet. This is just the beginning.
2021 is perhaps the most important year in Bethesda Softworks' 35-year history. This is the first year in the publisher's existence that has not been independent. It's now owned by Microsoft. It's a move that has meant a year of more questions than answers for fans of Bethesda games, especially in regards to platform exclusivity. Just in case you missed the news, this year Microsoft purchased Bethesda's holding company, ZeniMax Media, for an eye-watering $7.5 billion. That's the sort of money that can buy dreams, and considering many are desperately dreaming of the Elder Scrolls 6, Microsoft has certainly made a savvy investment. Alongside Elder Scrolls and Fallout developer Bethesda Game Studios, Microsoft's deal also includes ZeniMax Online Studios, Machine Games, Arcane, Tango Gameworks, Alpha Dog, and Roundhouse Studios. That's eight studios to add to Xbox. Xbox's already extensive lineup. It's vital to note that Bethesda has not been folded into the Xbox Game Studios and instead operates as its own company within Microsoft. Xbox boss Phil Spencer has said that Bethesda is largely set to continue working as it always has, but with Xbox and PC positioned as the best place for its games. Quite how that will pan out remains to be seen, but already we've seen a sizable chunk of the publisher's portfolio added to the Xbox Game Pass library, along with the promise of Bethesda Xbox exclusives to come. Despite all this, the last 12 months have had somewhat of a PlayStation focus for Bethesda. In the build-up to the PS5 launch, it was announced that Bethesda's next two major projects, Arkane's Deathloop and Tango Gameworks' Ghostwire Tokyo, will be limited-time console exclusives for Sony's white and black monolith. The Microsoft deal has done nothing to change this, and so the near future of Bethesda is very much with Team Blue. Don't fear the unknown. Attack it. The focus would have already begun shifting to Team Green if the COVID-19 pandemic hadn't thrown a ridiculous amount of obstacles at Arcane. Lockdown conditions forced the developer to push back on Deathloop's launch twice, and each one of those delays has delayed the potential of Deathloop arriving on Xbox consoles. Thankfully, Arcane's current target of September 14th for the PlayStation 5 and PC release seems realistic. Tango Gameworks, meanwhile, has been exceptionally quiet since the Ghostwire Tokyo gameplay reveal at Sony's PS5 Focus State of Play back in June. Currently, its release date holds steady at October 2021. With any luck, things will stay that way. As for things we've been able to play over the last year, much of Bethesda's focus has been on live service games. After a year of struggling to make amends for its disastrous launch, Bethesda Game Studios added NPCs to Fallout 76 in 2020's Wastelander update. This proved a radical change for the game, finally making it feel closer to a multiplayer Fallout RPG rather than an abandoned apocalypse. In the following months, Bethesda has issued four chunky updates to Fallout 76. Among them is Steel Dawn, which finally ushered in the return of fan-favorite faction, the Brotherhood of Steel. The Elder Scrolls Online has also given us a year of great content. 2020's expansion pack Greymoor added the beloved region of Skyrim to the MMO. 2021's new Blackwood expansion then dropped in Oblivion Cyrodiil and the Black Marsh. And with that, The Elder Scrolls Online has now visited all the settings of the mainline RPG series. That means Bethesda should probably get a move on with The Elder Scrolls 6 so that The Elder Scrolls Online has another region that it can copy. Outside of the company's flagship universes though, Bethesda's had a quiet year. The most notable launch has been Doom Eternal's two-part The Ancient Gods DLC. While this campaign added some new ideas to id Software's celebrated shooter, it's not the same as a new big release. And so, for the majority of the year, eyes have been on Bethesda's future. Rip and tear until it is done. The first step there has already been hinted at by Wolfenstein developer Machine Games. The Swedish studio announced in January that it's developing an Indiana Jones game, but stopped short at revealing anything more than a teaser trailer. This has, naturally, generated a huge amount of questions. Could this be Bethesda's first Xbox exclusive? Will it be Microsoft's answer to Uncharted? And all importantly, how many Nazis will we get to hit with a whip? That brings us to E3 2021, where Microsoft and Bethesda Showcase could provide some of those answers. It could also be where we finally see Starfield, Bethesda Game Studios' spacefaring game that was announced back in E3 2018. Almost nothing is known about Starfield, making it a perfect candidate for a big gameplay focus reveal. Provided it is actually ready to be shown, of course. Much less likely to be part of the show is The Elder Scrolls VI. Its announcement back in 2018 felt more like a reassurance that a Skyrim sequel will definitely happen. Bethesda boss Todd Howard has also been keen to temper any ideas that we'll see the game soon. Those are all the games that we know about, but with eight developers as part of Bethesda Softworks, there stands a chance that we'll see something unexpected. Its software could be in a position to announce something new. 
However, a new Doom or Quake project, if in development, is more likely to be announced at QuakeCon in August. If there is a surprise game to be announced by Bethesda at E3 2021, then put your bets on Arcane. The developer's Leon studio may be working on Deathloop, but the team in Austin has been quiet since the release of Prey back in 2017. Regardless of the announcements though, it will be the details that speak loudest on what kind of Xbox-focused future Bethesda has. Will all the new games be day one on Game Pass, like Xbox's other first-party studios? Or does Bethesda's unique position as an Xbox-owned publisher mean more platform and release flexibility? Whatever the answers may be, Bethesda fans from all console corners will be watching E3 2021 and hoping for the right announcements. And for everything else Bethesda and more Summer of Gaming, make sure to stick with IGN. Hello everybody, June is here and it's a busy, busy month for video games because E3 is right around the corner, but also a whole buttload of new games are on the way. So let's make this really quick because I got a whole bunch of other stuff I have to do this month. Here are June 2021's biggest game releases. On June 1st, the Warhammer 40k universe gets a little bigger and a little louder with Necromunda Hired Gun, which ditches all that turn-based nonsense for big, loud first-person shooting on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. Then there's Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection, which is on PS4 and Xbox One and PC, following its Switch release from earlier this year. The cooperative espionage puzzle adventure Operation Tango hits PC, both PlayStations, and all three and a half Xboxes. And then of course, the Elder Scrolls Online expansion, The Gates of Oblivion, comes to PC and Stadia, and will be hitting consoles later on in the month. On June 2nd, Sludge Life hits Nintendo Switch. This is a Devolver-published indie which is officially described as a first-person, open-world, vandalism-centric stroll through a polluted island full of cranky idiots. Sounds nice. That's already on PC. On June 3rd, get ready to put the pedal to the uh, other pedals with Tour de France 2021 on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. And if that sounds like too much cardio and bicycles and spandex, you can swap that bike and the unitard for a desk chair and some nice spreadsheets in Pro Cycling Manager 2021. It's a lot of work keeping these bicycle men in... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sorry, I don't know what a pro cycling manager does. Somebody's got to manage these bicycle guys. There's, somebody's got to manage these bicycle guys going up and down hills all day. They're just pedaling every which way, drinking all sorts of sports juices and whatnot. I don't, I don't know what that game's about. Anyway, on June 4th, Sniper Ghost Warrior Contracts 2 lets you shoot people in the head on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. And then DC Superhero Girls Teen Power on Switch probably doesn't let you shoot anybody anywhere, but seems like a nice time nonetheless. Also that day, the puzzle-focused Ori-like Evergate comes to PS5 following its release for basically everything else last year. And The Last Kids on Earth and the Staff of Doom comes to PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch, adapting a popular young adult graphic novel series turned Netflix show that I'm just now hearing about because I'm old and out of touch. Finally, there's the deep space survival horror game The Persistence, which will persistently scare your space pants off of you on PS5 and Series X. On June 5th, another new Goose game is out, except this one actually has a title, and it's called Mighty Goose. The game is kind of like Metal Slug, except it's about those horrible birds that crap all over soccer fields. That's on basically every Everything that comes with the controller except for Google Stadia. On June 8th, chug some mead, launch your friends out of catapults, throw roast chickens at people, and otherwise get medieval in Chivalry 2 on PS4, 5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. And if you'd rather do more serious stuff involving swords, there's always the Elder Scrolls Online, now for PS5 and Series X, with consoles also getting that Gates of Oblivion update I mentioned earlier. If that's not enough sword stuff for one day, the 8th is also the PC release of Edge of Eternity, a JRPG inspired by Final Fantasy, which is technically an FRPG because it's made by French people. It if you'd prefer a JRPG actually made in Japan that isn't inspired by Final Fantasy because it is a Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade comes to PS5 on June 10th to hold you over until they finish remaking the rest of that damn game. I want to ride chocobos and go snowboarding already. That day also sees the release of Ninja Gaiden Master Collection on PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. Or maybe that day doesn't see the release because ninjas are sneaky and they operate under the cover of night. But either way, that game is coming out then. If you missed out on Hyperdimension Neptunia way back on PS3 and then missed out when they remade it on PS Vita and then remade it again on PS4, well, great news because they finally remade it for PlayStation 5 and now it's called Neptunia Reverse and it's out that day as well. 
on June 11th, PS5 gets Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, which must be enunciated lest you sound like you said ripped a fart by accident. That will hopefully give us a better idea of what the PS5 is capable of, but at the very least, it has a gun that turns people into shrubs, which is hilarious. PS5 and PS4 and PC also get Guilty Gear Strive that day as well, so you can make gorgeously animated people wearing way too many belts whip each other's asses faster than the human eye can even comprehend. Meanwhile, Nintendo Switch gets Game Builder Garage, which teaches the basics of game design and lets players share their creations on the internet, and you know that's gonna get real weird in no time at all. Also on Switch, as well as PS4, is Darius Burst EX Plus, another chronicle, which is great if you don't think any of these other games have enough laser bullets or flashing lights or giant space slugs or titles that sound like the memoir of a prescription drug. On the 22nd, you can squad up and party down with three friends to wail on some D&D monsters in Dark Alliance on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. If that sounds too rowdy and you need some damn peace and quietus, there's also Ender Lilies, Quietus of the Nights on PC and Switch. It's the quietest game on this list. On the 24th, Alex Kidd pays a visit to Miracle World DX on PS4, 5, Xbox One, Switch, and PC, and PS1 RPG classic Legend of Mana gets a big HD remaster on Switch, PS4, and PC. Also on PC is Rogue Book, a deck-building roguelike from the creator of Magic the Gathering. Golf is a nice, quiet, laid-back sport, unless Waluigi shows up and starts making a scene, and that's exactly what's going to happen in Mario Golf Super Rush hitting the Switch on the 25th. You can beat up some super cool looking monsters using psychokinesis in the anime looking brain punk RPG Scarlet Nexus, which is on all the Playstations and the Xboxes and the PCs that can run it. And last but not least, roses are red, violets are blue. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 is out for Switch, and I will not stop quoting that stupid meme when talking about that game. I think it's very funny, and I just won't let it go. Let it go. On the 29th, Nintendo Switch players can destroy all humans, finally, or defy their destinies in Disgaea 6, Defiance of Destiny. Hey, this guy right here defying his destiny, get a load of that. Anyway, there's also Curve Space, which takes classic arcade action, but makes it, you know, like, all curvy and in space. That's on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, Switch, and PC. And finally, PC Switch, PS4, and Xbox One owners can revisit the classic 16-bit LucasArts games Zombies Ate My Neighbors and Ghoul Patrol and see if they are as brutally hard as you remember them being way back in fourth grade. And I think they are, even with the additional save states for the re-release. Oh, also at some point in June, Fantasy Star Online 2 New Genesis is supposedly fully launching. It is currently in beta, but only in the West on Xbox and PC, but I guess it's on PS4 and Switch in Japan, and I don't know if that's going to change at some point. They should probably send out an email or something. Anyway, as always, we probably forgot something or got something wrong or something got announced or delayed or canceled since we shot this video, but this month we have a good excuse for being behind, and that is we're getting ready for E3, where they're going to announce all kinds of new games, and I'll have to start thinking of clever, funny ways to announce their release dates in a video five months from now, and also think of excuses for why we forgot to put stuff into the July video, which we'll make a month from now. As always, thank you all for watching. I very much appreciate it. Actually, no, I'm a little bit mad because enough of you watched these videos that it was a success and now they make me do one that's for all of the stuff that's coming to the different video streaming platforms. So if you want to find out what's on Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus or Amazon Prime Video or Shudder or Quibbly or Gumbo or whatever they're called, if you like to watch stuff as well as play stuff, go check that out. It's on the IGN channel. Did you know that Paramount Plus is getting a thousand movies next month? I'm not joking. A thousand. They didn't, I'm not even gonna list them all. I'm I'm gonna go take a nap. Thank you. Good night. Mass Effect, released in 2007, set the bar for what players expected from RPGs during the 360 era. It was entirely voice acted, used a branching conversation system that allowed for different outcomes in each situation, and promised to have narrative ties that would last the entire trilogy. Pitched over dinner by Casey Hudson as a sci-fi RPG, he believed that it would become a mainstream phenomenon and a must-have game for the Xbox 360. 
Fast forward 14 years later and we're on the precipice of seeing Mass Effect Legendary Edition release on modern day consoles and PC to much fanfare, meaning I'd say the entire Bioware team delivered on that goal. We've been given early access to some footage that showcases dramatic updates to the original Mass Effect and a peek at how Mass Effect 2 and 3 will also be improved. But let's start with a closer look at the original, the one that needed the most care to take a look at how it's been updated. Beginning with a combat sequence, we get our first look at the updated HUD and yes, your weapons will still use a cooldown system and not thermal clips like in Mass Effect 2 and 3. In addition, the weapons use a different reticle and there are no longer class specific weapon restrictions that make certain guns unusable for certain classes. But let's talk about the textures for a second. Using AI upscaling, the new look of this garage scene on Novaria is night and day when compared to the 360. The specifics may appear subtle, but one I can point out in this scene is a much more natural, soft effect of the lighting. They're using ambient occlusion in the scene, which you can see more clearly on the boxes that emit shadows. Stepping away from combat for a moment, we also got a tour of the main hub in Novaria. This footage opens with an amazing look at the new female Shepard model as she exits the elevator. The character models looked a lot better in Mass Effect 3, and with the new character model feature, you can start Mass Effect 1 as that iconic female Shepard. The lighting and camera placement has changed here too, putting you a little bit closer to the characters as they move through the levels or down elevators. The Novaria port has been heavily reworked in Legendary Edition, and you see some small elements as you exit the elevator. Couches have cushions, and the textures on the walls and concrete floors have been reworked. In the main hallway, they've added light fixtures across the entire room and even removed large pieces of geometry that previously would break up your path. Here's what Bioware's Mac Walters had to say about why the wall was removed. The wall and why the wall came down in Novaria, right? You'll see them probably uh, more so throughout Mass Effect 1. They were really just meant for streaming occlusion, essentially uh, sight lines, right? Uh, in large open spaces, which we had quite a few of in Mass Effect 1, whatever the game has to render is going to start to hit your performance. So when you have a wall there, when you come off the elevator, it just means that you don't have to show the whole level and load the whole level and have everything on screen as soon as you get off the elevator. And so the art team wanted to try taking out and it worked great and I think it looks, looks awesome. When you reach the garage with the Mako inside, you'll also notice an additional lighting in the room and objects that have been completely remodeled. Even on the Mako, there's texture and dirt on the tires and it looks a lot more rugged and used. Looking at the provided Mako footage is really interesting to me because this is one of the key areas of the original that needed work. The original Mako was floaty, bouncy, and while I can't comment on how the Mako controls now, as I haven't played it yet, we did get to see two driving sections. The first is directly after you leave the Novaria port, and again, the new textures on the ice-covered mountain are immediately visible, but if you watch the Mako drive, you might notice some changes, like a boost feature. Here's Bioware producer Renata Cronin on how the Mako changed. It is so much better now. We've made it better in that it handles better, um, it targets better. You know, we changed up the, the reticle uh, when you're shooting with the Mako now so that it actually uh, hits where you're aiming, <laughs> which is uh, very awesome because it didn't used to do that before. You know, we've added boosters to it as well. We're still in the process of sort of tweaking it a little bit. So this clip right here is not necessarily representative of the end product, but it's got all the major improvements that we wanted. Now we're just playing around with, you know, how weighty does it feel? Because it's still a little bit floaty, as you can see, but now it feels more, you know, like you're driving a tank and not, you know, a, the car that floats for some reason. <laughs> Later, we also got a peek at a Thresher Maw fight on Antibar that shows another gameplay addition. Yes, the Thresher Maw still moves around, but now with a trail so you have a clearer picture of where they're headed with each movement. That should result in fewer instant deaths. There's also a new sensory tentacle phase to the encounter where you need to avoid the Maw and the tentacles as you battle. At the finale, you can notice the plumes of smoke have a lot more body to them also. I'm a little more hopeful about the Mako after seeing this footage. 
All of this is on top of massively decreased loading times provided by hardware advances like faster hard drives. This is a side-by-side -side shot of the original and legendary edition. As you can see, you can choose to instantly be at your destination while in the original, you would be waiting for a significant period of time. And two smaller but important systems we got to look at were the inventory system and character creator. So the inventory system has been reworked and it seems you can more easily sort, dismantle, and compare your gear for you and your squad mates. This also applies to the store, which looks to give you different view options depending on what you're looking to buy and sell. The character creator, which allows you to create a character before you begin playing any of the games in the trilogy, is also drastically updated. The original benefits the most from this. And I've gone back to see how close I can get the 2007 character models to the new models, but the options just aren't comparable. There are more hairstyles, more makeup options, more skin tone options, and you're really allowed to go all out. Looking at Mass Effect 2, we didn't see nearly as much, but there's a lot more detail in what we did see than I expected. The outfits have been reworked, meaning no more orange suits. And all of the outfits available in Mass Effect 3 are now available in Mass Effect 2. And while I don't have any fish at this point in my Mass Effect 2 save, what you should really be looking at is in the new game, as there are improved reflections on the tank itself. So what, we, what we're doing there is, uh, instead of doing a screen space reflection, we're doing um, uh, what's called a render to texture. So you're basically just re-rendering the world in a texture in that space. And so you have to be very careful where you can use them, because you can imagine a scenario where if you use it in the wrong space, you're basically paying twice for your rendering, right? The rest of the Normandy benefits tremendously from the facelift. In Lair of the Shadow Broker, the lighting has changed as you can see in the distance, but most changes in this expansion are subtle. The 4K assets are very apparent, and they may have added a depth of field effect, which I noticed on the ship. In addition, there are a few moments where the new lighting reflects off of surfaces, like at the end of this footage when the array is retracted. Here's Bioware producer Brennan Holmes with a few thoughts. Mostly it's just graphical improvements here, right? So like on the gameplay side, it's mostly just been bug fixes for Mass 2. We're pretty happy with kind of where Mass 2 is at, but you can see sort of improved visual effects here. Lighting's a lot better. I think I could probably talk a little bit about the DLC stuff as well in here. So it's now embedded in various stores or you can get it through upgrades in the Normandy. Like DLC is always the, the fun time when it's, you know, you got all your tools and everything and everyone just kind of goes crazy. And I remember them pitching this concept around like, yeah, let's, let's have a fight on the outside of the ship and it'll be like, you know, in the lightning storm with all this stuff going on. And that was just a really cool concept. And last but certainly not least is Mass Effect 3, which does benefit from all the texture updates, character model updates, and anti-aliasing improvements. But because it was so polished at launch, I asked Bioware what players can expect for the third entry in the series. Here's what Mac Walters had to say about this already stellar entry. I think it's in the sort of global improvements where you're gonna feel it in ME3. The interesting thing there is we knew that Mass Effect 1 would need the most work, but we also wanted to leave everything on the table of if there were things that we really wanted to improve there. And the more we sort of dug into 3, we felt like, look, we are more at risk of taking something that was pretty pretty damn good and making it worse or just making a lateral move where it's different, but is it is it actually better? And a lot of times we just said, yeah, no, it, it's fine. You know, gameplay, everything is good the way it is. There are, there were bugs and we didn't, we couldn't fix all of them, but but we fixed a lot of them sort of thing. And, and we would find them all throughout all three games sort of thing. So I think that's another thing. And you probably won't would go, oh yeah, this, this feels less buggy. But if you were to play them side by side, you'd be like, oh, okay, yes, I, I see what you did there. Putting them all together with all of the DLC, including things like, you know, armor packs and uh, alternate appearances and stuff like that. And when you get all of that content together and there is less of that sort of uh, what I would call friction in Mass Effect 1 that kind of is like, oh boy, I, I like it, but it's really making me work for it. It it does feel like a whole experience. It together feels very um, obviously modernized, but it just feels more than the, the more than some of its parts. 
I was already sold on playing through the series once more, and the Legendary Edition gives me the perfect opportunity. The first Mass Effect might just be my favorite game ever made. Because of the promise of biotic-powered gameplay, stellar storytelling unlike anything I had seen at the time, and space exploration to unique planets. I look forward to jumping back in this May. A special thank you to Bioware for providing the commentary today and for making this amazing trilogy. It is honestly a game that will always be special to me, and I'm so happy to see the amount of care going into this remaster. I'll be doing a full performance review on the final code, so keep an eye out to see how it runs on each platform. In the meantime, if you're looking for performance reviews, keep an eye on IGN Games as myself and my colleague Michael release new episodes each week, so be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. And a personal note from me to you, thank you for watching. I just love making this series. For more on all things gaming, we've got you covered at IGN. The guerrilla fantasy of building a revolution from scratch has been a staple of the Far Cry games, and although Far Cry 6 looks to carry on in that tradition, there's plenty of newness here too. During my hands-off preview and interview with lead designer David Gravel, I was impressed with the fresh systems the team has baked into the latest game. For a series with Far Cry's pedigree and built-in player base, they took bigger swings than they strictly needed to. From tweaking the game's outpost system to introducing the possibility of Hitman-like stealth to a wild array of cobbled-together weapons that will definitely get more into. Above all else, the game aims to put more options at your disposal than ever before. In Far Cry 6, you'll team up with a band of revolutionaries calling themselves Libertad, working to overthrow the fascist regime of El Presidente Anton Castillo, and free a Caribbean island state and Cuba-like called Yara. It's through Libertad that players learn the art of resolver, a guerrilla concept of using every resource at your disposal. The developers weren't afraid to run with that idea, to the point of sometimes taking things a little over the top. And I mean that in a good way. By scrapping together various items, you'll unlock weapons like El Pequeño, a massive minigun powered by a motorcycle engine, or a gun rigged out of an old portable CD player that blasts the Macarena while you down baddies. And let's talk Supremos, customizable super weapons you deploy from a backpack. At the preview session, they mostly showed the one that fires a barrage of rockets in all directions when you're desperate, but the game will naturally feature a number of different Supremos, including some that support a stealthy playstyle. And stealth has a new meaning in Far Cry 6 as well. There's a holstering system this time around, and in-game checkpoints the player can talk, bribe, or shoot their way through. It's now a legitimate option to blend in and lay low. Until you don't. Once the S hits the F, you'll be able to make your getaway in a slew of new ways. You could take a gorilla path, one of Libertad's hidden corridors through the dense jungle, hop into one of your customizable rides complete with jets coming out of the exhaust, or mount your horse and disappear into the hills. Speaking of horses, Far Cry 6 seems to have taken a page out of Red Dead 2's book, adding camp activities to the bases you unlock and develop, giving players more of a reason to hang out at HQ. Animal companions are also back, with at least two spotted in preview footage. There's Guapo, an alligator with a taste for man flesh. Good croc. And Chorizo, an adorable little doggy used to distract enemies during stealth runs. We were also promised that FND bases, what this game calls outposts, have been varied in an attempt to refresh the time-honored Ubisoft tradition of killing some dudes and changing the color of that part of the map. That said, we didn't get to see a base takeover in action, so how much these tweaks really alter remains to be seen. But it's clear that the Far Cry 6 team have taken some risks with the formula, while maintaining the core gameplay elements they've refined over the years. Yara's unique mashup of Far Cry standard jungle environments and an aging communista city-state is already a bold move, and like the Yarens themselves, the dev team seem to have taken that momentum and tried their best to utilize every part of the animal. We'll see if the borderline zany combat clashes with what seems to be the fairly serious tone of the storyline, but ultimately, I'm excited to see such a well-worn franchise trying out a few new maneuvers, and I definitely left the preview session more excited for Far Cry 6. David Gravel also led the Far Cry Primal team, so he's no stranger to unique entries in the series. It looks like he's bringing the same sort of originality to this game, beefed up with the systems introduced in 5 and plenty of new ones to boot. Hopefully, it all comes together and makes for a wild, dictator-deposing ride. For more on the world of Yara, the complete written version of this preview, and everything Far Cry 6, hit up IGN. Good boy. I never knew so many people lived around. 
around here. Get to the center and we'll be fine. that. Twelve years ago, a small development team owned by Valve known as Valve South dropped a little game called Left 4 Dead, a zombie-themed co-op first-person shooter that pit four players against a zombie horde and forced them to look out for the group as opposed to just looking out for the individual if they hoped to survive. This helped give birth to a whole new subgenre of co-op survival first-person shooters. And while Valve continued the legacy with Left 4 Dead 2, the original developers of Left 4 Dead, now reformed as Turtle Rock Studios, had not returned to the genre that they helped pioneer. That changes with Back for Blood, an appropriately titled four-player zombie-themed co-op survival shooter that goes into closed alpha testing starting today. And if my early impressions are anything to go off of, it's good to have Turtle Rock back where they belong. So much of Back for Blood is directly inspired by Left 4 Dead that I think it's actually important to lead off with the areas in which it tries to be different. And nowhere is that more apparent than in its deck building system. In Back for Blood, you actually build a deck of cards that you take in with you to each level. These cards are broken into four categories. Reflex, Discipline, Brawn, and Fortune. Reflex cards typically focus on granting bonuses to speed or stamina. Discipline cards are all about efficiency, so they offer buffs that give better accuracy, better healing, more ammo, and so on. Brawn cards buff your health, damage, and resistances. And finally, fortune cards focus on cards that give you a percent chance of something happening, along with other general utility-focused boons, like the ability to have unlimited ammo on your secondary weapon, or being able to shoot while sprinting. You select 15 of these cards to build your deck, and at the beginning of every level, you'll draw three and pick one card four times. And those four cards that you choose will be your starting set of active buffs and boons that you'll take with you into the first part of the level. Every time you hit a safe room and move on to the next act, you'll be able to add another active card into the mix. On the flip side of that though are the corruption cards, played by the game's AI director. Each level begins with a selection of corruption cards that inform the players of what enemies and obstacles they can expect to face. Just like how you're able to add new active cards at the beginning of every new act, there are also new corruption cards that are added that will throw a new curveball at you. Whether it be fog that makes it hard to see faraway threats, more zombie hordes, a giant ogre that you have to fight right at the start of the act, and so on. The limited nature of the alpha prevented me from really seeing the depth of the deck system, since there's only really one level and a relatively small selection of corruption cards that can change up how the level is played, but the idea seems really promising especially the interplay between being able to see what corruption cards are coming up and then being able to plan out with your team what active cards you want to bring in into the next act as a way to prepare. It adds another layer of teamwork and coordination since you have to ensure that you're not doubling up on cards and have all your bases covered. Another big change to the formula is the addition of a mini shop at the beginning of each new act. Instead of being gifted with new weapons and items at a safe house, instead you're given the opportunity to choose what you want to outfit yourself with before moving on. You do this with a resource called Copper, which you can find out in the levels themselves in scarce amounts. This is actually a pretty big change since you no longer find any sort of health or item pickups in safe rooms. It's up to you to purchase them all for yourself, and if you don't have the 500 Copper to afford a first aid kit, you're gonna have to make the tough decision of whether you want to save that copper for the next act or use what you have to load up on ammo, grenades, or whatever else you can afford. Everything else is pretty much as you'd expect of a co-op zombie survival shooter developed by the team that essentially brought the genre into existence. You'll need to stick together with your team since there are special zombies that can incapacitate and eventually kill you if you're not assisted by a teammate. Wretches behave almost identically to boomers and will explode in a burst of bile that can attract the horde. Hawkers spit loogies at you that can slow you down and potentially lock you in place. And snitches will creep around until they're startled, at which point they'll alert the horde if not killed fast enough. And then there are the giant zombies like the ogre, which seem nearly indestructible and force my team to turn tail and run if we wanted to live to fight another day. Likewise, the one level that we got to play was also very reminiscent of Left 4 Dead in terms of its structure and objectives. 
In one part, we had to hold strong against a bunch of zombies while a loud gravel filler dropped enough rocks to give us a ramp to scurry up to climb over a wall, and in another, we had to blast away a propane tank and then book it across a collapsed bridge in order to escape the pursuing zombie horde attracted by the noise. And then there's also some interesting set pieces that felt completely new. Being forced to contend with a giant ogre while also trying to find a way through a cluttered tunnel was all sorts of stressful in the best kind of way and having to split up the team to plant two bombs on a cruise liner while two others hung back and provided cover with mounted turrets was a nice climatic way to cap off the level. It's also worth mentioning that despite going through the campaign three times, no two runs ever felt the same. Obviously, the card system does a lot of that heavy lifting by changing things up every act, but on a base level, there's a ton of randomization at play in terms of enemy and item placements. Certain rooms that were completely empty on one run would be chock full of zombies on another. Doors that were once completely safe to open might now have an alarm that triggers the horde if you carelessly open them. There's just a ton of stuff happening under the hood to ensure that these levels are as replayable as they can be. Overall, my first experience with Back for Blood felt like just the right balance between old and familiar and new and fresh. Turtle Rock obviously knows this genre inside and out and the ways in which they're emphasizing player choice through deck customization and vendors at the end of every act feels like a smart shift in direction that still stays true to its roots. Thanks for watching and for more Back for Blood, keep it here on IGN. From Disney heroes like Iron Man and Mickey Mouse, to spiky-haired soldiers with buster swords and uncomfortably long-limbed creepy hat creatures, few publishers have as varied a portfolio to show off as Square Enix. Square had quite the wild 12 months, with long-awaited and long-delayed games finally seeing the light. Let's take a look back, and content warning, I hope you aren't already sick of the words Final Fantasy because you may be after we've finished here. First though, I'm going to cheat. Let's talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake, which technically did come out over 12 months ago now, but it just doesn't feel right to talk about Square's year without it. Not only was the long-awaited RPG a critical success, but it went a long way towards ensuring Square was a profitable company in 2020. In fact, it did so well that the company is releasing it again this month as Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrade, complete with PS5 improvements and new story content centered around everyone's favorite material Interior thief, Yuffie. But what about the next full part of that remake? With no word on when to expect it, maybe a reveal is an outside bet for what we could see at this E3 showcase. There's plenty more Final Fantasy VII to tide us over until then though, with both the first Soldier and Ever Crisis recently revealed. The former, a mobile battle royale game, and the latter another, yes really, remake of Final Fantasy VII, this time reverting back to its traditional turn-based combat. Is that enough Final Fantasy for you? Well, Square certainly does think so. Isn't that what you want? The past 12 months has seen the continued resurgence of Final Fantasy XIV Online, with more players joining the MMO than ever, an upgraded version released, plus the announcement of the Endwalker expansion coming later in 2021 that will take players to the moon. Insert, that wizard came from the moon joke here. Yes, we are almost halfway through this thing, but there's still more Final Fantasy to talk about. I did warn you. Revealed at September's PlayStation 5 event, Final Fantasy XVI looks to be bringing the series back to its more medieval fantasy roots. With little known apart from some backstory about the game's fictional setting of Valisthea, there's plenty more we'd love to find out, and this year's E3 looks like the perfect place to do that. And now for something completely different. Last summer saw the long-awaited arrival of Marvel's Avengers, which really did turn out to be a game of two halves. Crystal Dynamics interpretations of beloved superheroes and the single-player campaign that introduced us to them was a fun, action-packed six to eight hours. Sadly, its post-game, gear-chasing online component didn't really live up to billing. It's been a rocky few months since launch for Avengers, with a dwindling player base and lack of content, two major issues for any live service game. There is a potential saviour on the horizon though, in the form of Black Panther. The War for Wakanda expansion is set to drop later this year, which needs to give players enough reason to flood back in order to steady the ship. Square does at least have form here. It more than made up for a troubled start to Final Fantasy XIV's life, let's hope the same attitude is applied here. It's not all been doom and gloom. People can fly's looter shooter Outriders hit the spot for many thanks to its power trip combat and addictive gear loop. 
people can fly's previously teased big expansions that will add to Outriders story, so that's something to keep an eye out for this E3. Near Replicant version 1.22474487139... showed off more unique delights from the mind of Yoko Taro with this upgraded version of the Near Automata prequel. Bravely Default 2 gave us a beautiful RPG to play on the Nintendo Switch, and Rhythm Action spin-off Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory hit all the nostalgic notes it needed to. And then there was Balan Wonderworld. Maybe less said about that one the better. So what can we expect from Square Enix soon? We know that Life is Strange True Colours is due to come out in September, and while we've got a decent look at it recently, a reveal of this entry's spin on the series gameplay seems like something we'll see soon. Neo The World Ends With You, the long-awaited sequel to the 2007 action RPG The World Ends With You, is arriving as soon as July, plus Babylon's Fall the painterly looking epic full of trademark platinum games action that we've heard pretty much nothing about since this time last year. Surely it must be time to see more. Then there are the games currently scheduled for 2022. Project Athia was recently retitled as Forspoken, another game we know very little about apart from a post-apocalyptic setting and an abundance of dragons. Then there's Project Triangle Strategy, the spiritual successor to Octopath Traveler that hasn't even been given a proper title yet, but has received a full playable proof of concept demo. These are both games we'd love to know more about, but wouldn't be surprised if we don't hear anything for a while yet. So that's everything we know is going on in the world of Square Enix, but what about the reveals we can only guess at right now? It's always fun to speculate, right? So let's have a go at it. It's been a couple of years now since we've heard what Lara Croft is up to. Has the time come for Tomb Raider to make a comeback at this E3? Yoko Taro has confirmed he's begun work on a new game that he quote, has no idea how to explain or sell. Might be a bit of a long shot to see it right now, but you never do know with him. There's also Deus Ex and Thief, franchises with passionate fans bases who would surely love to see more. The truth is, there's no way of knowing until Square shares all with the world this summer, although surely they don't have yet another Final Fantasy game to announce just yet. Surely. One thing is for certain though, very few publishers are able to match the variety that Square Enix offers on a yearly basis, and you can more or less guarantee that that will continue. PS5 and Xbox Series X have only been available for six months, but already the newest generation of consoles has been a busy one. From big exclusives to console updates and problems to much more, PlayStation and Xbox's newest consoles are off to a fascinating start. How have they stacked up so far and has much changed since launch day? Well, IGN's Jonathan Dornbush and Ryan McCaffrey are here to answer just that, starting things off with a look at next-gen exclusives that have launched in the last few months. So I'd say it's been pretty quiet across the board for next gen games since both of these consoles launched last November, but uh, at least on Sony's side, I think like with launch day, they've been doing a little better than Xbox on the exclusive games front. We've gotten Destruction All-Stars, which launched in February, and while it definitely had a bit of a light launch, they've been adding to it and improving it and definitely supporting it since that launch day. And then of course, in April, we got Returnal from Housemark, and though there have been a lot of talk about whether or not it should have some save states in it, it definitely showed that Housemark can make a pretty impressive uh, third-person action game that really takes advantage of what the PS5 is doing and things like the DualSense and 3D audio. It's a, it's a really nice mix of showing off what a next-gen game can be. Sadly, still, big system selling games remain the Achilles heel for Microsoft. We're six months in and there is exactly one Yes, one game that is completely exclusive to the next-gen Xbox, uh, meaning not available on PlayStation, not available on Xbox One. That game's the medium. And, you know, hey, it's a good game, but it's not exactly, uh, you know, pumping as much next-gen iron in the gym as, say, Returnal is or Demon's Souls. But still, first-party reinforcements are coming for Microsoft, and the good news is, once they finally do arrive, it's probably never gonna stop again. I mean, they bought Bethesda after all, that's a, that's a lot of reinforcements. You know, they are gonna kick it off. They got this year, so Microsoft Flight Simulator, which looks like it's gonna be a next-gen only release on console. And then of course, Halo Infinite in the fall. On the Bethesda side, we're still not quite sure, 
what's going to happen with Starfield? Is it going to be exclusive? Is there some sort of deal there with Sony like there was with Deathloop and, and Ghostwire Tokyo? But if indeed Starfield is exclusive, that is going to be the ace of Microsoft's sleeve. You've got a new Todd Howard game that could be exclusive to Xbox. <laughs>
opportunity to get expandable storage. PlayStation has said the PS5 will be compatible with third-party drives that as long as they match the speeds of the internal SSD, players will be able to expand that internal storage. But we don't have information about what drives those will be, from what companies, when that will be incorporated into the PlayStation 5. We're, we're just kind of left waiting, and that's really a big problem when there are only 667 gigs of available data on the PS5 at launch. That's maybe two Call of Duties these days. It really doesn't stack up to being much in the long run. And so that's already a problem we're getting to six months in of a lot of people having to play Tetris with their, their game files basically on their hard drive. So hopefully that gets resolved soon, and I do think that will be an advantage the PS5 will have over Xbox, but as of right now, it really isn't. Yeah, for now, Microsoft's got their one terabyte storage card. I've got one in there. In fact, I'm already onto it because these big games of this new generation take up a lot of space. So it's good to have, even if it's expensive. Now, uh, since launch though, Microsoft has added the new Xbox wireless headset, which is uh, roughly an analog to the, the Pulse 3D headset for Sony. I really like it a lot. It's, I think, for $100, which is what it costs. I think you get a lot for your money. It sounds good. I like the minimalist design. And what I really like is that it can be paired with your smartphone at the same time or any Bluetooth device. And so you can actually be chatting on Discord with your friends while also playing an Xbox game and getting the audio from your Xbox at the same time, which is pretty cool. Microsoft removed the optical port <laughs> from the Xbox Series X, just like Sony did with the PS5. So we kind of needed this. It was a little bit of a bummer. It wasn't there at launch, but now there is this good option. So that's really good. Plus, uh, I want to give a special shout out to Microsoft for pumping out a whole bunch of cool new colors since launch for their controllers. I've got the, the Pulse Red one right here. It's nice to have something besides just the default black, so I appreciate them for that. But Jonathan, controller colors aren't the only things being updated, the consoles are too. Now on the Xbox side, the Series X actually hasn't really had any major updates because it hasn't needed them. Pretty much all the functionality that was needed was right there on day one, which is great, but Microsoft still added some good stuff. Most notably, Quick Resume has been improved, and there's a new optional suspend mode that can help speed up your game downloads, which as we talked about, these games are huge, so being able to speed those up is always appreciated. And then probably the coolest one of all is FPS Boost, the backwards compatibility team continuing to crush it at Microsoft. There are now almost 100, as we record this, almost 100 backward compatible games that run are boosted up to either 60 frames per second if they were originally 30 and some games even go up to 120 frames per second like Titanfall 2 which is one of the best games of the last 5-10 years which rocks. We've also seen Microsoft drop the Xbox Live subscription requirement for over 50 free-to-play games which I do admit that's more of a course correction than a welcome new addition but still great. Yeah, it, it's always good to see advancement like that. That was definitely something that happened with uh, PlayStation finally allowing crossplay last generation. I very much understand. Yeah, we're, the PlayStation is in a very different place because whereas Xbox sort of unified its UI across generations and made everything very familiar for jumping into the Series X, PlayStation opted to do a brand new user interface. And while it's certainly cool to have a new nice and shiny UI to, to look at at launch, that means some new problems come up that maybe PlayStation had fixed on the PS4 or even years ago. Uh, so we're in a bit of a strange place, but we did thankfully get our first really big PS5 major software update in April, I believe it was. And with that came a few important and needed updates such as uh, allowing support for 120 hertz displays uh, and finally the ability to store ps5 games on usb extend expanded storage excuse me you can't still play it off of that but at least you can actually put ps5 games somewhere other than the internal ssd and there were a few other added social and interface features that really helped improve things that people have been having issues with since launch uh, but that said, even with that update, there are still a lot of things fans are asking for. I think, you know, especially after Returnal, we're seeing a lot of ask for some sort of quick resume analogous feature to come to PlayStation. There have been things like wanting var variable refresh rate to come, the expandable storage issues I mentioned before. And of course, even just small things that have popped up since launch, like people are pretty unhappy with the way trophies are presented on PlayStation 5 because it's, it's clunkier than they were on PS4 and it didn't need to be. So there's definitely some work that's going to have to go in to the PS5's UI in the months to come.
And so it's been really great to see PlayStation addressing things already with an update like that one in April and some smaller performance updates, both for the system and the DualSense since the PlayStation 5 launched in November. But that said, this whole span since that launch hasn't exactly been the smoothest for the PS5. Now, thankfully, there hasn't been anything that is as ubiquitous or widespread as the Red Ring of Death from the Xbox 360 era. But pretty much since launch day, there was sort of a whack-a-mole situation going on where a new PS5 issue seemed to crop up every few days. And so it's been hard to say what are the most proliferated issues that players have been having, how much of the player base actually saw these. But definitely one of the ones that we've seen stick around is DualSense controller drift. The, the, we've definitely seen some stick drift there that PlayStation is now facing a class action lawsuit because of, very similarly to Nintendo with the Nintendo Switch Joy-Con drift. That said, there, there have been a few other issues such as rest mode bugs and occasionally downloading the PS4 version of the game when you wanted the PS5 version. But thankfully, again, nothing has been catastrophic across the board, but it, it's been a sort of strange, oh, what's that new issue I'm hearing about today? <laughs> On the Xbox side here, Series X owners complaining uh, here and there of controller drift again and random disconnects. But other than that, really, the console's been pretty much working as designed. It is quiet, it is cool, it is powerful. There haven't been any major OS issues, crashes, any other real problems of note that I've seen out in the community. Basically, I would say it's been pretty smooth sailing on the Xbox side. In fact, probably the best launch Microsoft could have possibly hoped for on the hardware side outside of the very obvious and very frustrating and sadly very ongoing supply issues. And there you have it. The first six months of the newest console generation are behind us. Of course, there is plenty more ahead and we'll be covering all the latest news, releases, and more on IGN as well as on our weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch. Be sure to tune in, follow along with us as the journey of the PS5 and Xbox Series X continues and keep it locked to IGN. Even imagine it. That which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Shattered by someone or something. Don't tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns.
The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains. Of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written. Rewind the clock to one year ago and we knew what the Xbox Series X looked like, but we didn't know exactly when it'd be released, nor did we know how much it would cost. And it's easy to forget now, but other than a sneaky tease in the backdrop of a Phil Spencer interview, Microsoft refused to even acknowledge the existence of the Series S until September. It's been a heck of a year for Microsoft, with a strong next-gen console launch fueling record profits for its gaming division. And while the wait for the big exclusive games continues at an agonizingly slow pace, Microsoft made an industry-shattering acquisition by bringing Bethesda into its fold. So while we look ahead to what Xbox's many internal studios are working on, and the future of Xbox hardware and services, let's look back at the wild year Microsoft has had. Twenty twenty was a pretty strange year for everyone, including for Microsoft, as it took fans on an emotional roller coaster starting in May. Its first proper next gen game showcase, a third party event, landed unfortunately with a thud. Very few games looked particularly next-gen at the time, perhaps best or worst, exemplified by a promised gameplay reveal of Assassin's Creed Valhalla that didn't actually reveal any gameplay. Surely, though, the first party showcase scheduled for July, basically Xbox's E3 press conference in a year without a proper E3, would be better, right? Yes, mostly. Xbox solidified its first party lineup by finally showing its cards for the first time since acquiring studio after studio after studio over the prior two years. We learned that Turn 10 is rebooting Forza Motorsport, Playground Games is rebooting Fable, Obsidian is going big with the first person open world RPG Avowed, and Rare is crafting a unique new fantasy world in Everwild. And then came the long anticipated gameplay reveal of Halo Infinite. You know, the big day one flagship launch title. It would be a spiritual reboot for Halo, and be the first time a new mainline Halo game launched alongside an Xbox console since Halo Combat Evolved. It would also be the start of the next decade of Halo. But fair or not, Infinite's reveal can largely be summed up in one word. Craig. Put another way, it didn't go well. Infinite hardly resembled the technical showcase fans expect from a console's biggest game, and things quickly unraveled from there, leading Microsoft to make the bold and painful but ultimately correct decision to delay Infinite indefinitely, which later turned out to be a full year to fall of 2021. Once again, Microsoft had taken two steps forward, only to immediately stumble back by the same two steps. The company found its confident forward stride later in 2020, though, changing the landscape of the entire gaming world in one fell swoop by pulling off arguably the single biggest industry-shaking event since Activision and Blizzard merged in 2007. Microsoft announced plans to buy Bethesda. No, not just Todd Howard's Bethesda Game Studios, but all of ZeniMax's studios, including id Software, Machine Games, Tango Gameworks, and more for $7.5 billion. And Microsoft now has total control over the Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Starfield, Doom, Wolfenstein, Quake, and many, many more. The unprecedented momentum of such a merger took Microsoft to November 10th, when it successfully launched the Xbox Series X for $500 and the Xbox Series S for $300. Though the latter leaked ahead of its planned announcement, causing Xbox to coolly roll with it and post the meme heard round the world. While the Halo-sized hole in the launch lineup was clearly felt thanks to a lack of any other truly next-gen games, the console itself was great! 
a fully featured device that not only supported a huge chunk of the Xbox back catalog all the way back to the original Xbox, but embraced it. The Series S offers a pretty impressive bang for your buck too. Microsoft added FPS boost in early 2021 and then started doubling frame rates like it was going out of style. And it already had external storage support, variable refresh rate, and other quality of life features that Sony still has to add to the PlayStation 5. Sadly though, supply can't keep up with demand for either new Xbox, nor the incredibly successful PS5 for that matter, thanks in large part to a global chip shortage that's affecting everything from consoles to cars. Microsoft CFO Tim Stewart said in November that Xbox console supply will likely continue to lag for at least a bit longer. But console supply is about the only thing not going Microsoft's way in 2021. To say that Xbox Game Pass has been on fire, NBA Jam style, would be selling it short. The Netflix for video game service topped 23 million subscribers by the end of the first quarter, thanks in part to the snowball rolling down a hill momentum that Microsoft has been building. In the span of a month, Game Pass landed Outriders as a day one game, got the formerly Switch exclusive retro RPG Octopath Traveler for its Xbox debut, and perhaps most awesome of all, MLB The Show 21 a Sony-developed game that spent its first 15 years as a PlayStation exclusive could be played on day one on Xbox at no additional cost to Game Pass subscribers. That the Xbox release of MLB The Show also ended a generation-long void of simulation baseball gaming on Xbox was the cherry on top. Microsoft even, as promised, found a way around Apple's anti-xCloud policy and launched a limited game streaming beta for iOS devices, meaning that soon virtually all Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will be able to play a selection of their favorite games from anywhere. As we look ahead to the rest of the Xbox's year, the bad news is that there is still a painfully obvious lack of exclusive games. The good news is that the long drought is finally almost over, and once it ends later this year, it's likely to end for good. Exclusive games should begin trickling out soon, such as 12 Minutes, which we've played and absolutely love so far, Scorn, The Ascent, the Series X release of the masterpiece Microsoft Flight Simulator, Remedy's Crossfire X campaign, and finally, Halo Infinite. If we're being honest, could the Series X have launched this November with an absolutely killer lineup instead of last November and the dry spell that we've weathered ever since? Probably, but at the very least, the end of the Xbox's year one should look a lot better than the beginning, at least from a game's perspective. Meanwhile, year two is still vague for now, but we know what's out there and at least somewhat likely for a 2022 release. The next-gen Forza Motorsport reboot, Hellblade 2, Everwild, State of Decay 3, and Starfield are just the first party games we know about that could land next year. Plenty more are probably a bit further out on the horizon, like Fable, Perfect Dark, Avowed, The Elder Scrolls 6, and more. Every console generation seems to be different from the last in some way or another, and the Xbox Series X generation has already proven unique. It launched in the middle of a pandemic, quite smoothly under such crazy circumstances, which is a testament to Microsoft, and we've already had plenty of surprises and delights. That should continue as the Xbox Series X's first E3 looms before giving way to an exciting second half of 2021 and beyond. For more on all things Xbox, stay tuned to IGN and our weekly Xbox show, Podcast Unlocked.
you could even imagine it. commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Shattered by someone or something. Don't tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns. Already? I, I must be, I mean. This is a punishment, right? Yep, this is death. No! No! No, 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 no! This isn't happening. I'm going to have to make an emergency landing. Hold on, shit! I'll be safe. <laughs> safe? I haven't been safe since I found you. I found you, remember? You were out there on your own, and you'd still be out there if it wasn't for me. I thought I was going home. There won't be a home if we don't stop the banished. You keep saying that. We're outgunned, outnumbered. I know I saw condors over there. I'm going to dig through them and find one with the working sleep space drive. And when you're done with this war, we'll get away from here. Far away. Wait here. Oh. Please. Let me see what I can find. Cannons first. When I get back, we can look. Together. <sighs> okay, big guy.
months ago. Your people are broken, scattered, hunted, defeated by me. I wish I could tell you it was difficult, but it wasn't. <laughs> we are one step ahead, always. The ring is already under our control. Soon, the auditorium as well. The Harbinger and the Banished share the same goal. We fight together to honor the will of Atriarchs. But without challenge, I grew weary, lost. Military specialization. Confirm facial identification. Profile reconstruction complete. Well, what about Shepard? Earthborn, but no record of her family. Doesn't have one. She was raised on the streets. Learn to look out for herself. All stations secure for transit. Will scout out ahead. He'll feed you status reports throughout the mission. Otherwise, I want radio silence. We've got his back, Captain. The mission's yours now, Shepard. Good luck. Gunnery Chief Ashley Williams of the 212. You the one in charge here, ma'am? Are you wounded, Williams? A few scrapes and burns. Nothing serious. 
The others weren't so lucky. Oh, man. It's a good place for an ambush. Keep your guard up. Oh, God. They're still alive. What did the Geth do to them? Humans. Thank the Maker. Hurry. Close the door before they come back. The Marines held them off long enough for us to hide. They gave their lives to save us. Sarah. The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains. Of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written. I remember when everything changed. The floods. The storms. The fires. People dying in the streets. The corporations gave us solutions. A better world. We welcome them into our lives. But the laws of nature aren't meant to be broken. We need to know what they're hiding. The Xbox Extended Gameplay Showcase is about to begin, but before that, IGN's Summer of Gaming is presented by The Tomorrow War, available exclusively on Prime Video July 2nd, starring Chris Pratt and J.K. Simmons. And now, get comfortable, because the time has come for us to take a look at the latest trailer from The Tomorrow War. Enjoy. Boy, they say kids never come by unless they need something. Dad. I need your help. I'll get my coat. 
30 years in the future. We are fighting a war. Our enemy is not human, and we are losing. We need you to fight. I will be back, and I love you, Chip. Seven days from now, when you're sent into that war, you won't be fighting for your country. You'll be fighting for the world. Is it all right? Yeah. Going to war. Stop talking. Listen. Sorry, I, I mean, when I'm nervous, I talk. I'm like a 90, 97 on the nervous scale. That should be fun. Welcome to the future. You and your unit are now in 2051. They're everywhere. We are food, and they are hungry. Our enemy is smarter, faster, and stronger than you can possibly imagine. Do you want to see something really dangerous? I feel like literally that's all I've been doing since I got here, but OK. Within the next few weeks, the human species will disappear from the face of the Earth. Nothing we do here matters. No, that's where you're wrong. I don't believe that one bit. Together, we can stop this war from ever happening. This is my opportunity to give this world a second chance. Second chances are really hard to come by. Light him up! I'm not gonna hide. I'm gonna fight. It's not even loaded. Yeah, well, yeah, it's not loaded. It's a pressurized cabin. Why would I load it in the cabin? The bullet goes in the thing and everybody's sucked out. There's wonder that place in our dreams We can disappear into a world beyond Bring me that horizon. If we can imagine and know what to do, we can fall into the
and welcome to Xbox Game Showcase Extended. I'm your host, Paris Lilly. You may also know me from Gamertag Radio and Kind of Funny. I'm excited to be here with you today. We just saw a recap of Sunday's Xbox Showcase and wow, 30 games from some of the world's most talented developers and 27 of those games are coming to you on Xbox Game Pass. We saw the first in-engine footage of Starfield and learned that yes, Bethesda is bringing it to Xbox, PC, and day one on Game Pass exclusively. They also showed us Battlefield 2042, Sea of Thieves, A Pirate's Life, Stalker 2, Psychonauts 2, and how about Redfall? Like they said, this year, Xbox is all about the games. Today, Xbox Game Showcase Extended is our chance to hear from the developers behind the games that are redefining interactive entertainment. Developers like Double Fine, Playground Games, Supergiant, Rare, 343 Industries, and more. We also have a new accessory design program to share with you and a couple of other cool surprises. That's enough talk. Let's jump right in. You can see it for yourselves, Forza Horizon 5 looks phenomenal. And here with us today, all the way from the UK, is Mike Brown from Playground Games. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, great to be here. Now Mike, Forza Horizon has taken driving fans to Colorado, France, Italy, Australia, and the UK. How did you decide on Mexico for Forza Horizon 5? Yeah, so we knew right from the start that we wanted it to be the largest horizon yet. Um, but it's not far down the path from that that you realize you don't want to go big if it's just going to be more of the same. So we also knew that it needs to be the most contrasting, most diverse open world we'd ever built. And then when you start to look at Mexico, it, it really is like the whole world in one country. It's got snowy peaks, tropical jungles, epic canyons, amazing beaches, beautiful architecture, incredible historic cities, but also modern cities as well. It really has everything. And then you add in the culture, the music, the artwork, the people, the history, and there really is no more exciting location for the Horizon Festival. Now that we're in Mexico, what are some of the authentic elements that we can expect in the game? Yeah, totally. So we've got the largest and most diverse world we've ever built. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, something that really excited us about Mexico is the culture. So we've worked with creatives from all across Mexico. We've had Mexican artists produce beautiful mural artwork that you'll find on the walls around the game. We've worked with Mexican music acts to produce original compositions for the game. We've worked with Mexican scriptwriters and actors so that all of those Mexican voices you hear in the game will sound really authentic. And perhaps not as obvious, uh, but the other thing that is super authentic is uh, all of our light data and skies. So we had a team out in Mexico uh, with our 12K HDR sky capture rig. We captured more than 400 hours of sky data, and then we recreate that in-game. Um, so all of the, the light, the shadows, the color information, uh, all of it is recreated in-game based on real light data captured from Mexico. So everything you're seeing there is, just has that real authenticity, that, that, that feeling of, of reality. Now, we got a peek at Event Lab. Now, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so Event Lab is a, a really exciting uh, new suite of tools that will allow people in the community to create whatever they can imagine, really. If we look at the video right now, all of this that we see has been built uh, using that Event Lab tool set. Uh, the bowling pins that have been placed, so someone's gone along, they've placed those, and then they've created rules that touch on them as well. So as we see, every time they're hitting them, uh, a rule has been set up such that it gives, gives players points. And then also in that, in that clip, you can see that everyone else in that multiplayer session is hitting bowling pins as well well, and all of that is adding into a collective team score. Uh, the rules could have easily been set up so that it wasn't a team score, that it was competitive. All of that creative freedom is, is, is open to players. It's, as, as a game designer, I think it's the feature that I'm most excited about in, in Forza Horizon 5. And I would say as a gamer, it's a feature I'm definitely excited about because this really is going to open up some unique features between me and my friends. Now, with the power of the Xbox Series X and the S, what are some of the new technical features that we can expect? Mm. So in, in Forza Vista, we're really able to turn up everything, ramp everything on, turn on ray tracing, and we have the cars looking more realistic than they ever have before, unparalleled detail. But that detail 
it does apply to the rest of the world as well. During the uh, Xbox E3 showcase the other day, I mentioned we'd modeled the detail on everything, right down to the individual needles on the Choya cactus. Uh, that was just the plants that happened to be closest to the camera at that point. Um, that, that level of detail is applied to everything that you see. And thanks to the power of the Xbox Series consoles, it's not just things that are right in front of the camera as well. We've really been able to push out all of the, the LODs and the draw distance and everything so that everything in the scene is full of that detail. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we capture that light data from Mexico, so you get this realistic lighting, shadows, AO, all of it comes together to create a scene that just looks real. Now, Mike, when can the world expect to play Forza Horizon 5? Sure. So we're launching this holiday on the Xbox Series consoles, the Xbox One consoles. We're on PC, on both the Windows 10 Store and Steam. Of course, we're in Game Pass and Game Pass Ultimate, and you can play us on your Android device with Xbox Cloud Gaming. And players who purchase the premium edition, or if they're a Game Pass subscriber and get the premium add-ons bundle, you'll get early access as well. So you'll be able to play a little bit earlier than everybody else. Now, Mike, this was a huge moment for you and the team. What does this mean to you? Yeah, well, for me personally, I mean, I've been working on the Forza franchise for a really, really long time, but this is my, this is my first game as creative director. So in this period over the last few days and, and week or so, as people are seeing it for the first time, for me, it's probably been one of the most exciting experiences of my life. It's been absolutely incredible. Again, Mike, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Later in the show, we'll be hearing from the developers behind games like Age of Empires 4, Shredders, and Grounded. But first, the team at Ninja Theory has something to share with you. Here's Tamim, Chief Creative Ninja, to explain what they've been hard at work on for Hellblade 2. Hello everyone, and welcome to our brand spanking new Ninja House in Cambridge. I wanted to give you an update on the work so far for Senua Saga Hellblade 2. What we're doing right now is building a good chunky slice of the game before we then move into full production to build out the rest. Hellblade was very special for us and we didn't want to do a straight sequel, we wanted to do something extra special, and so we're making our lives as difficult as possible in that pursuit. The game is set in Iceland, 9th century Iceland, so we've been sending out art and audio teams out there, doing photography, photogrammetry, and combining it with satellite data to recreate large swathes of the landscape. On the character front, we're building real costumes, scanning them in, we're collaborating with Epic Games to bring you next generation digital characters. On the combat front, we want it to be extra real and brutal. And so Melina, our main actress, has been training for two years and all of our animators have undergone combat training. And so what you're going to see here is not a trailer, it's not a gameplay reveal, but rather a montage of the kind of work we've been up to. Hope you like it. You follow me on this journey by sea, by land, and dreams through the valleys of despair, over the mountains of rage, to the depth of fear in my mind. You might see me as weak, but I will show you what lies behind my eyes. With our swords, we will forge new stories to strike the gods that haunt us. We will embrace our suffering. Soothe our scars of grief and break their siege of our minds. They may see them as gods, but we, we will show them what lies behind our eyes. Gao.
That is Xbox Design Lab. And here to tell us more about Xbox Design Lab is Naveen Kumar. Naveen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Paris. So, what is Xbox Design Lab? Design Lab is a controller customization service on Xbox.com where you can choose nearly any color combination you want for your controller and really make it yours. Uh, you can design a controller based off your favorite video game character, your favorite sports team, or whatever inspires you. And you can think of Design Lab as your own personal design studio. Now, we've originally launched Design Lab uh, five years ago and have since sold millions of controllers to fans around the world. But then we had to take a pause as we brought up our latest generation of Xbox hardware. But now we're back offering customization on the latest generation Xbox wireless controller. Now, we have so many awesome controllers here right now. Can you kind of talk a little bit about them? Yeah, well, right off the bat, you can see there's tons of color options to choose from. For most of the parts on the controller, uh, you can choose among 18 different colors for all the different, different pieces on the exterior. Uh, three of those colors are brand new to Design Lab. We have shock blue, pulse red, and my personal favorite, the electric volt color. Most of the colors uh, include post-consumer recycled resins in them. So there's a, a portion of, of things that are ground up like automotive headlights, uh, recycled water bottle jugs, uh, things that make the controller more eco-friendly. We also have new button options for the ABXY button set and the view menu share, including a really cool button option uh, for ABXY that's a throwback to the original Xbox 360 controller. So you gotta check that out. And um, yeah, this is just the beginning. We're excited to, to introduce more customization options over time. Now, two of these controllers were inspired by games. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so there's a, a blue and green and purple one that's inspired by Psychonauts 2. We just love the key art for that one, so we work with our partners uh, to develop a controller to help bring that to life. And there's also one that's inspired uh, by Grounded and the aphid character from that game. Uh, we had a lot of fun in designing that as well, as a controller kind of looks like an aphid if you look at it yeah. uh, from the right angles. Now, I created my own controller. <clears throat> I'm going to pick it up now. I'm a huge Los Angeles Lakers fan world champion Los Angeles <laughs> Lakers, and my design was inspired by that. So I went with the yellow on the front, I went with the purple on the back, um, I designed the buttons kind of with the black accent along with the, uh, the shoulders and, and the triggers. Um, but I also did an inscription on it, and my inscription says, Ka can't cook. And that is inspired by my good friend, Khalif Adams. He does a fantastic show called Spawn on Me, but he's a terrible cook. So I want to make sure that every time I pick up a controller to play on Xbox, I'm reminded how terrible of a cook he is and to avoid it at all costs. But enough of terrible cooking. Let's talk about something that you designed. Yeah, I designed this controller right in front of me here. Uh, again, on my favorite color, this electric volt. I just love the way uh, that the midnight blue accents pop against it the dark ABXY colors. Uh, and this one's inspired by a pair of sneakers I have at home, so I had to make a controller based off yeah, that. That's awesome. Now, one last thing. When can fans expect to start designing their own Xbox controllers? They can start today by visiting xbox.com slash Xbox Design Lab. There's tons of inspirations to choose from. Uh, Customization is really fun. And we're shipping controllers to US, Canada, and most Western European countries. And uh, these make great gifts, whether it's for yourself or that special gamer in your life. That is fantastic. Naveen, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Paris. Later in the show, World's Edge will give us a deeper look at Age of Empires 4. But first, Tim Schafer is giving us a closer look at Psychonauts 2. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Schafer from Double Fine Productions here today to take a deeper look into Psychonauts 2. Psychonauts 2 is an action-adventure game starring Rasputin Aquato, a powerful young psychic, also a trained acrobat, who ran away from his circus home to join the Psychonauts and expand and explore his psychic abilities. One of Raz's most important psychic abilities is that of astral projection, which allows him to project his psyche into someone else's mind and see their mental landscape made real. He can help them wrestle with their inner demons and fight their actual nightmares in person. Which means that the levels in the game are actually brains. And Psychonauts 2 has even more brains than the first game. One of the first brains you'll get to visit is that of Caligosto Lobato. Now, Dr. Lobato was actually a villain in the first game, but after Raz fought him, they kind of became friends. He actually has a piece of information that Raz wants, which is who kidnapped Truman Zanotto. And Dr. Lobato wants to tell you, but he can't. 
because of something going on deep in his unconscious mind. So Raz has to travel along with Sasha and Mia and Coach Oleander into his mind and try to extract that information. And there's a lot of forces at work inside Lobato's mind, maybe put there by someone else, who are trying to stop you, including some of uh, the enemies that you might recognize from the first Psychonauts game, including the sensors, entities designed to stamp out thoughts that don't belong in someone's mind, including Raz, who doesn't belong here. But you also see a lot of new enemies, such as doubts and regrets. Lobato's mind is plagued with doubts and regrets, and they're very dangerous for Raz. Did I mention there's a lot of teeth? Have I mentioned there's a lot of teeth? There's a lot of teeth. He's an amateur dentist. He doesn't know a lot about teeth, but he really, really likes them. Luckily, to fight all these enemies, Raz will have his psychic powers, including his powerful psychic punch, where he has his hands that extend psychically from his body into a powerful melee combo. He also has a psychic blast, where he can shoot a powerful energy beam out of his brain. Raz also has the ability of pyrokinesis. It's always handy to be able to burn things with your mind. And levitation. Raz can use his own thoughts, his own thought bubble over his head as a balloon to float around or ride around on to get somewhere really quickly. So with these new powers, Raz can fight all these new enemies and hopefully find out who kidnapped Truman Zanotto. Now, while Truman's been kidnapped, the person running the Psychonauts is Hollis Forsyth, the second head of the Psychonauts. Hollis is also the head of the intern program, which is what Raz has joined now that he's become part of the Psychonauts. And he is invited into Hollis's brain for instruction. Hollis is teaching him a new psychic ability called Mental Connection, where you can see two thoughts in someone's mind and connect them, sometimes creating new thoughts, making new things happen. While Raz is training in Mental Connection inside of Hollis's mental classroom, he experiments a little too far and accidentally, maybe slightly on purpose, creates a lot of interest in gambling inside of Hollis's mind because he wants to go on the mission to the Lady Lectopus Casino. Unfortunately, this connection leads to more connections and eventually the whole thing gets out of Raz's control and Hollis gets way too interested in gambling. And uh, Raz has to go back into her mind where he finds out that her memories of medical school and where she studied neurology have been corrupted by this gambling interest and it becomes a casino hospital. And Raz has to actually go in there and engage with all these gambling machines in order to shut it down and return Hollis's mind back to normal. And she's gonna be, she's gonna be really mad. Inside Hollis's mind, you'll see bigger, tougher sensors that have turned into bouncers inside the casino, and also a new enemy called Bad Idea. Bad ideas uh, spawn actual nasty-looking light bulbs over their head that become dangerously explosive and blow up in Raz's face. Now, headquarters. One of the things that happens in Psychonauts 2 that's most exciting to Raz is that he gets to visit the headquarters of the Psychonauts themselves, which is called the Mother Lobe. This is the center for all Psychonauts activity, and Raz gets to see his old friend Sasha and Mia, who were counselors at summer camp in the first game. He now gets to see where they work. He gets to see their offices, he gets to see their labs, he gets to see their co-workers, other agents in the field, but also he gets to see the admin and maintenance staff as they go about their business and hang out in the cafeteria, and sort of the everyday happenings of uh, what life, what appears to be normal in the Psychonauts world. There are a lot of little hidden pathways and treasures around the base that he can find, side quests and scavenger hunts and things that you might recognize from the first game. There's a lot of characters to meet, a lot of fun things to discover, a lot of secrets about the Psychonauts themselves, and the lore of the founding of the Psychonauts, including the Psychic Six, who were seen on stumps around the campfire in the first game, but now we get to go much deeper into the story of how they played a part in the founding of the Psychonauts, um, how they were brought together and recruited by Ford Cruller and turned into this amazing international uh, espionage force. One of the things that was so important about the first game was exploring this natural environment around the summer camp, all the little hidden paths and caves where Raz's adventures took place. And so in the second game, we've expanded on that. There's an even bigger natural environment, multiple natural environments around the headquarters that you can explore. There's a quarry outside the mother lobe, which is where they dug out these massive deposits of titanium. Titanium, this psychoreactive mineral that amplifies and, and changes psychic powers. There's lots of secrets around the quarry, lots of abandoned mines and caves and things to explore and next door to the quarry is an abandoned roadside attraction called the questionable area a sort of power vortex of strange happenings which is also caused by the titanium deposits in the area water flows uphill animals behave strangely there's caves dedicated to the mystery of the sasclops 
which is a giant one-eyed being that might have existed and might not have. Here in the questionable area, Raz's family is camped out, his entire family, as if to embarrass him in front of his new Psychonauts friends. His family has showed up and they want him back in the circus. It turns out some of his family members, including his own father, have a little bit of psychic power themselves. And they'll be exploring that in Psychonauts 2. And you'll get to find out who put this curse on Raz's family to die in water. The Quados have been cursed by a mysterious character to all die in water, and this manifests itself in the uh, form of the Hand of Galokio, which is this hand that comes out of the water, which is really just Raz's psychic construct. Raz is so afraid of water because of the curse put on his family that every time he comes near water, this creepy hand comes out and tries to grab him and pull him under, which is all happening inside of Raz's head. In Second House 2, you'll get to find out who put this curse on Raz's family, where it came from, and what he can do about it. The story you uncover about the curse put on Raz's family links back into the story of the foundation of the Psychonauts and Raz finds out that his family and the Psychonauts family are actually um, more intertwined than he believed. So there's a lot of mystery to discover for the player and Raz and his family and his friends as they explore the connections between his family and the Psychonauts and what it all has to do with Maligula. Maligula is a, one of the first villains the Psychonauts ever fought. She's a powerful psychic and she's a mass murderer and she's been believed to be dead for many years but there's a lot of unknown things going on behind the scenes and a lot of mysteries and a lot of uh, plots for the player to uncover in Psychonauts 2. So that's it. Thanks for taking this deeper look into Psychonauts 2 with me. The game is coming out August 25th and you can pre-order now. So I'll stop talking so you can go and do that. Thanks for watching. No shooting, just straight to the bridge. Get that pressure! Heavy. Really? We call them tanks. I call them brutes. From Latin, brutus. We'd sound smart calling them brutes. Gion, you don't want to get in here and help name these? No, I'm good. Brute! <laughs> The Anna Cruces is looking like a game I didn't realize I needed in my life. And here from Stray Bombay to tell us more about the Anna Cruces is Chet Felisek. Chet, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, talk to me about this game, the Anna Cruces. What's the concept? How, how did you come up with this? So I grew up with late 60s, early 70s sci-fi. I love that stuff, right? Logan's Run. Yes. Uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica Space 1999. That wasn't cheesy to me or campy. That was just the way sci-fi yeah. was. And so we wanted to set a game in that world, right? We have those cool colors, cool shapes, fantastical sci-fi weapons and creatures. And then it also lends itself to, we wanted something that was positive about the players, the characters, you're working together. Sure, there's aliens. Sure, you're fighting them. Sure, you're trying to save Earth. But you're doing it in a positive, uplifting way. Yeah, I just after the pandemic, I don't think I could go back to a dreary post-apocalyptic right. world. I need something uplifting, and so we wanted yeah. to deliver that. That that's awesome. Now, talk to me about the gameplay. You you've said that there's an infinite replayability to this. So so how does that factor in? Yeah. So there's four-player co-op. So you're playing with your friends, and what we want to do is make sure that it's different every time you're playing it. And so we have a lot of different systems that do that, but underneath it all is the idea of the AI driver. The AI driver is driving. Everything that's happening in the game with items, where they're placed, what's happening with the creatures, what's happening with your health kits, your perks, all of those systems are driven off of that. And so what that means is, as you're playing, not only do you have those, hey, this last time we played this, there was nothing here, and this time we're being overwhelmed. Yeah. And then you also have those peaks and valleys so that you have some downtime and then you have some really big uptime in it, or you know, a lot of combat happening in it. We're also monitoring how the people are playing. So it's if you're first time playing and your team isn't doing very well, we'll put health kits right on the main path for you to find. And then if you don't find them at first, we'll 
We'll spawn a couple more later. But if you're really good, if you're really killing it, well, we might not put anything on the main path. And so if you want to go find your perks or if you want to go find new weapons, you have to go off that main path and go search for that. And that makes the game just a little bit harder, but in a way more interesting way than just saying, hey, let's double the health of all the enemies. Right, right. And then we do something of, we actually look from session to session as well. So if you play with the same three friends every week and you guys have been killing it for 10 weeks in a row, well, let's mix it up for you. Let's just throw something crazy at you that you've never seen before in a million aliens. And we can do that because you know, normally when you do difficulty, you've got to be here because you don't know what happened before or after. But here, we have these really big peaks and valleys so we can bring you to nothing for a little bit and then have you have it go crazy. I love that it's, it's scaling to, to your, basically your, your skill level, right? Exactly. So, so that, yeah, that's fantastic. Now, kind of deeper dive more into the perk system that you're going to have in the game. So for the perks, we looked at a lot of games where you start with... Um, let's say a class-based thing. And then, you know, if you're playing with your same friends, well, I'm going to be support, you're going to be carry, someone else is going to be, like, we, we kind of get into a rut of what systems we're playing and how we're playing. And so we want to be able to mix that up so that every time you're playing, you're also kind of choosing your role based on the perks you're getting. So perks come in this thing called the Mata Compiler, and you have to go find the Mata Compilers in the world, and once you find one, they'll have from one to three perks to choose from. And then over time, you're essentially building a deck for your, for your character. And so you might have it where, if you saw in the trailer, there's a pulse, which is kind of like a, a melee shove. Well, you can invest into that, and you can have one that you can now recharge your pulse faster, and now it protects your, uh, other players around you. And then it gets more powerful, and you can actually do damage with it. So all of a sudden, you went from being a support character playing in the back to leading the charge going forward and knocking yeah. down aliens and everyone else blasting them. Or you'll get a bunch of perks that are about um, investing in one weapon and making it where when you do headshots, it actually does damage to other aliens around. So now you're the sniper hanging back. And so it's really mixing up that kind of experience that you're having. And you'll earn these perks as you play. So the more you play, the more perks you have. But since we want the game to always be great to play with your friends, if you've, if you've been playing, you know, I'll say you play with me. I've been playing 400 hours. You're brand new. Yeah. Well, we share the perks. So you get all the perks that I have available to me as well. So that way you yeah. could have that experience of all that craziness right. in your game as well. Because it's all about having fun with your friends. Right. The shared experience with your friends. Now, we kind of already talked about the inspirations, like, like 2000. I looked at that and it was like 2001 Space Odyssey was the first thing I thought of. But let's talk more about the enemies in the game. What, what was some of the inspirations for that? So the enemies um, is we kind of look at it of how we want the players to behave as well as feel. And so we bring in outside playtesters every week. They play our game, we watch them, and what we'd see is really good teams would stick together really tightly. And even if we send something like the brood at them that spreads them apart, they'd quickly form back together. So we created something called the spawner. Yeah. And this is just a good example of kind of how we approach the design. The spawner, you hear off in the distance, and you'll hear it, and you know what it's doing. It's spawning things. It yeah. spawns these little turrets that come at you. They're not the worst thing, but they're going to be unrelenting until you kill the spawner. And so you'll be sticking with your team and you'll be like, oh, wait a minute, if the spawner comes now and this turrets come and we've got a guy down, we've got to go over there, I'm not sticking with my team. I'm going to go hunt that thing down and I'm going to go kill it. So you go run off, you kill it, you're feeling good about it, and all of a sudden you realize, wait, where are my teammates? I'm all alone, there's other specials here, oh, I'm in trouble. And it's trying to create those kind of moments where it's mixing it up, where you always want to have it where it kind of almost takes turns of one player's the last one surviving, they're the last one up, and they're helping everybody else up and get it going. And so really looking at having those enemies give you those moments for how it affects the players. Bonus question for you. What does the anacrusis actually mean? So anacrusis is a musical term. It means the, the notes before the song, the little, the little kind of intro. And for this, we have a character, Boris, that you never meet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then all the parallels just talk about it because I thought it was fun to have this character that you never really are sure who they are because it's everyone else describing it. And she um, named the barge that you're on, that you're launching these missions, the Anacrusis. And her thought there was, this is not the main event. This is not us against the aliens with fighter pilots and everything else. This is just regular people. This is the pre-battle to the battle. This is finding out about these aliens and what just happened. Oh, that, that sounds so cool. Again, the Anna Cruz, the, everything that you talked about today, it sounds amazing. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But Chet, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We've got so much more coming in today's show, including Obsidian Entertainment with Grounded, Eye Illusions and Let It Roll with Shredders, and 343 Industries with a deeper dive on that incredible multiplayer trailer for Halo Infinite. But first, the original Stalker was one of the most intense and eerie games of its era. Next year, we return to Chernobyl 
for Stalker 2. And Zach from GSC Game World has a closer look at the game. Let's check it out. Hi everyone, it's Zach from GSC Game World. It has been several days since the gameplay reveal of Stalker 2. Our game now has a subtitle Heart of Chernobyl and a release date of April 28, 2022. By the way, the pre-orders are open for both PC and Xbox. You're obviously here willing to learn more, so here are several details about Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl you probably didn't know yet. So let's dive a little bit deeper in our trailer. This section of the trailer is a bandit's gunfight on the chemical plant. You can see the actual in-game animations of picking up the weapons and installing modifications on the go. The thing is, you can notice the teaser of a new faction. We are not showing the exact moment right now, because we wonder if you can discover it yourself. You may actually recognize the exact location on the swamps. If you played Stalker Clear Sky, you may remember this place. The time did the job, but the tower is definitely still there. Also, in this scene, you can see a brand new detector Skiff is using for the artifact hunt. Because of its form, it's called Gilka, which actually means a branch in the Ukrainian. The artifact Skiff is going to collect is called Jelly. In game, it recovers your stamina. Moving to the Dancing Man scene. Before you ask it, yes, there will be a lot of characters with an interesting fate in the zone. His hideout is located in Chernobyl too. That's a town not so far from Pripet you have seen in the gameplay teaser. <sighs> the campfires. A small isle of safety in the unwelcoming zone. A place where you can finally have a little rest before another foray. You have seen the campfire during the first trailer in the Ruki village. Of course, it wasn't the only one. The zone is full of dangers and mutants. The monsters are the result of the numerous experiments. We're not ready to show you all of them, so let's stick to the old good bloodsucker for now. In this rooftop scene, we are truly proud with the quality of the animations. We made a small behind-the-scenes video from our motion capture studio. The face photogrammetry process makes the final result as close to the reality as possible. The Gauss gun you're seeing in this section is one of the most powerful weapons from the arsenal. Moving to the final thing for today, the man at the end of the trailer is Sergei Grigorovich, the creator of the Stalker series. Thanks for joining us today. We can't wait for the moment when the time comes to enter the zone on April 28, 2022. As you just saw, Stalker 2 is shaping up to be something special, and I can't wait to play it next year when it comes to Xbox, PC, and Game Pass on day one. On Sunday, we saw the trailer for A Plague Tale Requiem, the sequel to the award-winning A Plague Tale Innocence. And for those of you who are fans of the original, we've got some good news for you too. Amicia, I want to see mommy. Where is he? Oh, 
murderess. Where is your son? You have come to challenge me. If history was in your hands, what would you build? The King is back, and here to tell us more about Age of Empires 4 are Adam Eisgreen and Emma Bridal from World's Edge. Thank you both for being Hi. here. Thanks for having, having us on, Paris. Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> my, my legacy age player, I'm excited for this. Now, you had some news at the briefing. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about that a little more? Well, I mean, fans got to have their first looks at two more of our launch civilizations, um, the Abbasid dynasty and the French. Yes. Um, and they bring a lot to the table, um, totally different ways to play. But I'm really excited to show them those. And then also, people got to see their first taste of naval gameplay, uh, which we haven't shown off at all except for a little teaser at the end of Fan Preview. Paying off that tease. And exactly. we also revealed one more of our campaigns, the Hundred Years' War, and uh, Joan of Arc made an appearance. Uh, we also announced that the game is coming October 28th, and it's coming to Windows Store, Steam, and of course, Game Pass for PC. Now, earlier you mentioned the two civilizations, the Abbasid dynasty and the French. Can you kind of go into detail about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, the Abbasid. So the Abbasid dynasty is this amazing technological powerhouse of a civilization that um, has a really unique mechanic that we're bringing to uh, them in Age of Empires IV. It's actually unique uh, across all the civs that are in the game in that they, they construct this bastion of knowledge called the House of Wisdom, and they can keep upgrading it with different wings, and that gives them a host of incredible technologies that leverage their army, their economy, their resources. Um, but beyond even that, they have an incredible amount of fun units, uh, especially camels, uh, unique to the civs again. Uh, the launch civs for Age of Empires IV is camel units. And these camels have amazing uh, abilities to buff the other units in their armies. And so you have these wonderful diverse mixes where you always want to be throwing different units together, but always including camels for the different kinds of buffs and advantages yeah. you can give uh, to, your, to your civilization. It's great. And the French are really, really strong with trade. They've got some great options that are going to make your late game really, really mm -hmm. interesting. They have a landmark called the House of Commerce. And for your units, you're going to really want to focus on knights and lances. Those are your powerhouses. But the French actually made an ap appearance in the trailer uh, as part of the Hundred Years War campaign. And uh, as you can see, Joan there, I'm actually wearing her around my neck. She's a feminist icon from history. This young woman who led with her convictions and led a battle, and she was a teenager. And so she's beloved. She's in age two in a campaign, and so we know age fans are going to love seeing her again. And the Hundred Years' War with the multiple missions, like the Battle of the Thirty, are really going to bring that period of history to life. And all the live action footage that you saw in the trailer on Sunday, that's all from within the game. Wow. We have these multiple documentaries that will play between the missions to storytell and really bring it to life as you journey through the Hundred Years' War. Yeah, taking a completely different approach to how we're uh, telling a story mm -hmm. in Matter of fact, I don't think I've seen any game that no. does what we're doing yeah. in terms of wow. how we're showing the story and how we're getting people involved yeah. with history. So it really, super exciting. It really brings it to life. And, and I've learned things about English history from these documentaries I didn't learn in school. So yeah. they're educating as, as well as moving the game forward. Now, community feedback is always important in, in any game, but especially in something like Age. Mm -hmm. Now, how have you taken some of that feedback into development for Age 4? So we formed a community council back in 2017. We wanted our community and our players to have a seat at the table for development. We're making the game for them. So they've been hands-on with the game for a really long time and giving us their honest feedback. And we then take that to the game team and they look at making changes based on what they've told us. So they've influenced things from the look of the UI icons, the influence system that's built into Age 4. They really, really helped us with their viewpoints make the game better. Uh, and one thing they really pushed for actually was naval. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, we actually, you know, if you look at a lot of the data, you know, we see data on all of the Age of Empires games that people play. And naval is one of those things that in Age 2, a lot of people don't use it, which is crazy, right? But if it wasn't there, people would miss it so much. And, and sometimes we have to ask those hard questions when we're making games, right? We say, like, do we, do we need to do this? And it was something that we, we felt weird about. And we went to the council with it and we're like, hey, you know, 
not, even you guys don't play naval all the time. Like, do we need it? And they're like, yeah, no, we see your point, but you know you have to have this. Yeah. And it was great. It was a great reaffirmation. Um, and we throw a lot of things like that at our council to make sure that we're making the game that's great for all the different kinds of players that love Age of Empires all over the world. And now we're heading towards launch. Yeah. We're branching out beyond our council. People are going to get hands-on for the first time. So we had a fan preview event back in April, and we looked at the feedback from that and have made changes since then. So, yeah. you know, you let us know that you didn't feel like the weapon scaling was quite right. So mm -hmm. we've gone ahead and we've improved that. That is fantastic. Now, you actually hit on something that I wanted to jump into mm -hmm. because H has been around for a while. There's <laughs> been previous games, but you continue to make content for those. So mm -hmm. what's some of the news you can share as far as development with some of the legacy H games? Uh, well, we have a new expansion coming in August for H2 Definitive Edition called Dawn of the Dukes. And in that expansion, we're going to be adding two more civilizations, the Bohemians and the Poles, and three new campaigns for the Lithuanians, the Bohemians, and the Poles. And those are great Great stories about uh, really cool, like, uh, brother, brother, brother and sister teams that work together to kind of rise up these empires, and I can't wait for people to get a ha their hands on it. And the great thing is, is that if you pre-order Age of Empires 4, um, you get that for free. That's part of mm -hmm. the deal for pre-ordering Age 4 on, on the different platforms. And um, for Age 3, of course, because we don't want to leave them out either. Yeah. Um, H3 <laughs> Definitive Edition, we're hard at work on an African PDLC with new civilizations and That's campaigns. Cool. Yeah. And I can't wait to, uh, to show more, but we're not ready to, to talk about that one just yet. But if you don't want to miss out, go to ageofempires.com, become an insider. You get a little sneak peeks at things we've got coming and chances to get hands-on with content early. Yeah. Now, shifting us back to the present in H4, mm -hmm. what some of the things people can expect as we, we lead up to launch? Well, we've got a bit of an exclusive for you today. I so like we, yeah, we're going to name our remaining launch sieves and our remaining launch campaigns. We're not going to show them just yet. That'll come closer to launch. Mm -hmm. But our two remaining civilizations are the Holy Roman Empire and the Rus. And uh, the names of our two remaining campaigns are the Rise of Moscow and the Mongol Empire. All that sounds yeah. fantastic. Please. Oh no, I was just going to say I'm so excited. I can get all gushing <laughs> about things like this. Um, we're gonna, you're going to have to wait a little more to, to get information and see more detail on those civilizations and campaigns, but um, we've also got you know, a ton of stuff planned. We have a beta that's going to be coming up. Mm -hmm. So um, you, know, you can go to ageofempires.com yeah. to sign up for be an insider to get in our beta and get a chance to actually get hands-on with the game. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, again, you know, we're launching October, October 28th. 28th. Yeah. Yep. How long to wait? Uh, on, uh, you know, on Steam, on Windows 10, and on Game Pass for PC. Mm -hmm. So it should be great any way you want to play. We're just uh, really excited. <laughs> that, that, that is great. And I'm sure Age fans all around the world are really looking forward to that. So, again, Adam, Emma, thank you so much for thank being here. Thanks for having us on. No, thank you. Massive battles across land, air, and sea have been a hallmark of the Battlefield series from the beginning. In this next video, Design director Daniel Berlin will tell us more about what DICE can do when it brings all-out warfare to the world's most powerful console. Incoming fire! Attention all squads! The thing that will really excite players is the introduction of all this cutting-edge technology that we're just infusing into the sandbox. I think just having the comeback of the helicopter on the battlefield, it just introduces a whole new layer to the sandbox. It just gives players so much more tools that makes it more battlefield than it's been in a very long time. So we really enable our players to be really, really creative with the tools we give them. And that's what Battlefield is, is, is kind of all about, being in a massive open, war setting and being able to say like, hey, there's a problem over there, go solve it. And the players actually choose how they want to solve that problem and through that process create their own battlefield moments. So in 2042, you will experience three really distinct experiences. Um, the one we're talking about right now, we're talking about today, is the experience that we call the all-out warfare experience. Now this is the place you go in 2042 when you want to have those classic battlefield experiences. This massive war where it's, you know, air, land and sea just coming together in these massive battles. But we've actually made a distinction between two separate experiences within the all-out warfare uh, experience. And that's Conquest, which is a 
very much a staple for our franchise. It's something that our fans know and love, and we're just taking the Conquest experience to the max this time around. Conquest is all about um, the freedom, the access to the sandbox, being able to choose where you fight, how you fight, where you want to go. But it's also experience that um, will allow players to kind of choose their own pacing. And there's moments in Conquest where it's complete chaos. When a lot of players, just, just, they just converge on a single point and the chaos goes up to the maximum. But there's also moments within Conquest where, you know, you've just had that big battle. And now you've won that battle and you go like, okay, you bring up your map and you have a conversation with your friends and you say like, okay, where do we want to go next? Oh, we need to go over there to that state. Okay, how do we get there? Oh, let's call in a vehicle. And a vehicle, you can uh, call it in wherever you want. And then your friends, you hop into the transport vehicle and you go across the map and you go to a new location where there's a new fight. So Conquest is just that full freedom to the sandbox. And right next to that lives um, the other experience within All Out Warfare, which is Breakthrough. And this is a significantly more guided experience. It takes you um, on a journey throughout the entire map. And in Breakthrough, there's an attacker and there's a defender team. Um, and we kind of compress them into fighting head on in a specific space. So the, the, the time to action is short and the level of chaos is really, really high. There's helicopters and there's tanks and there's infantry. There's just everything happening and it's just complete chaos in Breakthrough. So All That Warfare kind of takes these two fan favorite staple modes and we, we make them distinctly lean into their specific strength. And that's on the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Series S, you will actually be able to play uh, all our warfare experiences up to 128 players, which is a double to what we've done in the past in the franchise. And this is really, you know, you can have those moments when you're playing 2042, when you're sitting in the helicopter and you look down and you just see this, you know, sea of tanks, soldiers, infantry, helicopters, fighter jets just moving in unison and you kind of get this feeling that you're part of something bigger, like a really, really massive army. And that's the strength of the massive play spaces that we're building and we're able to really make this play really well, we've altered our way of handling level design. Uh, because it wasn't just as simple as, um, you know, just making it bigger and then portion the, the locations out. It doesn't really work that way. So we've leaned into a new type of design mentality that we're calling clustering. Now what clustering means that you will have a massive battlefield in front of you. But within this massive battlefield, you will have particular clusters of objectives. So the map Hourglass is set in Doha, Qatar. And it is, um, I'm not going to go into any specifics about exactly how large it is, um, but it is definitely one of the larger uh, maps that we will have in 2042. It's one of my favorite maps personally, because it has some really, really cool distinct locations within it. Down to the south of the map, you'll have a uh, fully destructible uh, village. And this is a great space for infantry and vehicles alike because you know as a battlefield player that infantry is skulking around inside the buildings but you know when you're in your tank or your attack helicopter you can just you know can destroy those buildings and get access to the infantry and you can go further east and you'll find a bunch of high rises skyscrapers and so there's a whole section there where you can enter the skyscrapers you can go up to the top of them you can zip line between the roofs have fights in between the rooftops but if you want to change it up even more, you can basically skydive off of the skyscrapers. And if you're playing a particular specialist that has access to a wingsuit, you can actually glide across the entire map space and get yourself all the way over to the stadium, which is on the east side of the map. And uh, the stadium itself, it's a place you go when you really want to just take out your shotgun and have some close quarters combat. No! So the mentality here of building larger maps but creating locations within that map where there's a particular type of gameplay. And with the Conquest game mode, for example, you will also see the, the fact that if you want to capture the entirety of the stadium, it's not just to go there and capture one location. You actually have to capture multiple locations within the stadium in order for you to kind of to, to consider it yours, that your team can actually get benefits from it. So, um, lots of dynamic moments on Hourglass. And if you saw in the gameplay trailer as well, there's a massive wall of sand moving across the entire gameplay space. So what happens when this massive wall comes, of course it engulfs you in the storm itself. 
But as it passes by, it leaves the, the entirety of the map in a different mood, in a different light, and it changes the visibility for the player. And this is a really good time for you to lean into our plus system, where you have the capability to actually alter the customization on your weapon. But I'd also like to mention, though, that the wall of sand is one thing, right? But there's also the possibility of the tornado. And the tornado is this massive disruptor that just comes into the play space and it, wherever it goes, destruction follows. It's a massive, uh, moving, physical entity that will pick you up, throw you across the map, pull helicopters into it. Um, it's just a crazy, fun physics experience that happens as you play the map. So everything is in the hands of the player. This really is a sandbox and these moments are in the hands of the player. While in other games the battlefield moments are pre-scripted, in our game it, they just happen, and they happen differently every single time because it's players controlling what's happening around you. That's something that you only get in Battlefield, and that's, that's why I love Battlefield so much. Epic action at an epic scale is what we all want from Battlefield 2042, and DICE looks poised to deliver. During the showcase on Sunday, we announced an exciting collaboration between Rare, Xbox, and Disney with Sea of Thieves, A Pirate's Life, a free update which brings Captain Jack Sparrow and his crew sailing into the Sea of Thieves. Today, we're premiering a brand new trailer showing some of the gameplay you'll experience when you team up with Jack Sparrow for this all new adventure. I can't wait to be a part of this crew. Let's take a look. You will always remember this is the day your crew was joined by Captain Jack Sparrow. To the Sea of Thieves, quick as you like, chop chop. It's time to bridge the worlds and take our rightful places as Lords of the Sea. Now we have awoken, and we are hungry. Perhaps they'll take me on the grand tour of me, fallen kingdom. I was starting to think you'd taken a tumble. Not everyone's as steady on their feet as I am. This is the first place I've found where everyone appreciates my unique uniqueness. They're coming aboard! Keep your crusty claws off me! Davy Jones wishes you destroyed, and I shall oblige him. What is that infernal noise? That's Captain Infernal Noise to you, mate! Spara! Destroy that statue, and there'll be the double to pay! Enough of this! Hear me, my daughter! Come forth and be! Whatever they've told you, it's not true. Unless it's flattering, in which case, it's all true, but they left out the best bits. Savvy? Hey everyone, Joni, executive producer on Sea of Thieves here. So we've shown you the cinematic trailer, we've shown the gameplay trailer, but there's still more to come. So on Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. UK, and 8 p.m. in Europe, we have the Sea of Thieves A Pirate's Life Showcase. So this is a real deep dive just into all of the details behind this collaboration with Disney. How did we bring Jack Sparrow into our world? How do we capture his humor and his charm and all of the kind of characters that are coming in as a part of this? You're gonna get a first look at a couple of tales and actual gameplay of those. We're gonna get some behind the scenes interviews with our development team and also just to chat with us with Disney just about how this collaboration came to be. So it's going to be amazing. I hope everybody tunes in. So we'll see you on Sunday.
ready for the danger zone. But we'll get to that in just a second. When Microsoft Flight Simulator launched last year on PC, reviewers and gamers alike were blown away by the stunning visuals and the depth of simulation. Joining us is Jorg Newman, the head of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Jorg, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Good to meet you. Those are cool glasses. <laughs> you get your jacket. Yeah, I got my jacket <laughs> as well. So you had some announcements this Sunday about Microsoft Flight Simulator. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, it was super cool. We announced yeah. that Microsoft Flight Simulator is coming to uh, Xbox Series X and S. And the franchise has an awesome history on the PC. It's going back all the way to 1982. You know, it predates Office and Windows. And uh, when we launched last year, it was on the PC only. And it was a really warm welcome from simmers and from press and from people who have never flown flights in before. Yeah. So we're super excited that it comes to console now. And um, so for the first time in the history of the franchise. So I've been playing Flight Simulator since last year on PC. I have a 3080, but it is now coming to the Xbox Series X and S. What sorcery are you doing to get this running <laughs> on both of those consoles? I have to know. I think it's a combination of two things, really. I mean, first off, it's a super powerful console. Yes. And then we are really using the t Microsoft tech stack in an interesting way. So as you know, Series X and S are, is like a beast. The, 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 the GPU is awesome, super powerful CPU with multiple cores, uh, RAM, fast RAM, uh, we can run in 4K. That's super important for planes. Because yep. you sit there in the cockpit, you need to be able to read all the text. SSD, fast yep. internet. So it's basically the equivalent of a really powerful high-end PC. And on top of that, on Flight Sim, we're using the Microsoft stack a lot. Like we have 2.5 petabyte of data it's 1.6 million CDs yeah. uh, sitting on Azure. And um, we're basically streaming that down as you go. And uh, we also do machine learning algorithms up there. And that is how we build procedurally in runtime 1.5 billion houses and 2 trillion trees. So it's a combination of those two things. Super powerful console, super good use of the Microsoft tech stack. You get it to work on console. That is fantastic. Now, with Xbox Game Pass, and with it coming to console, you're gonna expose Flight Simulator to a, whole, a lot of new gamers, right? So what are some of the things that you're going to do to make it more accessible to a wider audience? So we had, to, you're exactly right. We had a little bit of that last year when mm -hmm. we launched because we knew the Flight Simulators, that's their hobby, they came in, they know everything about aviation, they know exactly what to do, but we had a lot of people come in through Xbox Game Pass on PC and basically tried for the first time. So we. Even on the PC launch, we did a bunch of work on onboarding with tutorials. We gave some assistances. But now for this Xbox version, we're actually doing a ton more. Mm -hmm. and I actually brought you a little video. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's five things we did. The first thing, if you're becoming a pilot, the first thing you do is you do a discovery flight. It's basically, you know, you have, your, you have a flight instructor next to you. He does most of the work, he or she. And you get to steer the plane and feel really yeah. good about yourself, yeah. right? And, and so we said, we need to recreate that. So we picked two, two pl 10 places on Earth, like some of the most compelling places, like Mount Everest or Rio de Janeiro or New York or the pyramids. And we basically put you in a plane. It's ready to go. It's beautiful weather. Yeah. And all you need to do is fly and have fun. And it's, it's, it really is an onboarding experience. It's super good. And then we noticed on the PC side that people are really love to explore the world in flight sim. I did that. I've, I've spent like a month in South America and I've never been to South America. Yeah. And it was super cool. Um, but it was only visuals. And, um, you know, so you didn't quite understand how everything fits together. So now yeah. we added labels and Bing has all these labels basically for every, for every POI, like famous place or river or mountain. So we have all those now and we put that into the world map. And even if you go down and you try to plan out your flight, you can now see all the cities around you. And it totally transforms the experience. Same in, in game. So we now have labels in game where you see you know, here's Everett, over there is, you know, whatever, the, and you learn about the, the planet more, and it's, it's a much more enriching experience, just, just experiencing the planet. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the next thing we did um, is that we, we re-ramped the tutorials. We wanted to basically smoothen out the, the, the onboarding experience. We wanted to retain knowledge more. So we had eight tutorials on the PC. Now we have 22. Oh, wow. And it's, they're shorter, they're much more focused, and we have a performance, um, a performance indicator system. So basically, it rates you and how you did and you get a score and honestly I can speak for myself like I'm totally motivated to get better and better and better and with that you learn more and more how do you really how you really fly so it's been super successful and I think it's going to help newcomers a lot the next feature that we have is it's called flight assistant which I use a lot um, <laughs> it's basically so just imagine you fly over New York and you see 
you, you want to actually just look at the landscape and look at the city, but you, you know eventually you want to go to Brooklyn Bridge. So on the flight instructor, you can now, uh, flight assistance, you can now click on, go to Brooklyn Bridge, and the AI, almost like a co pilot next to you, will fly you to the Brooklyn Bridge, and you can just look around and have an interesting time. Same with airports, which are sometimes challenging for people. Like, we can click on the airport and say, please land me at, say, Newark Airport. And then the last thing is, if you really get yourself in trouble, like you stall out the plane or something like that, you can actually now click into, <laughs> uh, you can now go and, and basically say, recover. And it's almost like the pilot is sitting next to you. Super helpful. I think that people will love it. And the last thing was, um, you know, we learned that people are, everybody is good taking off, but some people are hesitant to land, specifically yes. when you look at like big international airports and they seem scary and you need to talk to the air traffic controller and all that, super technical. So we added a new feature called Land Anywhere. Just land, let them land anywhere. And then um, when you do that, the first thing you see is 71% of the planet is water. Yes. So we added basically floats to a bunch of our planes and you can land all, everywhere now on the ocean or in rivers or wherever. Same with snow. So we have skis on, ski, on, on our planes now, and so you can go to the polar regions, mountaintops, or when it's winter, because we have winter and it's snowing, uh, you can now land anywhere. So I think those five things in combination will really make it easier for people who have never been in a flight sim, because it's, you know, we, 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 as we made a decision not to dumb down the flight sim. It's not easier. It's not gamified. Right. Like we, made, we, gave you assist, we gave assistances to help you learn how to actually play, fly a plane. And I think we're going to achieve that. So... One thing on PC is there's a ton of flight accessories that you can use as far as various peripherals and controls. What are you going to be able to bring to the console that can somewhat replicate that experience? Totally. Uh, it's a good news story. Uh, so there's two really good flight sticks already on the console. It's the Thrustmaster T-Flight Hotas 1. But if you have that, and then there's also the Hoti Hotas flight stick. Yep. And so we fully support those two. And then we worked with all the main top-notch peripheral makers, both on PC and Xbox. And I can, all I can say is there are going to be some really good announcements coming up. Yeah. And for Core Simmer, I can say, you can now play. We have the software to, to have a full Core Sim experience, and we'll have the hardware on Xbox, all for the first time on a console. It's going to be great. Oh, that's going to be great. Now, we, we obviously had the funny start with, with the Top Gun Maverick expansion pack. You announced that. But can you go into a little more detail about that? So yeah, I mean... Can expect? We couldn't be more excited, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really like a dream come yeah. true. If you think about entertainment and the franchises that celebrate aviation, you will actually come to Microsoft Flight Simulator and, and Top Gun, and the, the, it's a yeah. perfect marriage. So um, I can't say that much about it because the movie obviously is, you know, keeps everything under wraps. Yeah. But if you, watch, if you watch the trailer carefully, you saw there's some F-18s and there's an aircraft carrier. There might be another plane. And then I can say is we're going to go fast, like really fast, yeah. and we're going to be in the danger zone with that this is, one. That is going to be great. Really looking forward to that. Now, as we wrap this up, there's not much else you can say about the Maverick expansion pack, but what else can people expect from Flight Simulator in the near future? A lot. So um, ever since launch, we said we're going to launch. We're going to launch and have a new update, like a big, meaningful update every single month. And we launched nine months ago, and we had nine updates. Uh, so we have something that's called world updates, where we just pick a zone on Earth, like the United States or Japan or like England and Ireland, and we make that really better. Like we get the latest, the best possible satellite imagery. We, we create an elevation map that basically makes the mountains look better. We, we, make, we create 3D cities. Like after launch, we launched London and Paris. And, and we also make missions. So we celebrate the planet like with these updates. And we're just going to go around the planet. We're, we're, we're shipping two more this year and six more next year. And then we also have something called sim updates, simulation updates, where we work with the manufacturers of planes, with the flight sim community out there that knows tons about everything, and, uh, and also with, uh, with, with real world pilots. And we're, we're basically making the sim better and better. The goal is to make the ultimate sim. Yeah. It's the perfect thing of totally authentic. And then on top of that, you should expect the unexpected. Like with, just like with Maverick, which I don't think people really got, saw coming, yeah. there will be more of that. And I think I, all I can say is it'll get the gamers and the simmers both their hearts pounding. So keep watching the skies. That is awesome. Now, again, I'm so excited that more people are going to get to play Flight Simulator. I've been playing it on PC. I love it. I highly recommend everyone do the flight from L.A. to Paris. It's really good, very cathartic. But <laughs> as we get out of here... I want to thank you so much for taking some time to talk about Flight Simulator. Can't wait for that expansion pack. Thank you so much. It right, was thank awesome. You. Thank you.
Still to come, we have Grounded, Shredders, and of course, Halo Infinite. But first, one of the best PC games of 2020 was Hades, and it's got a ton of awards to prove it. Here's a closer look at what we can expect from Supergiant Games later this year on Xbox Series X and S. We just announced that Hades, our Game of the Year winning roguelike dungeon crawler, is coming soon to Xbox, and I want to introduce you to some of the gods, ghosts, and monsters you'll meet in our rendition of the ancient Greek underworld. You don't need any prior interest in Greek myth to get into Hades, but as you play, maybe you'll get to wondering how much of this stuff comes from mythology. The answer is, a whole lot. Greek myth is filled with wild, fascinating, often contradictory stories of these larger-than-life characters. The Olympians are a big, complicated family, always bickering and always pushing each other, and their portrayals in classical mythology inspired our portrayals in Hades. Let's start with Hades himself. What is it now? Of a mountain of infernal parchment work. He's often relegated to the role of villain in many modern adaptations of Greek myth, but in classical mythology, he's a complicated guy, and much more principled than some of his brothers or sisters. He's so fascinating, we made a whole game about him. As the god of the dead, Hades has an imposing reputation to live up to, so he even has a monstrous pet in the three-headed hound of hell, Cerberus. The idea that this savage beast was still somebody's pet dog crystallized how we wanted to portray the gods in Hades, that despite being immortal and all-powerful, they're not so different from the rest of us. Though, let's not forget Zagreus. We've heard from many players who figured Zagreus was a god of our own creation. After all, who's ever heard of Hades having any kids? But according to some ancient sources, he did. Greetings, father. My ransacking was a delight, thank you for asking. So I'll just be on my way again. In classical mythology, Zagreus is a little-known Chthonic god, meaning a god of the underworld, sometimes associated with Dionysus, the god of wine. But in other cases, he is associated with Hades. How could Hades have a son nobody knows about? How does he fit into the myths we do know of Hades? We were so drawn to answering these questions that they form the basis for the entire story of this game. If you're the prince of the underworld, who do you get as your personal trainer? That would be Achilles, a near-invincible warrior in his day, once called the greatest of the Greeks. It's good to see you, lad, despite the circumstances. Remember your training out there. The pain of death is but another obstacle. Hades takes place after his untimely demise during the Trojan War, once he's had a lot of time to reflect on his life choices. Achilles lived in glory, so he's got an okay gig in the afterlife, but some wretched souls end up in a really bad spot in the underworld, and for better or worse, they get to meet Megara. Ever stubborn, aren't you? Maybe my whip might make you reconsider whatever it is that you're attempting here. She is one of the three Fury Sisters tasked with torturing some of the absolute worst souls for all eternity. And in our game, she's also tasked with making sure Zagreus doesn't make it out of the underworld. These two have a lot of history, and since the story of Hades keeps moving forward each time you play, the more you run into Megara, the better you'll get to know her. There's also Thanatos. Death approaches. He may decide to drop in on you when he isn't busy whisking the souls of the recently departed to the underworld. Thought you could just get away from me, did you? He is the personification of death, according to Greek myth, though it represents more of a peaceful death than, say, the kind that happened a lot during something like the Trojan War. So even though he can seem a little sinister at first, in the spirit of the mythology, we wanted our Thanatos to have a gentler side. Thanatos has a couple of brothers in Hades, such as Hypnos here, the personification of sleep. What? Paul says here one of the wretched thugs got you. Too bad. When he's not dozing on the job, Hypnos can comment on every single possible way you can die in this game, of the dozens and dozens of different possibilities. Where did all these gods of the underworld come from anyway? According to the Theogony, an ancient Greek creation myth by Hesiod that introduces all the gods and their ancestors, many of the Chthonic gods came from Nyx, the personification of night. Darkness guides you, child. You have outgrown this house. Of that I am now certain. Should you return again here, I shall keep you safe. She is a primordial goddess, meaning she is much older even than Hades or the Olympians. And in our game, she has an important role in the underworld, not the least of which is helping you unlock some of your hidden power. There are 30 different characters to meet and grow closer to the more you play Hades, and we hope you enjoy getting to know them all. Some of them feel truly ancient and godlike. Some are funny, some are scary. We found them incredibly inspiring and hope you do too. 
once you get to meet everybody when Hades comes to Xbox One and Series X on August 13th. Пошел ты! Blothering whip -whip. Here to tell us more about the Grounded Update are Adam and Eric from Obsidian Entertainment. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a real honor. No, I absolutely. Love Grounded, love everything that you guys have been doing with it. Now, my first question is this mushroom system. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so that's one of the big things for the Shroom and Doom update is uh, mushrooms. We're really changing how the, the uh, yard is with mushrooms. Every mushroom that you see in the yard is now harvestable, which is really cool. So the small ones, the big ones, the big toadstools, the ones that you find in caves. Now, those were present in the yard before, but now you can actually harvest them um, and get mushroom uh, stuff out of them. Um, the next kind of uh, part of that is that uh, we're adding a couple base building elements uh, like mushroom bricks. Yeah. So you have to take all those mushrooms that you find and then you have to grind them up in a grinder, which is a new building. And then you have to take them to your oven, which is another new building that we're adding and uh, bake the, the mushroom uh, stuff into bricks. And then uh, with the mushroom brick buildings, there's a whole host of new options for base builders. Um, and it's more fortified walls um, and a bunch of other options. So you can build a cool big castle. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> now. We saw the brood mother, so you're bringing bosses into Grounded. What can you tell me about that? What does that mean for the direction of the game as we move forward? Yeah, so uh, the brood mother is our first boss. Yeah. Um, that so we we actually launched with the brood mother, um, and we didn't really feel it hit the right mark. So we took the brood mother out, and we wanted to spend a lot of time making it a really memorable boss fight. So. We put a lot of development effort in, behind the Broodmother, and it's going to really feel like a big, huge fight and a memorable one. Um, there's a lot of kind of 
cool things with it. I don't want to spoil everything. Yeah, right. I want players to kind of experience it for themselves. But uh, it definitely is uh, something that we want players' feedback uh, to see, like, what do they like? What do they not like? How is the challenge? We want to make it really challenging um, and have a good reward for defeating the Broodmother. But is it going to be, is it too hard? Uh, we'd like to know that. So uh, for future development on Grounded, like, we want to make more bosses. And so we want to get all that feedback to improve the system. Now, you actually bring up a great point about community, but I'll put a pin in that and come back to it in a second. So I know you don't want to spoil anything about the brood mother, but is there any tips you can kind of give people ahead of time on what they can do to survive that encounter? I would definitely say that you would need to make sure you have the highest tier armor and yeah. gear up really well for this fight because it, it is going to be difficult. And then uh, you also want to have the right mutations equipped as well. Uh, and uh, if you're playing with your friends, uh, it might be good to, for one of your friends or yourself to use the brand new crossbow we're going to put into the game so you can have some ranged DPS while someone else like face tanks the, the Broodmother. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So again, going back to community, I, I know you love getting feedback about Grounded, obviously starting as an early access game, but um, what are some of the things that you're looking for as far as in this, this update? Is What was something that you got feedback-wise from the community that you put in this update? Yeah, so there's, there's, you know, it's one thing that we love working with community. So that's, that's something that we, as developers, we love just hearing what people have to yeah. say about the game. And we're continually developing it with the community. Um, so there's a lot of new things in our, in our new update. Um, one of those things is uh, flipping buildings. Um, and that's one thing that we're really, like, uh, just adding, like, those little features. Uh, another one is just sprinting up ladders, which is something that, like, you know, just hearing people, how they interact with ladders and adding a sprint mode. The other one is one of our uh, funnier features that we're adding is sitting in chairs. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something yeah. that, that yeah. a lot of people yeah. really, really wanted. Um, we're also interested in like the first phase of t pets in the game. So we're going to start with yeah. aphids. So you'll be able to tame an aphid, oh, run around cool. the yard with the aphid. But you also got to make sure you protect your aphid because yeah. accidents can happen yeah. in the backyard. Oh, there, there's one other thing too, achievements. So we're really excited to, to announce that we yeah, have finally. achievements in Grounded, and that's, that's purely based on everyone's feedback. Everyone's been wanting achievements, yeah. and so we're finally adding them to the game. That's really good. Now, again, sticking with this, uh, the, the topic of community, so this was an early access game, and it sounds like pretty much the foundation of what Grounded is was built off of community feedback. So how does that process work internally for you as far as People submitting like, hey, I, I, I want to sit, you know, I want achievement bets. <laughs> like, how does that whole process work? So we have a lot of like avenues where we gather feedback from the community. So we have we do weekly developer streams where mm -hmm. chat can ask a bunch of questions with when we have Adam on or other developers or myself. Uh, and we'll get gather feedback and sessions there. And then our main source of feedback is through our official discord uh, granted the game. And uh, I use a series of bots to gather a bunch of feedbacks from the players. And then from there, uh, me, Adam, uh, a couple members of the team, and from also from the community team get together. And we have a weekly meeting going over all the suggestions and kind of prioritizing what will work and what we can, what we can put later in the future for like other suggestions. Excellent. Well, gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking some time to come talk to me about this new update for Grounded. It looks like a lot of fun. I'm going to get to sit, I guess, right? Yep. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's almost time for a closer look at the multiplayer trailer for Halo Infinite. But first, it's time to see what the snow, the slopes, and the powder spray look like when powered by Xbox Series X and S. This is Shredders. Hey there and welcome to the stream where you'll get an extra glimpse on our snowboard game that's called Shredders. I'm Dirk van Welden, project lead at Foam Punch. Hello, this is Marcus Foschmo, tech lead on Shredders and Foam Punch. Yeah, you've probably seen our trailer at the Xbox event. Uh, we've been tinkering on this game for a while now and while it's still in development, we're happy to show you more of this game. So I'm switching to our developer drone cam. I can actually spawn wherever I want, like instantly. But I first want to show you some of the areas uh, we've been working on. Uh, this mountain resort is called Frozen Wood. It's inspired by some of the resorts in the French Alps where I've been snowboarding a lot. It has these cozy parks, side kickers, half pipes, really big rails, a lot of features in there, way more than you would expect in a normal mountain resort. But hey, this is a video game and we want as many features as possible. 
So yeah, like I said, this is completely open and you can go snowboarding anywhere you'd like. You can do some missions, there's like a story evolving around the main character that wants to participate in a kick-ass invitational border cross event. But you can also just cruise around and find some nice lines with a good flow, like for example here in the spillow-like environment that was shown in the trailer. Or you can go up there, like take some huge kickers and big rails at the big park. And just look how big this mountain range is, like we've got space for industrial areas and street areas, there's backcountry, high mountain riding, there's even an old Italian looking village you can shred. A lot of these locations have been inspired by events happening all over the world and snowboarding movies that inspired us these past years. It's kind of a tribute to, in fact. Also, anywhere you go, you can always ride during golden hour due to our real-time lighting engine. But hey, having a fun and realistic environment is nice, but it's not fun without nailing the riding itself, right? Yeah, so for the actual snowboarding, a big inspiration for us all, I think it's been pro riders, snowboard movies and all the crazy stuff that they do on a snowboard. And of course ourselves riding in real life and just having fun and being creative on a snowboard. It, that's something that we want to bring into the game. Conceptually, we're trying to keep the convention of one stick for the board and one stick for the body and directly map that onto the snowboarder. So at any point you should get a physical or animation response as soon as you're touching those sticks. And it, it gives you a lot of freedom in your playstyle. So you can choose to be smooth and lazy or if you are more like fast and aggressive or you can change up your style however you want. You want the motions kept fluid and stylish while still being very reactive. So th that's a big challenge and we had to create a complete animation system dedicated just for this. And here you can see the board interacting with the snow. He put some weight into his turn and he really digs in those edges into the snow for a clean carve. Or you, you can just use the, the board stick here to speed check, to line up for a feature. But you can also use both of the sticks combined for even greater control. Yeah, like you, here you can see him balancing on the tail of the board. This is called buttering. And from this stance you can also start tricking just as in normal riding. So for the trick stiff system, we're trying to give as much control as possible to any trick you've seen in a movie or any crazy trick that you can imagine while still making it look great. Every grab you can do, you can also tweak it out with a board stick. So, so for a really big spin you have to get the timing down in the takeoff. And while you're in there, you keep your body tight, so you keep spinning at that high rate. And then it's just a matter of putting down your feet when it's time to land. When we succeed, it looks very simple and natural. So that is what we're trying to achieve, a really fun snowboard game. A new day is upon us. A new generation built to fight. Together, we are unstoppable! Are you ready? Please call at 
your earliest convenience. I am so excited to have Tom, Alex, and Quinn from 343 Industries. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Now, I've watched this multiplayer trailer numerous times, and I want to see some specific moments from it so we can break it down. So can we roll the trailer to 15 seconds in, and let's talk about a new character. A new day is upon us. A new generation built to fight. Together, we are unstoppable. Are you ready? Alright, now who is this character? She looks like she's in charge. Uh, your, your, your senses are right there. She's very much in charge. That's Commander Lorette. She's in charge of the Spartan Academy, which is the kind of contextual wrapper that the whole multiplayer universe lives in. She is basically training the new generation of Spartans to you know, become better, and that's really where everything wraps around. Um, I really love this character, and then what's cool is not only is it kind of the contextual wrapper for the game, but it's also we have a whole suite of academy features, we call them, where there's a tutorial that teaches the players the fundamental basics of the game. There's weapon drills that let you practice with every weapon that exists in the game and get improve your skills with those. And then there's a whole thing we call training mode, which lets you play against bots um, on any map, basically, in the game and lets you experiment with the toys and kind of learn the flows of everything. So we really want to bring players on board at the game and, again, under her orders and her charge. Now, I want to go to 50 seconds in the trailer because there was a lot of action going on and I want to check that out. may have noticed I sat up in my chair a little bit on that one because there was a lot going on there. So please, if you can break that down, let me know what we were seeing. <laughs> There's a lot to break down. I don't know if we got enough time to get all the way into it. Yeah. Um, but the, some of the, the, the things that I really love when I look at that trailer is that, that first sequence where the player, they have the bulldog shotgun, they're running through, shotgunning enemies. They grab the, the commando off the, off the rack put some shots in, low sensor, like there's all sorts of different things that the player is interacting with and that's the sandbox. That's what we call the sandbox, the toys that is at the disposal yeah. for our player's hands. And, and we just really love that, that moment in the trailer where they have the grapple shot, they look up, grapple the ceiling, and then in midair, no scope, snipe an enemy, come all the way down, back whack a foe. And, and then the rest is history as you just see what happened in that trailer. But that's just some of the stuff that that players can do, and that's actually the game. That's not just a, a movie for cinematic experience. Like that is the game that, if players are good enough, put in time, they can actually do the things that you see in that trailer. Yeah, and few things are more important to Halo multiplayer than like interacting with the sandbox and combining it, picking it up off the map, and combining it into awesome play styles. So, um, what we did was um, every uh, sandbox item in the game, when it spawns, it's spawning on an object in the map, so you can see where those things can be found. And then it also tells you the respawn time of that item, when it's going to come back. And you always know, I can go grab that commando over at this uh, spot like that, that guy did. So, and then when the players you know, accrue all those awesome items and do awesome things, you, know, you heard the return of uh, Jeff Steitzer, the multiplayer announcer, uh, shouting out medals. So we always want to give players medals when they do really cool things. So you heard some there, and you'll hear some later on in the trailer. Oh, that's awesome. See, when I watch that, to me, that's Halo. That's Halo to me. I absolutely love that. Now, let's skip ahead a little bit more into the trailer to 57 seconds. I heard a voice, so I want to know what this voice is. Let's, let's see it. Hello. Let's do some damage. Yeah, so that is the player's uh, personal AI. 
Um, so in Halo 5, they, there was a squad leader that uh, announced you know, when weapons are going to come up uh, and other things going on in the match. And in Infinite, we have the player, uh, like Chief has Cortana, uh, they have a personal AI in their helmet uh, that is kind of telling them these things. Uh, and it's also another way that players can um, show their personality on their, in their characters. So there's multiple personalities and characters for the uh, player to choose um, so that the, the right AI is right. in their helmet uh, helping them out in combat. I want to skip ahead a little further here because I think I might have saw a big team battle. So, so let's go to a minute 40 and, and check that out. Skewer acquired. Grapple check. Claim the enemy flag. Return it to base. Drop inbound. The flag is ours. Please call at your earliest convenience. That looked like big team battle to me. <laughs> what, what, what's coming new? What are we going to do in big team battle in Infinite? I mean, it's not even just that. I mean, part it actually opens with actually a 4v4 with a vehicles map called Behemoth in the, at the beginning. So we, we actually are bringing vehicles back into the 4v4 arena. But then, yes, it definitely transitions into the 4v or the 12v12 actually BTB part of the game where we're actually making it a bigger team battle this time. Really wanting to index into the battle fantasy with the more players. We, instead of like vehicles just spawning around the map, we have pelicans drop them off. We have ordnance pods that drop in new weapons. And inside of that whole time, you have the battle commander, Lorette, talking in your ear, giving you orders and trying to kind of encourage you to play around, but really just bringing the whole sandbox and the play style around this whole battle experience that we're building. Yeah, Tom brings up some good points there of, of uh, Commander Lorette and this, you've, you've got your commander on the comms and then you've got the pelicans dropping vehicles and items off, you got drop pods, everything. It just is like this, this theater of war that this time around, it, it is this 12v12 bigger team battle, if you will. And just that last, that, that ending segment, which is like a capture the flag match, is just so beautiful and awesome where you've got the Pelican drop the Banshee off, teams fight over it, you're, you're, you and your teammate are just making a beeline for the Banshee, your teammate gets picked off by the sniper, and you're like, oh no, and then you get the skewer, take that sniper out, jump into the Banshee, and you hit the jets and fly up into the sky and go for the enemy flag. That is, that to us is uh, what is so exciting about this version of Big Team Battle, with all of the toys, all the vehicles, the modes coming back, the maps, the brand new maps that you see there. I mean, it's, it's going to be an amazing experience. Yeah, uh, trust me, I, I cannot wait to get my hands on it for myself. But let's move on. I want to go to 208 in the trailer because I, I think I saw a samurai. So let, let's check that out. Let's go to 208 in the trailer. Okay, so I guess next would be a ninja because that was definitely a samurai. So kind of talk about that. So we're going to start seeing some more customization with the armor coming yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, that is a samurai Spartan armor. Yeah. And so it'll be an, a, an armor you'll be able to unlock for free in the first season, which is super cool. Players will be able to equip it, you know, gain more armor pieces and customization options for it, et cetera, across the season. And then we actually have more of this stuff kind of coming down the line. With, there's actually some really cool ideas that we're seeing in uh, that our team that's building that stuff. So there'll be a lot of other cool armors besides just the really core Halo Spartan armors, there'll be some other different kind of twists and things for players to play with. Awesome. Look, now before we get out of here, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here to, to talk about Halo Infinite. I'm excited. I can't wait to get my hands on it and play it. But before we do leave, is there anything else that you want to bring up and let fans out there know about? Well, I'm excited for people to actually get their hands on it like yourself. So, I mean, if people sign up on our Halo's Insiders program, we have in the summer, we have a... Uh, uh, a, a technical preview that we're going to be launching and so people to finally get their, put their hands on the sticks. And I'm just really excited for players to actually finally get to play the game we're working on. Yeah, and then on launch day, Halo Infinite Multiplayer is free to play, which is new to the franchise. The team is super excited uh, to hopefully bring in 
you know, all sorts of fans that have potentially never experienced the franchise or haven't played in a long time to just try it out. Come in and, and try it out with your friends. Me, with my buddies, if I have some friends out yeah. there that haven't played Halo before, I'm like, well, it's free. Just, just come on. Let's let jump in, download it. Let's, let's check it out. And if it's for you, it's for you. If it's not, then, hey, it's not. But kind of think it'll be for you. So I'm excited for it. Yeah, that's the, the other big key of that point is uh, PC, right? Like this is... This is a, a PC game as well. We've been putting a lot of effort into that. So not only is it going to be console, but also PC, free to play. Like the barrier to entry is so low, and that has us excited. And I think as we really, just to, to really think about it, is we've been working on this game. And as developers, when you work on a game, you want to get that game out there. And that almost seems like, for us, that's the finish line. But in reality, it's going to be the starting line for, for all of us, for us and the Halo fans. Day one, there's going to be a bunch of content there and things that are exciting and good. But then we're going to add more content. We're going to add more maps. We're going to add more modes and weapons and vehicles, equipment items. And it's just the beginning of this whole journey that, that we've been on for a while. And we're going to take everyone else with us as, we, uh, as the game comes out. I'm excited. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much. Now, for fans who want to learn even more about Halo Infinite multiplayer, check out the brand new deep dive video with the whole multiplayer team over on halowaypoint.com. And allow me to give a big thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Whether you play your favorite games on Xbox, PC, or Game Pass, the next 12 months will be nothing short of spectacular. It has been my absolute honor to be your host and share this experience with you. But before I go, Here's a gameplay deep dive from the team behind the highly anticipated Scarlet Nexus. The world of the world is being expressed as a world of the world. The visual of the world of the Scarlet Nexus is a visual of the world, and the character of the world, and the other looks of the world, and the other looks of the world, and the other looks of the world. はい、この都市はこの世界の中ではあの一番大きな都市というふうに紹介されていますとここはスオーという都市でとこのゲームの中心になる場所ですでこのスオーの都市の見た目のインスピレーションはと東京の景色と,と日本の90年代の景色をイメージしてますユニークなビジュアル部分っていうのはいくらかあると思うんですけれどであと今回はセルシェーディングとリアリスティックな背景を合成するような見た目を選んでいるんですけれどそれはまず密度感を表現したいからというのが一つありましたであともう一つはそのセルシェーディングのキャラクターとリアリスティックな映像が混ざることによってまたそこでも異質な見た目ちょっと面白い見た目にならないかなっていうのを模索しましたでただ単にセルシェーディングのキャラクターをリア,スリアリスティックな背景に置いてしまうとあのすごく浮いてしまって見た目が変になってしまうっていうのを懸念してたんですけれどうまくそこを混ざるように工夫したっていうのが今回の苦労した点の一つではありますで例えば今映像の中で東京タワーが映ってると思うんですけれどこれはあの日本では有名なランドマークで海外の人も見たことがあるかもしれないものと思うんですけどその東京タワーがものすごく大きなサイズになっていてでこれは 3,000m 富士山と同じぐらいサイズがあるんですけどそれだけ大きなものあの本当はそんなにサイズない 333m の,あの東京タワーをそれだけ大きくすることによってあのちょっとおかしい異質な景色みたいなのを作りたいっていうのがありましたそのさっき東京の都市をいろいろと混ぜるみたいな話をしたと思うんですけれど、あのー、それというのもその僕たちも知ってる街なんだけれどちょっとおかしいみたいな、あのー、そういった異質さを出したいっていうのがありましてなのであの東京タワーも僕たちは知ってるものだけどすごく大きなあのこんな大きなサイズじゃないんだけどこういったものが。この街の中にあるってことで何かちょっと変な場所だなっていうふうに思ってほしいっていうのがありましたで大きな桜の木というのは日本を代表するあの桜の木なんですけどそれがあまりにも大きなサイズになっていてこれもさっきの東京タワーと同じで異質さを感じてほしいと思ってやっていることですでこれが本作の特徴となる怪異というあのー主人公たちに立ちはだかる敵なんですけれどあのこの見た目についてはあの私はその新規 IP 新しい IP の新しいクリーチャーということでと変わった見た目何か興味を引く見た目にしたいというのが一つありました
でその上で、えっと、私たちの感覚とは違うものを取り入れたいというのがきっかけにありまして、えっと、実際にアーティストの力を借りてこの会議のデザインを再現してますでそのアーティストの表現というのはその美しさがありながらもその死の世界だとかそのネガティブなイメージとポジティブなイメージを一つにしたようなあの幻想的な表現をする作家の方なんですけれどまた彼らの動きについてこだわっているのはあの私たちの知っているような生き物でありそうであれ生き物のようであって私たちと違うものであるっていうのを表現したいっていうのがあったのであの動きの中に一見動物のようで急に違うような動きをするだとか。あの人間のようでいて人間と違うような動きをするだとかそんなモーションを取り込んでますなのでモーションを作る時には人間っぽい部分だけはモーションキャプチャーを使ってるんですけどそうでない部分は手付けなどにしてその人間の動きとそうでない動きをミックスさせることであの不思議な動きにできないかなというのを考えてましたはいえー、まともに新入隊員としてこう入隊したキャラクターが2人いるというところで同じ時系列から始まってただその同じ境遇に置かれている一つの物語をそ,のそれぞれの視点から描いていくでそれぞれ視点で描くことで、えーまあ、その時片方の視点では見えなかったあの状況とかを別の視点ではこう楽しんでいただける、まあ、そういうストーリーの楽しみ方を皆さんに提供したいと思って今回2人の主人公を用意しました。そして1人目がこちらですね、えー、ユイとスメラギキャラクターですね彼はですね非常に正義感が強くて、えー、幼い頃に貝飛ばすぐに自分が貝から救われたっていう経験を持っていてでその経験から自らも、えー、貝飛ばすぐに志願して入隊したっていうキャラクターになっています、はい、そしてもう1人がこちらのカサネランドールですね、はい、彼女はですね非常に優れた超能力を持っているもうエリートと呼ばれるキャラクターですね。海斗抜群からもスカウトして入隊した非常に優秀なキャラクターです。左側がですね、この重ねの視点ですね。で右側がユイトの視点でのイベントシーンになっていきますが、今重ねの視点でご覧いただいた通り、ちょっとユイトの姿が見えたりとかしています。で今重ねの方ですね、一緒に同行しているキャラクター、このキャラクターが。実は未来予知の能力を持っているキャラクターでちょっとこのあユイトたちがやられそうだなっていうのはちょっと分かるようなシーンになっています、まあ、この頃あのユイトの方は今止めてますけどこれはユイトの方では入らずに次のシーンに進んでいきます。と、はい、いう形で、はい、進んでいくと、えーまあ、こういうふうに貝が降ってきてあ同じようなこう状況に置かれてしまう、まあ、ユイトの方ではこういうふうになってるんだなっていうのは分からずに進んでいきますが重ねの方ではあやっぱりそうなったかっていう形でこう。物語が進行していきます、ねまあ、こういうふうにこう同じ一つのシーンでもですねそれぞれがこうつな、まあ、がりを持って感じられるそういうふうなストーリーラインを作ろうとして今回のこの企画から今こう発売まで出るところでもうほぼ4年以上かかってるんですけれどもこのストーリーラインというところももちろん企画の最初からこう作ってはいってはいるんですけど、えー、非常にこの。多くの時間を要していてもうこの2人のこのストーリーこう緻密にこういうふうにこう絡み合ったつながりを持った一つのストーリーとして完成させるまでにやはり2年から3年の、えー、歳月を要しておりますであとはですね、えー、まあアクションの部分に関しても、えー、まあ開発チームとあーすごく議論して決めてまして特にこの年力アクションもうどういうふうな年力を使えたら皆さんが分かりやすく直感的にこう気持ちよくなってもらえるかっていうところは、まあ、非常にこう開発の中でもですね議論を重ねてできてきた部分がありますのでこの年齢を使うユイトと重ねのこのストーリーですね物語っていうのをぜひ楽しんでもらえればと思います。はい、あの本作はですねあの元々僕があのサイボーグ009とかあのいろんなキャラクターがいろんな能力を使って戦う集団っていうものが大好きでまあそういうそのいろんな能力を使う集団を改めてそのゲーム化したいっていう思いで企画を立ち上げましたあとそのサイキックアクションのもう一つの主軸としてあの SAS というものがありますあの正式名称はストラグルアームズシステムというんですけどそのまあ、仲間キャラクターからその超能力を借り受けるシステムですねその脳を接続して仲間キャラクターから超能力を借り受けることで、まあ、いろんな超能力をユートと重ねは使えるようになります今画面上ではあの放電の超能力を今使おうとしてるんですけど、まあ、放電の超能力だけに限らず、まあ、瞬間移動とか透明化とか、まあ
ポピュラーで誰しもがその一度は使ってみたいっていう超能力を選定してます。あの本作のそのキーワードとして赤い線っていうものがあるんですけど、あのサスを使った時にその赤いケーブルが背中に刺さってその戦うことができますの。そうですね。あのサスケーブルデザインするときにそのまあそうですね見た人のその印象に残ってインパクトに残したいところはまずあったんですよね。でそういった時見たときにあのまあ類似過去タイトル見たときに例えばキングゲイナーのその刺さってるケーブルだったりとか。あとはそうですねあの、まあ、日本のアニメの「ガンツ」なんかもそのケーブルが刺さって戦う様っていうところがすごくクールだったので、まあ、その辺りはそのインスパイアされながらそのデザインっていうものを進めた経緯がありますね。はい、あの本作ですねあの年力で戦うんですけどあの、まあ、単純に投げ飛ばすだけじゃなくてこのロケーションに置いてあるオブジェクトをあのいろいろ活用することができます。あの今あの工事現場にあるので工事現場のロケーションなのでダンプを上から落としたんですけど、まあ、そのようにそのロケーションに合ったそのオブジェクトをまあ自分なりに扱うことができるってところが、はい、ここはそうですねあのドラム缶をの中から水を出してその貝,に貝を水浸しにしてますでその後そのまあ s の放電で戦うことで水浸しになったその貝を。電気でしびれさせるということもできるので、そのまあ超能力、念力とそのサスを組み合わせて戦うというところがまあ一つ特徴となっております。まあしっかり遊びたい人もそのカジュアルに遊びたい人もまあ幅広く楽しめるものとなっております。はい、あのプレイヤーはですね、あのまあこのようにあのブレインフィールドっていうねその。特別な必殺技を使うことができますこれはですねあの海抜群が使うことができる近畿の技で非常に強力なんですけど同時に非常に危険な技でもありますあの唯一の重ねがあの展開することでそのまあオブジェクトがその空間内に浮き上がってその念力は使い放題になるんですけど一方でその非常に強い負荷が脳にかかってしまいますねなのであの、まあ、自分の言動がちょっとおかしなことを言ってしまったりとかあとは聞こえないなあのノイズのノイズのような幻聴が聞こえたりとか、あとせてこのようにその途中で頭抱えて動けなくなったりとかすることがあります。で加えてですねあのこの残り時間の秒数があるんですけど、これが制限時間が過ぎるとあのゲームオーバーになってしまうっていう非常に危険な技になっております。はい。なんだけどその非常に危険な技なんですけど、それをうまく使いこなして戦う自分がかっこいいっていう風な思いをプレイヤーに感じ取ってもらいたいなと思っております。あとそのブレインフィールドあの発動したらフードをかぶってそのたくさんケーブルが刺さった異様な姿になるかなと思うんですけどこれもそのまあダークヒーローっぽいかっこよさがそのまあすごく危険な超能力を自分が扱って戦ってるってところを感じ取ってもらいたくてこのようなデザインにしております。はいあのこちらのブレレインマップと呼ばれるシステムになりますねあのこちらはあの、まあ、プレイヤーが成長するスキルツリーとなっておりますあのこのようにそのちょっとその脳みその形をデザインしたツリーを意識して作ってますでその、まあ、今そうですチャージがため攻撃ができるようになりましたねあのこのようにその、まあ、能力を拡張してその新たなアクション、まあ、この映像の中ではため攻撃で範囲攻撃をできるようになってるんですけどまあ、そういったそのアクションの拡張だけじゃなくてそのまあ念力ゲージが増加する強化系のスキルだったりとかあとはアイテムを使用した後のそのクールタイムが短くなるような補助スキルとかあのまあさまざまないくつかのカテゴリーのスキルを習得することができるようになっています。でその脳みそをその脳神経を拡張していくようなあのデザインにこだわっててそのまあスキルを選択してそのボタンをホールドすることでそのまあ神経が伸びていってそのどんどんどんどんその脳神経が拡張していくようなそういうその体験になることを意識してデザインしております。はいあのブレインマップ以外ですとあのまあ基本的に通常のレベルアップでその敵と戦って経験値を積むことで通常のレベルアップでそのパラメータが底上げされるっていうことに加えて。あの仲間との絆ですね仲間と絆形成することでその絆の力が強くなると絆レベルというものが上がってそのまあ仲間から買い受ける超能力っていうものが強力になってきます。まあ、そのブレレインマップとと通常のレベルとあとはその仲間との絆を形成して成長させるってところがこの3つがこのゲームの,その成長システムになっております。あのーこのゲームその武器と念力の流れ,る流れるようなコンビネーションってところが一つ特徴にしているんですけど、まあ、その流れるようなコンビネーションの体験ってところがシリーズ X だと 60fps で滑らかに体験できるのでその部分はすごくその
リッチな体験になってるなっていうふうに感じます。はい、あのー、開発チーム一同ね、あのー、まあ、スタッフ個々が全力で携わったタイトルですので、あのぜひ楽しみにしていただけると嬉しいです。From my team and I, please enjoy Scarlet Nexus. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to IGN Summer of Gaming 2021. I'm your host, Ryan McCaffrey. Apparently, one awesome Xbox showcase this week was just not enough for Microsoft and, and for us either, quite frankly. Hey, since we've got an extra special bonus look at some upcoming games here, we figured it called for an extra bonus episode of Unlock. Joining me to discuss everything, I think he'll be in momentarily Destin Legary from the normal Unlocked cast, but I want to say hi. To,、uh, to a friend of Unlocked who was the star, quite literally the star, in every conceivable definition of that last showcase you just watched. And that would be our friend Paris Lilly from Gamertag Radio. Paris, how are you, my friend? I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on here, Ryan. And、uh, yeah, that was surreal to be able to sit back and, and watch the Xbox Game Showcase extended, knowing what was coming, but not knowing how it was all put together. And、uh, The feedback I've seen so far has been amazing. Well,、uh, I, like, I know we have games to talk about, but we just have to hold on. First of all, I just want to genuinely congratulate you. Like, I felt so much just pride, not pride, but just, just joy for you of just watching you do that. I mean, that's not something that I don't know if Microsoft's ever done that, where they've, they've invited someone from the community to actually host an entire showcase like that. And you did a phenomenal job, and it was just, It was so great watching you up there. I, I, how did it feel watching it back with your family? I mean, it felt great. Like, I'm clearly going to be my, my, my worst critic. So, when I walked out, I was like, oh, no. But, you know, my wife and my kids, they're like, no, no, this is great. And then I start seeing all the feedback coming in. But I do want to say before we continue, I have to thank you, Ryan, and just everyone at IGN. And just, just because it was a little over a year ago. Last minute, you reached out because you needed someone to fill in on Unlocked. And I remember I was working at the time and a meeting canceled because I almost said no. And the meeting canceled. So, yeah, I would love to come on. And that conversation you and I had back then obviously led to me doing more things with IGN. I wound up joining Kind of Funny and, you know, obviously the stuff I've done with Gamertag Radio over the years. But it's just been this roller coaster that led to the moment that I just had today. And, You're a big part of that. And I just I just want to sincerely tell you thank you. But、um, overall, being just doing the show, the entire process, want to thank everyone at Xbox. It was just such a great opportunity to be able to do something like that. But ultimately, I had fun. And, I, and, I, and I hope that that showed、uh, you know, to everyone that was able to watch it that I was just having fun with it. And、uh, it, was, it was a great opportunity. Just very thankful. Well, you're, you're very kind to, to say what you said about, about me and about IGN, but you've been doing the work for years on Gamertag Radio. So I'm just happy to you know, help,、uh, help put up the, the megaphone、uh, on, uh, to be, to be a, a, a Paris fan. But Destin, welcome in. Hey. There you sometimes, are. Sometimes you click the close on the wrong <laughs> you tab. You click the wrong button and bad <laughs> things happen. But、yeah. um, all right. I want to actually want to start for, for a selfish reason and also for a,、uh, for a legit audience. Service reason here with the design lab, the return of the design lab.、Uh, this was, first of all, this was the, the, the moment of this entire thing because Paris, you pulled off, and I realized I now, by default, I, di I didn't know this was coming. I, by default, have the exclusive first interview with you after you, <laughs> you performed and successfully completed one of the most epic. Friend, friendly trolls I've ever seen in my life.、Uh, now, for those that aren't aware, Khalif Adams, who runs the、uh, absolutely essential Spawn on Me podcast,、absolutely. which,、uh, which I mean, he's been on here. Unlock fans know who he is, but everybody should be watching and subscribing to Spawn on Me. 
you and Kali for friends, Paris, you go back a ways and, uh, but you two have just had this for this friendly thing about, about cooking and, and yeah, which one yeah. of you has crappier cooking skills going on just on Twitter back and forth for years. But I think you've dropped the mic and it's over <laughs> now. I, if we have that footage, can, I would love for us to play that footage right now because this, the entire community watching along, all, everybody just cracked up. I, did, did you, did they pitch you on that? Did you pitch no. them on that? How'd you get them to say yes? Like, I just, I want to know everything about this. So, so a little inside baseball and, and, and here's the controller. I, I don't know how <laughs> oh, focused wow. that's yeah. going to happen. I don't so, so I can yeah. See it. yeah. Very clearly. So, so the way this all went down was I knew I was doing the show and I, I knew design lab design lab was going to happen. They wanted me to customize my own controller so that we could talk about it. You know, when I was on stage, so I like just in the moment I go, you know, what would be funny would be to put cock can't cook on it. And I, I did that. And the people I was talking to at Xbox, they're like, Oh my God, that's brilliant. You should totally mix that into the show. So <laughs> would you see me do that? That is, that isn't scripted. It wasn't written down. I just did it on the fly, like right then and there, there were, we had two different takes of it, but that was, that was the second take that I did. And uh, yeah, I had no idea how it was going to come out on camera, but it, it was hilarious. And, and I love Khalif and it's just a friendly thing that him and I have been doing here, you know, the past couple of years, just going through the pandemic. And uh, yeah, I, I was able to actually troll him on an Xbox stage <laughs> with that. So it was just like, just good fun. And I, I'm glad the community had a good time with it. Uh, it was that was phenomenal. And and really, uh, the, you talk about the design lab itself. James Shields, who is uh, on, on the Xbox team, tweeted out uh, right after that segment. He put up a picture of one he had made, which is a uh, he had a a throwback to the 360 controller done because, you know, there it said so there are 18 different colors for right. each piece, uh, which is which is pretty cool. So, you know, here this is an actual like crusty, disgusting old Xbox 360 controller. Um, so I had I couldn't resist during the broadcast. I followed James's lead and ordered it. Uh, and uh, I cannot wait because there's just something that strikes a happy nostalgic nerve with that. So uh, if you're curious, you can either, I guess my feed, DMC underscore Ryan, because I had retweeted James with basically the recipe. And then I posted posted my receipt as well that has the recipe on there. But but uh, yeah, Design Lab's good stuff. Destin, are, are you tempted to do any uh, any custom controlling? I am after seeing James's, uh, you know, mock up really quick because I absolutely love that. Uh, and Paris, you know, when when you you showed off the controller, I just thought burned, which is what Khalif <laughs> must say about his cooking quite often. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, hilarious. Oh man, is uh, <laughs> Destin? Oh, they're gonna hold on me on for point. my lame joke. I appreciate yeah, you're... that. Thank, thank you, producers <laughs> in the back end. Oh my goodness, <laughs> but but all right, so. It is great to see. In all seriousness, it's I love that the design lab is back now after it's yeah, been same. retooled for for the Series X. Um, so that is that that should en enable just a generation of of fun controller stuff. Although uh, you know, Paris, I could tell I could I got one little one little uh, breaking of the of the sort of fourth wall, I guess not the fourth wall, but sort of peek behind the curtain that you said world champion Lakers. Uh, uh, during the broadcast, so I know you taped that before my Phoenix Suns wiped your guys out of the playoffs I, in the first I, I round. Was, I thought of you, to be honest, <laughs> and it was so funny. At the time, we were up 2-1, and I was even nervous saying, I was like, you know what, we're the world champs, regardless of who we're going to lose. <laughs> That's uh, funny. Anyway, well, you, you know what, technically you guys are still the champs until a new yep. champion is crowned here in, in a month or so. But anyway, let's talk games, because there are plenty. So uh, to give you a quick update. We're here for uh, about 55 more minutes. We were doing a full episode of Unlocked. We're obviously doing it live. We appreciate everybody watching. We did have a 30 minute live post show after the showcase on Sunday, but we just couldn't get to nearly everything. So I, I politely begged all of our producers and production team, we need more Unlocked this week. And they, they uh, kindly uh, acquiesced to that request. So I want to start in this block up front here uh, we're going to talk about everything we just saw in this extended showcase that Paris hosted. And then for the rest of the show, we'll go, we'll kind of deep dive back into Sunday's showcase, which I trust everybody watching or listening to this has already seen. So uh, Destin, I know you've been really keen on Hellblade 2 
I mean, since it was unveiled, it was it was the first officially the first Xbox Series X game ever announced back alongside the console at the Game Awards 2019. And uh, we've we were hoping to get another look at it at the showcase. It didn't happen, but we saw it here. So, Destin, what were your takeaways? Yeah, well, to give you a little bit of context, both Ninja 30 and Melina Jurgens have been showing some behind the scenes stuff of uh, Hellblade 2 in development. It's really, really fascinating to see. So uh, Jurgens has been like doing uh, training and uh, combat training, as has the whole uh, animation team. So they've all sort of gone through this combat class and we get to see a little bit of that in action in the trailer here. But I would have liked to see more gameplay. I watched the the footage again. Uh, it's only at 1080p right now at half speed. And I'm really, really intrigued by what they're doing here. It's interesting to see very quick snippets of how they've been developing this world. I'm really, really excited about Hellblade 2. Hellblade 1, uh, I finally played through. I recommend everybody plays through the original using a guide. I really, really adored it. Um, but I hope they fix some of the gameplay mechanics. As for what we saw today, it's really interesting to see here that they're going to be, you know, scanning in actual costumes that they've designed. They've gone on location and, you know, taken all this visual data that they're going to be implementing. And I have to imagine that, you know, after seeing what the Forza team was able to do, I think we're going to be in for a treat. I would have liked to see a little bit more or hear more about some of their other projects. Like they have uh, Project Mara, which is still in the works, which is a, a project that they're dealing, they're trying to sort of convey psychosis in the most realistic way possible in one location. And then there's also the sort of uh, the Insight Project, which is sort of helping people tackle mental health issues. So I'm really, really glad that we got to see more dev stuff about Hellblade 2. This is kind of what I expected. I think they're going to show more later on when they're ready, but this seems really far out based on what we've seen. What do you think? Yeah, uh, Paris, I wanted to get your take because yeah, that was that was the thing that caught my ear as well is it sounded like they said they're not even in full production yet. We know it's Unreal Engine 5. Unreal Engine 5 still kind of spinning up from Epic, but it sounds like it's going to be a while. But nevertheless, Paris, your thoughts on Hellblade 2? Yeah, I mean, just to touch on, on, on what you just mentioned, yeah, this definitely seems like it's still far off. Um, I, I was a more recent player of, of the first Hellblade. Like, it was after the... They revealed the series x was what caught my attention was that initial hellblade 2 trailer like oh i need to go play the first one so i really enjoyed it and everything that we're seeing here and the, the little sneak peek that we got i mean it it looks like kind of to go to the, the thing that you're talking about destin i do think they'll address some of the gameplay issues because i know exactly what you mean about not having a guide but this looks like it's going to take that experience to the next level and continue that story from where we were. So I'm excited for it, but I'm not holding my breath anytime soon, you know, to, to see that game. It sounds like between COVID and going to Unreal 5, um, it's going to be a while before we get it. Yeah, I think on, on, on Unlocked over the past year or so, since that announcement, year and a half now, I guess, I think we were we were sort of optimistically hoping that that would be a game we'd see early-ish in the Series yeah. X generation because it was the first one announced. Right. But, hey, you can't rush greatness and let them take their time. As we saw at the regular showcase, which we're going to talk about in depth in a second, there's there's plenty of games to keep us busy uh, from now until whenever <laughs> Hellblade 2 does end up shipping. But uh, we've got plenty more to discuss about the Xbox showcase from Sunday and what you just just saw today. But first, IGN Summer of Gaming is presented by T The Tomorrow War, which is starring, of course, Chris Pratt, and it's out exclusively on Prime Video on July 2nd. J.K. Simmons, also in that one, who I loved in Invincible and many other things. And now, so get, uh, get comfortable. The time has come for us to take a short break. We'll take a look at the latest trailer from Tomorrow War. Enjoy. Boy, they say kids never come by unless they need something. Dad, I need your help. I'll get my coat. 30 years in the future. We are fighting a war. Our enemy is not human. And we are losing. We need you to fight. I will be back. And I love you, Chickpea. Seven days from now, when you're sent into that war, you won't be fighting for your country. You'll be fighting for the world. Is it all right? Yeah. Going to war. Stop talking. Listen. 
Sorry, I, I mean, when I'm nervous, I talk. I'm like a 90, 97 on the nervous scale. That should be fun. Welcome to the future. You and your unit are now in 2051. They're everywhere. We are food, and they are hungry. Our enemy is smarter, faster, and stronger than you can possibly imagine. Do you want to see something really dangerous? I feel like literally that's all I've been doing since I got here, but okay. Within the next few weeks, the human species will disappear from the face of the Earth. Nothing we do here matters. No, that's where you're wrong. I don't believe that one bit. Together, we can stop this war from ever happening. This is my opportunity to give this world a second chance. Second chances are really hard to come by. Light him up! I'm not gonna hide. I'm gonna fight. It's not even loaded. Yeah, well, yeah, it's not loaded. It's a pressurized cabin. Why would I load it in the cabin? A bullet goes in thing and everybody sucked out. Welcome back to Unlocked right here on IGN's Summer of Gaming, which, as the name suggests, extends beyond just E3. Obviously, because E3 is over now, but we're not. Uh, you can find our virtual events coverage all summer long on IGN.com, on YouTube, on social media, and now even the IGN portal app on your smart TV. And if you didn't get enough gaming coverage over the past week, check out E3's official online portal and app featuring virtual booths, articles, videos, and tons more. All right, let's pick up where we left off here. Paris, I want to go to you on Psychonauts 2. Uh, I feel like we, I mean, I always love hearing from Tim Schafer. I feel like this is a game that's going to catch a lot of the Xbox community off guard in a good way because the the first one is this, it's a cult classic. It's only old guys like me that have played it and <laughs> right. remember it. I think everybody's going to be really pleasantly surprised by this game. 100% agree with you, and I think it was very smart of them to get the original out there into people's hands ahead of time. So hopefully they'll pick it up and they'll discover, you know, just just the genius that is Double Fine and Tim Schafer. Yeah, I, I think everything that I've seen so far with Psychonauts 2 just looks fantastic. It, it really does. And I can't wait until August when it comes out because this at like I've been screaming that Xbox needs a platformer. They need a platformer that everyone can play. This is to, in my opinion, probably about as close as they're going to get anytime soon to having that, because I just think the humor that Double Fine has and this world of Psychonauts, I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. And if anything, I, you're probably going to get people that are going to jump in and play Psychonauts 2, and then they're going to go back and go, oh my God, I need to go play the first one because this one was so great. So I'm, I'm actually just excited for people that are finally going to enter this world and, and, and understand the greatness that is Psychonauts. Yeah, Destin, it's sort of a weird full circle moment coming up for Psychonauts because Microsoft was the original publisher of the original Psychonauts, but then they dropped the game and Majesco ended up publishing it on an original Xbox. And now it's coming back full circle with Microsoft acquiring Double Fine and publishing and you know helping fund Psychonauts 2 and bring it to the finish line. Uh, how's, your, how's your hype level for this one? Yeah, I mean, I still haven't played the original. It's on Game Pass now, so I have yeah. no excuse, really. But, um, you know, I agree with your assessment. I do think it's going to catch a lot of people off guard. And from what I've seen with it, like, it's super inventive. I really love how they talked about, you know, how each level's a brain and how that you make connections this time. And, and then they're trying to get the gambling connection, basically, for this one character. And I'm really interested to see how that ends up unfolding. Anytime you're dealing with, you know, the brain, you can do some really, really interesting stuff. And Double Fine is just one of those companies that I, I can't wait to see what they do. I was actually just replaying through Brutal Legend, one of my favorites, uh, yeah. like last week. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah another Tim Schafer joint. Uh, all right, before we kind of go back and rewind to Sunday's showcase, 
one of the other extended looks we got here with Paris on, on the Xbox uh, event we just watched is Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, a game that Paris, I, I genuinely, like, I don't know how they're doing it. I, I know the, the I Series either. X is powerful, <laughs> yeah. but like they, they specifically said, hey, this is a gameplay trailer captured off of the Series X. Uh, I know you've spent some time with it. What is, like, how, for people that don't know, like, what are they in for with this thing? I mean, I think they're in, well, first of all, they're going to be in for a visual treat. For th that, that's the main thing with Flight Simulator. And it's literally in the name. It, it's a flight simulator of all these different types of, of aircraft that you can go as hardcore as you want or you can go as casual as you want as well. It's all about just giving you this experience. And then the fact that they basically cloned all of planet Earth and you can go anywhere. You can get in a plane and fly anywhere around the world. I even said it during the show. Something that I'd like to do a lot is I will take off from LAX and I'll, and I'll go all the way to Paris, right? So just yeah. going across the entire United States, going across the top through Canada, Iceland, down into Europe, to France, it's, it's amazing. You can go down to South America, you can go to Africa, you can go to Australia. There's all these different things you can do. But the thing that you alluded to at the top, and I even said during the show is, how are they reproducing this thing on the X and the S? Because I have a high-end gaming PC. I even said a 3080 on the show. I have a 3080 Ti now. And yeah, you're, you're still going to struggle a little bit if you try and play this thing at ultra at, at maxed out settings. So the fact that they're able, able to get these type of visuals on the Series X and the S, I think people are going to be very happy with it. And like I said, you don't have to play it as a hardcore sim unless you choose to. You can play this casually with a controller and just have fun exploring the world. And I, and I think that's the beauty of Flight Simulator. Now, Destin, there was kind of a hidden note on the Xbox Wire blog after the Sunday showcase that ties right into Flight Simulator specifically. Uh, they said this on Xbox Wire. I feel like this is a bigger deal that our audience needs to know about. They said, some games launching next year from our first party studios and partners, such as Starfield, Redfall, and Stalker 2, require the speed, performance, and technology of the Xbox Series X and S. We're excited to see developers realize their visions in ways that only next-gen hardware will allow them to do. For the millions of people who play on Xbox One consoles today, we are looking forward to sharing more about how we will bring many of these next-gen games, such as Microsoft Flight Simulator, to your console through Xbox Cloud Gaming, just like we do with mobile devices, tablets, and browsers. Destin, this seems like a really intelligent way to help bridge the gap between the One and, and the series, particularly as consoles continue to be impossible to find. Yeah, it's actually incredibly smart. And everybody's been sort of talking about their reaction to this. This is how they bridge the gap for older console owners, right? And it's just really, really great because it means nobody really gets left behind. And that was sort of a philosophy that Phil Spencer talked about pretty early on with the console, the series of consoles. And also all of those streaming devices are being upgraded to Series X consoles. So when they activate the, the browser ability on your console to play all these games, people are gonna be able to play Flight Simulator looking its best. They're gonna be able to play Halo looking its best. And I think the biggest concern is going to be uh, latency. I'm actually, yeah. I, I've been playing a little bit in the in the cloud and it's, it's much improved from when we played it at E3, like way back when it was announced. So right. um, I've been really, really impressed and it works especially well for games that are like RPG games. One of the games that I use as a great example are is Octopath Traveler. Anything that's sort of like turn based or yeah. doesn't require precise pinpoint accuracy is going to look really, really good using this option. I think Flight Simulator could land in that camp because, you know, Flight Simulator, it's largely when you play with the controller pairs, you're just holding the right trigger down when you're once you're in the yep. sky. But if you want to play full simulation, uh, you're probably going to want to upgrade your console. <laughs> Now, guys, we've got a little under five minutes in this segment before we get another quick break, but we'll keep going. Uh, in that time, I want to have this quick discussion in about four minutes. Was this Microsoft's best E3 ever? Because I think it was. Paris, where does it rank for you? You know, it, it's funny because you and I talked about this a little bit offline a couple days ago, and I wasn't 100% sure, and I put some more thought into it and kind of done a look back. I kind of think it is and not for the glitz and the glamour. I think it shows that Xbox is in a mature place right now where they're confident about the content that they have. They have the services. 
They have the infrastructure in place. They have the heart. They have everything. If you're a gamer that you need across multiple platforms or utilizing the cloud, we see the roadmap of games that are coming. And even the ones that they didn't even talk about in that briefing also got me excited as well. So I, I, I do. I genuinely do think this was probably their best E3 in the 20 years of Xbox because it shows just how far they've come, especially since, you know, the start of the Xbox One era to where they are today. Destin, are you with us on this one, or you got another another year in mind that stands out a little more? Well, I want to give them props for separating the developer interviews, especially. I really, really like this. It sort of sets expectations that they're going to do this in the future. And I really enjoy hearing from developers and hearing about the design aspects of the game. I don't think that's what they should do during E3. So that original conference and what they did there where it's like games coming to Game Pass exclusive, that is perfect. So the, the short answer to your question is, yeah, I think this is one of their best E3s. Probably the best, Ryan. I think it's their best E3 in a long time. And honestly, I think it's my personal opinion. Some people are going to say Forza stole the show. I think Halo stole the show because the question was going in, oh, yes. is Halo going to be good? Is it not? Yeah. They showed off the engine using the campaign. They showed off the storytelling of Halo Infinite. And they showed off what's looking to be a phenomenal free-to-play multiplayer experience. So I think that quieted a lot of those cries of foul towards Halo Infinite because it is looking... Awesome. Yeah, I, if, I, if I could pivot on that really Please. quick to agree with you, Destin, because I had been saying leading up to this, I go, June is a reckoning for Halo. Yeah. It, it, it needs to show well after what happened last year. And I think both on the campaign side, they showed that what the story is going to be. There's Cortana, there's Chief. That's what we want to see story wise. But then that multiplayer, it's just fun. And I was one of the people going, ah, I don't know. I think they need to do a new mode. They're not. They're sticking to doing what they do best. And it showed very well uh, both Sunday and then, and then again today. And then obviously what they had during the Monday reveal. So I'm genuinely excited about Halo coming into this holiday. And I think a lot of other people are as well. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. the one curious element of that, though, was the lack of a release date. Uh, when we saw yeah. a lot of the other fall dates come in. Heck, we got a Starfield release date, and it's November 2022. So that I found a little strange. I, I'm not worried about it. My guess is they have a date in mind, but they're not. They're they're kind of waiting to see if they're going to need to, you know, push a little bit farther for a little polish. So I, that would sort of indicate to me again, and I'm I'm clearly just talking uh <laughs> just guess thinking aloud here yeah my guess is maybe it's october and that's what they're targeting and they're they're kind of waiting to see when a milestone comes up and go all right well do we need that one last push and, and to push this thing to november so that was the only sort of strange element of it for me but um but otherwise i agree with you can both completely i mean we got that sense of first of all uh steve downs i, I really hope he has a lot of dialogue in this game because I, I could listen to that man read the phone book as Master Chief. He's just brilliant in the role. Uh, I love it. And and um, the other the other thing, the other reason I think this was their best show ever, is because I think it finally finally put an end to the drought. Like we've been, let's be honest, Xbox as far as exclusives has been in a drought for years. I mean, it's been every year we're, we're waiting and waiting and waiting and. They buy studios and well, you know, those studios need years to make games. That's how making games work. But this E3 showcase we got here. Here's forget about even 2022. Here's 2021. 2021. That's not a year. We're pretty far away from that. I'm live. This is what happens. Sea of Thieves Pirates Life, June 22nd. The Ascent, July 29th. Console version of Flight Sim, like we just talked about. Uh, that's July 29th as well. 12 minutes, which I'm very amped for is August 19th, Psychonauts 2 a week later, August 25th, Sable, September 23rd, Forza Horizon 5, November 9th, and Halo Infinite somewhere in that window. So the drought's over, it's done. And then into 2022, it's gonna keep right on rolling. So uh, speaking of rolling, this show will continue to roll on as well, but we do need to take a quick break, don't worry. There is still plenty more to talk about. IGN Summer of Gaming 2021, we'll be right back after this. IGN Summer of Gaming is powered by Duracell Optimum. All summer long, we're bringing you the game announcements, developer interviews, and all the demos you care about. So get comfortable and get ready to play. Up 
upgrade your Xbox controller with Duracell Optimum batteries today. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. Everybody loves watching a speedrun of their favorite game, but what if you got a chance to peek into the mind of the developers behind those games as they watch their hard work get completely destroyed right in front of them? What is happening oh. right now? <laughs> That's exactly what happens on every episode of Devs React to Speedruns. We invite you to ride along with the developers as they watch, react, and enjoy some of the craziest gameplay by the most skilled speedrunners on the planet. Tune in every Saturday for a brand new episode. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. And we're back to Unlocked. If you're just joining us, we're going over everything Microsoft showed during the Xbox Game Showcase last Sunday and the extended showcase hosted by the gentleman you see on your screen right here, Paris Lilly, as well. And hey, uh, if you don't have any plans next, say, Wednesday, why not swing by again for a very special IGN Summer of Gaming episode of Game Scoop? One week should be enough for everybody to catch up on their sleep, catch up on any announcements that they might have missed, you know, because it's been an exciting week. That's what happens. Now, uh, Destin, you're a self-proclaimed zoo tycoon maniac. Were you upset? This is the key question of the entire show. By the lack of simulated elephants and zebras and whatnot. No, there were plenty of them in Flight Simulator. <laughs> yeah, they're just down there. They're all hanging out. All right, no, back uh, to uh, Brian Altano. That was for you because I'm guessing that's who that's who wrote that. Uh, that's, that's that's I'm having my Ron Burgundy teleprompter moment right now. <laughs> Let's keep it rolling. Uh, going back to the showcase. They opened with Starfield, which I think said a lot. They also closed. They opened with Bethesda, closed with Bethesda. Uh, Paris, it, you, had to, you had to get things off to a big start. Was it going to be Halo? Was Starfield going to be the last thing? They opened with Starfield and Todd Howard, and we finally got a snippet of gameplay in a little bit more detail here. What do you think? Are you, are you uh, sort of excited by what you saw from Starfield? I am. I am for the potential of of what it can be and the fact that they're confident enough to say November 2022, it's going to come out. There's still plenty of time, obviously, to get go deep dive more into what Starfield is. But the fact that they're looking at it as this is a new, the, their first new IP in 25 years or something like that, he said. But yeah. in other words, it invigorated that team to want to do something new, do something exciting. So it seems like it's a passion project for that team. And, and obviously, we're going to be the ones that benefit for whatever it is. I have a, a theory that them being so confident in that date means the game is probably more ready than we realize. But they now kind of like 343 got with Halo Infinite. They get extended time yeah. to actually polish it and QA it and make sure it's the best thing it can possibly be when it comes out. So I'm excited. Think about it. We'll see it a year from now again at E3. And I'm sure Pete Hines and Todd Howard and everyone over there will be, be talking about it extensively as we go into 2022. But I, I think that was the right move to open the show with that game, get all the speculation out of the way. And now we can move forward. 
Now, Destin, uh, Mr. Todd Howard also put together any, or excuse me, put to rest any w- sort of stress about is this exclusive to Xbox? <laughs> we still haven't, we hadn't quite had crystal clear messaging on that. It was made explicitly clear. Starfield is an Xbox console exclusive, period. Yep, that's right. It's console exclusive and I can't wait to play it. I think it's a testament to how good this trailer looked that so many people thought it was just CGI, even when it was clearly labeled in-game footage. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it's edited in a way where they're showing off the engine. They're showing off what it can do. There's also tons of teases in there, including, you know, Easter eggs that reference Elder Scrolls Six. But I'm really, really stoked for Starfield. And a few things that they've been talking about behind the scenes. Yes, it's the first new game in, what, 25 years, you said, Mm -hmm. Paris, right? Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're incredibly excited to be working on it. They also showed a little bit of behind the scenes, showing off concept art, uh, how you're going to be able to get different armor sets and things like that in the game. Some of the different locations that you're going to be able to explore, too. And previously, during a developer conference, they actually talked about Uh, how there's going to be procedural generation used in some manner. And what they're doing actually is really, really smart. They specifically told us, you know, during my interview with Pete Hines, that they want to show us, not tell us about it. So they're going to show first and then talk about what they've shown. So right now they're showing off this trailer that's in engine and giving us a tease about what the game is going to look like later on. They're going to show us gameplay and then they're going to talk about that. And I can appreciate that. They're giving us just enough of a tease that we're constantly talking about it, getting excited about the potential, but not doing that thing we often do where our expectations are up here (laughs) and then they only have it down to go, right? Right. So I'm really, really happy about this. The engine is looking phenomenal. Um, One of the other things they said about the engine is that all the little knobs do something and they know what they do. I don't know if that's a good thing, because if every time I have to take off, I have to like do a flight check. It's flight simulator. Yeah. Like, is it flight simulator in Starfield? That might be a little bit too much, but I'm sure there's going to be an easier way to do everything. It's SpaceX um, simulator. Yeah. And you're part of a I can't remember the name of the constellation part of. Yeah, you're part of Constellation. That's really interesting. I'd love, I want to know more about them. I want to know more about this world. It's super, super interesting. Uh, and last thing, sorry, Ryan, I know I'm going on a tangent. No, please. But uh, the score is perfectly scored for this. I love the music. I love the sound up, how you hear the, the flare of the engines as the ship takes off. I, I adored this reveal. And you talked, uh, Destin, about you know the engine looking great, Creation Engine 2. Uh, just worth clarifying as well, in case anybody didn't see it, this is a next gen exclusive. This is not coming to Xbox One. So they are just leaning all in on the new console, which is great to see. And it seems like 2022 is the year. Not that there won't be cross gen games, but I mean, Flight Sim's the first one. It's leaving the Xbox One behind, other than the future incoming cloud based solution for Xbox One owners. But 2022 seems to be the year where the Xbox One's really going to start to get left behind and uh, Starfield will be. Will be one of those here at the end of uh, the end of the year on 11 11 22. Todd Howard is obsessed with November 11th. He must yeah. he must play those lotto numbers or something. He must play 11 every single week because uh, Skyrim came out on 11 11 11, and now we have 11 11 22. So hopefully we don't have to wait till 11 11 33 for Sky for Elder Scrolls Six. You might. <laughs> I think we might. <laughs> We've got. Uh, I still want to get to. There's God, there's so much more to get to. I'm so behind on my run of show here. But Redfall, uh, we talked about Bethesda bookending this thing, starting it and ending it. Paris, uh, what'd you make of of Redfall, the next one from the Prey and Dishonored team at Arcane? Um, Coming directly from that team, I instantly got excited about it and just thinking about the promise of what this game potentially could be that setting the co-op aspects, you're hunting vampires, seems like it's, it's more open world as well. Yeah, I, I mean, love it. Obviously, what we saw was was more, you know, CGI stuff. So we haven't seen actual gameplay. Right. That'll be the next step. But the, the thing about the pedigree of that studio and the and in my opinion, the underappreciated games they've been putting out the past decade. I hope this is the breakout for them. I hope this is Arcane finally getting on the quote unquote main stage and showing that they are truly one of the best developers in the world. If, if you've never played Dishonored, please do it. If you've never played Prey, please go do it because trust me, you'll you'll instantly fall in love with those games. And I, I think 
this game, Redfall, coming from that studio and this premise that they're setting up. I mean, I'm 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 in. I'm all I'm very interested in this. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, you're talking about this is a studio that makes smart games. These are systemic, um, sort of just open world games where you really emergent gameplay. I think is the the term that's always been used. I mean, like in the Deus Ex kind of vein, and yeah, yeah, always critical darlings. And hopefully, like you said, hopefully this will be the time that they get their their due on a bigger stage. Destin, uh, yeah, are you are you stoked for Redfall? What do you think of that? As we're, I mean, you. We clearly weren't expecting that as a closer because it's a brand new major first party studios IP. Yeah, um, Redfall, I'm interested in it, but because it's all CG, none of it's actual gameplay. It's all conceptual. Sure. So right. we just have to sort of imagine. So for me, I'm I'm actually still a little lukewarm on it until I start seeing how these players actually play together. What is solo play like? Yeah. Um, what's it going to be like when you go to this this town? and you know either play with your friends and like what's the story how does it all work together i don't feel like that was answered very well with this trailer so this is just like here's sort of an idea of what we're going for hopefully yeah. you can get excited and for me i'm just like well i need to see gameplay you know then yeah. i know that's sort of inverse of what we said from starfield but starfield was in engine right so right. at least there you get some sort of idea of like what the game engine can do we saw a gun and things like that this is all just a cg trailer and that's my only only criticism of it i mean that's fair i mean it's it's not unlike what we saw at the game awards this past year with perfect dark a cinematic sort of a tone piece right to sort of show you what the vibe is and before that at the showcase the xbox showcase last year with fable you know it's a it's a not, not gameplay just a tone piece so yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what uh, what Redfall sort of really turns out to be. Because yeah, that, that studio has never made a multiplayer game. They've uh, yeah. this will be their first foray into right. multiplayer. Although again, as you did say, Destin, you can absolutely play Redfall as a single player experience. So uh, I want to talk about the game of the show as voted by the entire media, which is Forza Horizon oh, yeah. Five. We'll do that coming up next. So we're going to take a very quick break. I promise. There's only one or two more of these, but. Uh, this very special Unlocked 499 Live Edition will continue when we come back. And uh, who knows, maybe between now and then, maybe Microsoft will announce another showcase that Destin gets to host. Maybe it'll be his turn next. Uh, but <laughs> Harris can case. do it again. That's fine. <laughs> I should just have, you know what, forget Destin. Harris, have, you did such a good job, have by the Paris way. Like host you, it. You it's going to be better that. than if Destin hosts it, let's <laughs> be honest. Uh, anyway, okay. stick around. We'll be right back. IGN Summer of Gaming 2021 is presented by the Amazon Original Movie, The Tomorrow War, exclusively on Prime Video July 2nd, and powered by Duracell Optimum, the official battery sponsor of Summer of Gaming 2021, and presented by USAA Insurance, and Army National Guard. Pursue multiple paths while you serve. Reach your greatest potential with Army National Guard. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. 
What's up everyone, Sydney here to bring you a little update about the future of IGN on YouTube. We've been listening to your feedback and it seems like some of you are more into games while others are more interested in movies and TV. So we got to thinking about it and decided, why not both? Our main channel will still bring you all the biggest news, reviews, previews, and trailers to keep you up to speed on the most important highlights. But if you only want games content 24-7, head over to IGN Games. Movies and TV more your thing? Check out IGN Movies and TV. More channels, more of the stuff you love, more IGN. Welcome back to Unlocked right here on IGN Summer of Gaming, a seemingly nonstop celebration of video games. It's it's actually not even officially summer yet. It's only June 17th, so plenty more summer of gaming yet to come. Uh, if you are an Xbox fan specifically, as we are, you've probably been very happy with how the last week and this summer, unofficial summer season has gone so far. So let's keep talking about what Xbox has been crushing because they have been doing just that. The game of the show as voted on by members of the media, Forza Horizon 5. Now, Destin, I want to start with you on this because this is a game. We talked about this on Unlocked leading up to E3. I was not expecting this personally because Forza Motorsport, the next-gen reboot, got announced at the showcase last year, and it's, it's still TBD release date, but here we have Forza Horizon 5 coming in, being announced after it, releasing before it. It's cross-gen, so it's obviously... You know, that's sort of how it's doing that while motorsport will be fully next gen whenever it is ready. But uh, how incredible was that Forza Horizon 5 demo? It looks absolutely stunning. There were moments during the demo where myself and I'm sure many others just thought they were showing a photo that they took while during production of Mexico. And then they transition right into gameplay. And it, I think that presentation style has blown people away. They talked a little bit during this conference about what they did. They used a lot of light data. They shot 12K HDR footage of the sky. They had 400 hours of sky data, as they yeah. called it, which they recreated in game. They talked about the volumet volumetric lighting coming through on the skies. And regardless of you know whatever people have been saying online, this game looks totally, totally stunning, even if it runs at 4K 30. Now, I have to ask you guys, does that bother you that it runs at 4K 30, especially given that it will have a 4K 60 performance mode option? Does bother me at all for exactly what you're saying. There is a performance mode. Um, I'll just take a, I'll take a recent game like Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart does the same thing basically, right? Mm -hmm. And it was fine. So it'll be the same scenario here. Yeah, the game just looks incredible. <laughs> I'm, I'm not too worried about frames and ray tracings and all that. I know what my eyeballs see, and, and it <laughs> looks fantastic. So I'm all in. Yeah, I, I, as sort of a personal side note on this, I, I know I'm going to come off like a Forza Horizon like hipster on this, but <laughs> I have just been so glad to see her, the Horizon series really kind of catapult into the mainstream view now and the, the, the wider Xbox community. Cause you know, the first one came out as this spinoff of, of motorsport and okay, it was neat. It was a very good game. And then two really, that was the one in my opinion, where it made the leap. Like we talk about, you know, uh, like Paris, we talk about athletes that make the leap right from a good player to just yeah. a superstar. And I feel like horizon did that with Forza horizon two. And then three, some when three took it to Australia, somehow, up the ante again. I didn't think that they could improve on three because three is practically a 10 out of 10 game. I think it's, you could make the case, but four is better. And now here we go again. And just the, the player counts have gone up and up and up. And, and Paris, am I crazy at this point to say that Horizon might be more popular than Motorsport is? Not that they're, you know, one's, not that they're either one's bad, but like, I feel like Horizon's really just the king now. No, I, I think you're 100% spot on. I think this is the more popular of the two right now. And again, it's not a good or a bad thing. I just think Horizon has the mind share of the community. Kind of like you're saying, like I jumped in at three. That was kind of my moment to jump in. And then four, I felt was really good. And then you see this and you're like, yep, I want to play that. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be fascinating to see. I would assume next year we probably get to see a proper Forza Motorsport. And what are they going to do? to kind of separate themselves from the Horizon franchise. I almost feel like Horizon is that spiritual successor from Project Gotham Racing from yes. early, you know, from the early days. 
and this is just taking that to a, to another level. So I'm excited for the November when this comes out. And um, yeah, I think a lot of people will, will be jumping on this day one. I'm so glad you mentioned PGR because I couldn't agree more. It really is. It's like it's 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 sort of carrying it's picked up the mantle that yeah. PGR left behind and bizarre creations, the developer of that game that is sadly since closed. And the, the, the thing is, I think for, for anybody listening who I mean, if you're listening to this show, you've heard us talk at length about how great Forza Horizon is. But it's again, in my opinion, I think it's uh, the most I think it's the best car game, period of at least the last decade it's it can be serious and it can be a pretty serious hardcore racing game uh but it also is just so approachable and it's just so easygoing paris it's yeah. like mm -hmm. you can just you go to these beautiful places drive anywhere and it's like it's to me forza horizon is like it's like if you took a 72 degree perfect summer day with a breeze and and pressed it onto an, an Xbox game disc. That's what, that's what it is. I love it. Completely agree. Uh, uh, I, wanna, right. I wanted to ask Go ahead, you real quick though. What did you yes. think about like the weather systems, like the thunderstorms and the sandstorms that came in? Because for me in Force Horizon 4, I hated it when it snowed. <laughs> <laughs> Every time it snowed, I was like, all right, I'm not going to be able to drive my Lamborghini. But I, I think these are, are great examples of how to do that in a better way. Well, what's what's interesting about what you just said is, uh, well, A, the yes, the weather systems are awesome. But B, you just reminded me that uh, I went because I went back and watched the Forza Horizon demo again before we went on the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to remind everybody, Fable is being built off of the Forza Horizon technology. So if nothing else, you can count on Fable having some absolutely, I mean, the whole game's outdoors, right? I mean, there'll be dungeons and things, I'm sure, but mm -hmm. you can count on insane outdoor areas and incredible weather in the new Fable. And between between Forza and Flight Simulator, the technology on display from, you know, Xbox and Microsoft here is, is it's absolutely bl mind blowing. I. Yes. I can't believe that these are video games we're playing. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, it's uh we live in a golden age for sure. Now, Stalker 2 got one of uh, the longest segments of the showcase. It was yeah. over 5 minutes worth of gameplay demo here. And Paris, you had the extended uh the sort of developer narrated deep dive of it on your extended showcase. Uh I'll go to you first here Paris. Stalker 2 third party timed console exclusive on this one. And this, I think this game this week went to the top of a lot of people's wish list. And it's, we've got a date for April on this too. Yeah, I'm one of those people that it went to, to the top of my list as well, because I've, I've not really been into the Stalker franchise. I'm, I'm starting to get into it more recently. And then obviously the things that we've seen here in the past few days kind of really put that over the top. If I'm not mistaken, the, that team is made up of some ex people that worked on Metro because obviously it you know has has some similarities there but yeah. what i'm seeing here in stalker 2 i mean yeah i mean this is right up my alley this this is the kind of shooter in that that, that open post kind of almost post apocalyptic world i i love that setting so yeah i'm 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 all in and want to play this and like you said i think this went on a lot of people's radars because i just think this is a franchise that i know has had a cult following but not this this is kind of it's coming out party, so to speak. And I, and I definitely think you'll see a lot of people jump on it. Destin, you are a technical minded guy. You love digging into tech. You help put together IGN's performance review and performance preview pieces. Stalker 2, what, probably one of the best looking games at the showcase this week. Yes. I cannot wait to play this game, Ryan. It is stunning. It is a true yeah. stunner, you know, and we had three of them. We have Flight Simulator, we have Forza, and now we have Stalker 2 on the list and just wow they also talked they also like did a mini rewind theater during this so they talked about how you install mods on the go how they teased the new faction how right here he is picking up jelly which is going to recover your stamina and then um yeah i i was stunned ryan like i remember when we were watching this and i i just couldn't believe it and the yeah. fact that this is going to be running on a console i cannot wait to play stalker 2. Yeah, and and we were you have to go back and watch it in 4K as well because you know when it's yeah. streamed live we're all yeah. watching it live it's a 1080p yeah. stream that's just the nature of 
how these things work. You go back and watch in 4K and it's like, whoa. So <laughs> it's it's awesome. Uh, now, there was another big first party game announcement during the showcase that was, it was quick, but it was memorable. It was the Outer Worlds 2. So Obsidian uh, continuing to just get it done after being acquired by Xbox. We saw Grounded with uh, with Paris on the extended showcase there. We know about Avowed from the showcase last year. We did not see Avowed this year. But what we did see, Paris, was the Outer Worlds 2 in in one of the best like anti-trailer trailers. Yeah. One of the one of the most fun ways you could possibly announce a game without really saying anything about the game. <laughs> I completely agree with you. I, I I love the approach they took for that trailer and and a little inside baseball. When I, I filmed that grounded segment, I got to talk to some of the people at Obsidian while we were waiting. And it's so exciting to see that studio finally get the the proper backing and budget they need to realize all all their ambitions. And this is what we've already seen with the Outer World. So just imagine what the Outer Worlds two is going to look like. We know they're doing a vow. Eighteen people are making grounded. Yeah. Blows my mind. Oh, wow. Right. Right. So it, it's things like that to see that that studio has that kind of talent to do these type of things. So, yeah, when, when we think about Outer Worlds, too, we may not have gotten anything and they admit it. Hey, we got nothing <laughs> right now. But in a few years, when we do get to see what it is, I'm, I'm going to be very excited for it. And it's exclusive now. Uh, you yeah, know, obviously, yeah. previously. It was it was the first one was under development uh, along with uh, under private division, which is take two's sort of indie label. Uh, it was a multi-platform release, though it did go into Game Pass. Now, Microsoft owns Obsidian and Microsoft owns the Outer World. So this will be exclusive to Xbox. All right, guys, for the next block here, I'm not even out of tr- quote unquote AAA games, but I we before this show ends, I absolutely want to spend time and recognize and discuss the so-called indies. I mean, indie gets a kind of a, a bad label, I think, but uh, but these <laughs> There's these games, guys. Just pick up. We're all going to pick different ones because there are so many. Yeah. There were there were a several standout indie games that are coming either you know full exclusive or timed exclusive to Xbox. Destin, I want to go to you first. What? Because I, I think I know what Paris is going to choose. He's been tweeting about it all week. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> noted this one too. But before yeah. I let him talk about that game, Destin, uh, which which of those there were which of these day one Game Pass indies jumped out at you? Well, I hope I'm not taking your Paris, but A Plague Tale, which also got an announcement during this conference, July 6th, we're going to get the 4K Ultra HD update to the original game. So the original is being optimized. You can play through that, and then you can play through the sequel. All of my friends and everybody who has talked about A Plague Tale has said, you have to play it. I, I want to go in spoiler-free and play it, and July 6th seems like the perfect date now. Uh did I take yours, Paris, or no? No, no, you did not. Mine is replaced, which okay. they showed showed Sunday. And ironically enough, that was probably the one game I did not know about ahead of time. So I was surprised <laughs> just like everyone else on Sunday. And yeah, I I, I love that 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 the atmosphere, the 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 art style that they're doing. This this is why quote unquote indie games is great, because here's here's a, a small team creating something that really stands out from the rest of the crowd, right? Like to me, that was my favorite game to see at the Xbox showcase because we already know about the big heavy hitters, but to see something like this come in that looks unique, excites me. Um, I I will cheat and say another game that I really like is The Ascent. Um, And I believe Ryan, you went hands-on with it as well. I played it, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a preview on IGN if you wanna check it out. Yep. Can't wait for July to, to get my hands on that. And and this is another one. 12 people made that game. Yeah, it, it, it's insane. It's insane <laughs> to think these small teams are, are doing just these ambitious projects like this. So kudos to them. And it goes again to show you why AA and Indies have have such a, a, a place in this industry, because I think that's where a lot of the uh, innovation happens. I'm going to cheat and give two because. I'm the host and I make the rules. Uh, the first one is is Somerville. So when this came on the screen, I was like, this looks a lot like Inside, which is yeah. one of my favorite games, I mean, basically ever, but certainly in the, over the past generation. And the reason that Somerville reminds uh, me and probably a lot of you as well of Inside is because it's from the co-creator of Limbo and Inside, Dino Patti, uh, and, and a team. His, he has a new team at a new studio and this looks, again, just the same type of thing that, that Limbo and Inside are so good at. 
that moody, atmospheric, borderline creepy, mysterious, uh, sort of mysterious, uh, just an adventure. You know, you're going to kind of figure out what's going on in this world. There's a there's a dad, and then but then sometimes you've got the dog, and it looks like there's 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 a whole family dynamic to this. That uh, that Paris, I mean, w- did this did this jump out at you as well? Because this this was a no, big highlight did. for me. It did, and that's the funny thing. There's so many, right? There's so many that did, but but this one absolutely stood out to me as well. And then uh, the other one I wanted to mention is 12 Minutes, which we finally yeah. got a release date for a game I've played. I've had the privilege of playing twice at E3, whenever the last real E3 was after it was first announced. And then I played it uh, very recently. And both times I'm just com- I could not be more intrigued. But both times, I think my play session was about 15 minutes, which is just it's almost I mean, I, I, it's again, it's a privilege to play, but it's almost cruel to let to only let someone play that game for 15 minutes because it's a time loop murder mystery and you get, you, you know, you have to, you reset and I won't tell you the circumstances under which you get reset. And then you got to use the knowledge that you acquired from your last run to, you know, try and peel back the layers of the mystery here. And uh, this has got Willem Dafoe, Daisy Ridley and James McAvoy. So they've added some absolute A-list vo- uh, voice talent to this. So this looks uh, this looks absolutely incredible, but uh, it's there's just too much. I mean, all and I guess destined to bring us home. The the theme of the show was not just first party, not just Game Pass, but also a lot of third party Game Pass. Like that, I feel like that's the final piece. You know, you know, you're getting all these first party games. All those are going into Game Pass, and yes, Game Pass is great, but. You know, we had MLB The Show, huge Game Pass day and date win. We had Outriders earlier this year. But a lot of these other games that we're talking about, also, these are third-party games that are coming out on other platforms, but they're day one. They're $0 if you have a Game Pass subscription versus 60 or $70 on other platforms. The value is on parallel. Like, if you are buying all those games on a on the competing platform that charges $70 a game, uh, you can buy two you get access to everything on Xbox for that same price, basically. And it, it's it's a stellar value. There's no denying it. And just because I'm allowed to talk right now, I also want to talk about Ayudin, an RPG that I'm really, really excited about. I think that fills a really great niche. And uh, just a quick shout out to Atomic Heart, another game that looks really, really unique that yeah, we are going to get to play point. day one on Game Pass. Yeah. But you're right about the value proposition, Ryan. There, it, there's no denying it. There's just no denying that yeah. Game Pass is a great value. Paris, I cannot thank you enough for for doing this. Uh, just, I mean, it was awesome that we had the host of this thing right on our live post show. Uh, you've just been a friend to IGN and to Unlocked for for uh, for a while now, and and hopefully for the foreseeable future. I, I I am so happy for you. I wish you nothing but you, your your star is just like shooting off now, and it's it's so great to see you succeed. No, thank you. Like I said at the top, the feeling is mutual. I, I would not have had this opportunity without you playing a part. So again, thank you so much. And just everyone at IGN, you've always been great to me. And yeah, absolutely. I, I hope to come back again. Anytime, anytime, my friend. That is sadly all the time we do have this week. We've got a schedule to keep. So uh, Destin, Paris, thank, thank you both for joining me. And thanks to everybody for watching at home. A quick reminder that if you missed anything, you can catch up on IGN, whether that's on IGN.com proper, where we've got all sorts of roundup in case you missed it articles. On YouTube, just there's a million things to, to scroll through on our YouTube page, social media, or even, again, the IGN app on your smart TV. And don't forget the official E3 online portal as well. They've got their app featuring virtual booths, articles, videos, and tons more. And remember, if you enjoyed the show today, and I hope you did, we're doing it live. That's, you know, we do the best we can. Sometimes uh, Destin just disappears at the beginning of the show because he clicks the wrong X, you know, he just puts his mouse in the wrong place and bad things happen. But uh, that's the fun of it. Remember that we have weekly episodes of Podcast Unlocked, this show, which is IGN's long-running weekly Xbox show. That said, we're off next week. Uh, we are not going to be here next week, but hopefully you enjoyed this. But come back on June 29th for Unlocked 500. I promise it's going to be special. It will not just be your average, everyday, regular Unlocked. So keep a note of that, June 29th for Unlocked 500. And subscribe. Please do hit that bell. Do that whole thing. YouTube.com slash IGN Games 
or subscribe to Unlocked on your favorite podcast feed. So keep it locked right here on IGN for all of your summer of gaming coverage. We'll see you next time. IGN Summer of Gaming 2021 is presented by USAA Insurance and Army National Guard. Pursue multiple paths while you serve. Reach your greatest potential with Army National Guard. And by the Amazon original movie, The Tomorrow War, exclusively on Prime Video July 2nd. And powered by Duracell Optimum, the official battery sponsor of Summer of Gaming 2021. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. Competition brings out the best in all of us. Well, mostly. Oh, that's a controller break. That's unfortunate. Welcome to IGN Compete, where we bring you the stories behind the esports headlines. From the triumphs, Daryl takes the game to the hardships, it's not heavy. to the miracle moments that will go down in history. Hey, oh, I just can't believe it. It's crazy. It's all here on IGN Compete. God, I'm in disbelief.